Well, good morning, everybody. So wonderful to see people live in an auditorium after a couple of years. And on behalf of the Australian Institute of Infectious Diseases and the Australian French Association for Research and Innovation, AFRAN, I say woman Jenka, welcome and bienvenue to you all and warmly welcome you to our lessons learned from COVID-19 symposium. I'm Peter Revel from the Doherty Institute. We are going to have a welcome to country at some stage this morning, but I too, I would like to acknowledge firstly that we are meeting today on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and welcome all indigenous persons who have joined us here today in person and on Zoom. We have nearly 700 or I think over 700 registrants today, which is fantastic. I particularly wish to welcome the Honourable Minister Yala Pulford, Minister for Innovation, Medical Research and the Digital Economy, and Mr Boris Tukas, Head of Culture, Education, Science and Technology at the Embassy in France. I also welcome Nobel Laureate Professors Francois Barret Sunisse and Peter Doherty, Professor Jane Gunn, Dean Faculty of, uh, Faculty of Medicine, Dentistry and Health Sciences, Professor Ben Cowie, Deputy CHO, Professor Sharon Lewin, AO, Director of the Doherty Institute, and Professor Brendan Crabb, AC Director and CEO of the Burnett Institute. And as I said, I welcome the 700 plus people who have registered for this symposium and are joining us either in person or on Zoom. The Australia Institute, Australian Institute of Infectious Diseases is led by the University of Melbourne, the Doherty Institute and the Burnett Institute and has received amazing support from the Victorian government for which we sincerely thank Minister Pulford. Now this is the first ever AIID event and I think it's indicative already of the spirit of collaboration and goodwill that already exists amongst AI, AIID partners and augurs well for its success. There's no bricks and mortar yet, folks, but we have a wonderful spirit of collaboration, which is demonstrated by everybody here today. Um, just a little bit of housekeeping, the tea and lunch breaks will take place outside where you enter. Um, so please enjoy our amazing array of speakers today. And I, I now welcome Honour Honourable Minister Pulford to say some words. Thank you. Thank you everyone and good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on from where you are joining us. Um, Peter, thank you for that welcome and introduction and uh, I share with you um, some excitement, uh, optimism and hope about uh, just this experience of being able to be in a room with people again. It's so important for us all and of course has been incredibly challenging uh, the last couple of years. Can I acknowledge the traditional owners of country and uh, pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and to any Aboriginal people uh, that are with us today, um, either in person here in Melbourne or joining us virtually. Um, can I also acknowledge my parliamentary colleague, uh, Frank McGuire, who is the Parliamentary Secretary uh, for Medical Research and a, a long-time champion of the work um, that this community does. Um, Boris Tukas, uh, Head of Culture, Education, Science and Technology uh, from the uh, French Embassy, joining us um, today in Melbourne, but uh, having travelled here from Canberra, so welcome to you and to your colleagues. Um, Nobel Laureate uh, Professor Francois uh, Barry's Sinasi, um, Emeritus Professor at the Institut Pasteur and Emeritus Director of Research at the INSERM. Um, uh, to Nobel Laureate Professor Peter Doherty, patron of the Doherty Institute, um, to, to all of our speakers today. Um, and some of you are uh, joining us uh, virtually uh, in good health and some of you perhaps joining us virtually uh, in a situation where yourself or a household member are requiring you to be home and, and we wish you uh, every um, you know, every uh, speedy recovery and quick return uh, to being able to be out and about in the community safely. So it is a great honour to open uh, this symposium and as uh, Peter reflected, we don't have bricks and mortar, but we have extraordinary research uh, partnerships and we have lots of plans advancing rapidly um, that will give us bricks and mortar soon and, and those facilities that um, you uh, that you most um, 
very much look forward uh, to having. And of course, um, uh, Sharon uh, Lewin, Brendan Crabb, um, colleagues from uh, the University of Melbourne, um, we we regularly uh, we regularly um, gather to check progress. And um, this is going to be a very very exciting bricks and mortar project, um, eclipsed only by the very very exciting research partnerships that it will um, that it will become home to. We living we are living in extraordinary times, aren't we? We've been, witnessed the last two years major upheaval and change. Um, but on a more positive note, breakthrough and transformation that's been truly exciting and extraordinary. A medical research community has been thrust into the global spotlight in a way um, like uh, no time previously. And every wave has brought new lessons and new ways to respond. You've all become the people that the rest of us rely on. Uh, for our advice and for our information, for our expertise, um, and to help keep us safe and to keep our loved ones safe. And the theme of this symposium, Guiding Pandemic Preparedness and Response, at this particular, particular juncture provides a great opportunity to reflect on the progress that we've made uh, and how we can refine and improve our pandemic response, as well as gaining and sharing greater understanding and knowledge of where we're at now and what we need to do together next. Since the creation of um, my portfolio just a little over 18 months ago, I have been a determined advocate for this sector. I certainly uh, believe that medical research has an integral role to play in the future of uh, this state uh, as a very, very significant um, uh, significant expertise where we stand proudly on the global stage, uh, but also uh, as a driver of uh, profound change to our economy. Um, it, uh, it shouldn't go without saying uh, that also this, um, this sector provides uh, extraordinary hope to people at some of the most challenging times of their life and changes the way that people live and can live. So we've been seizing the moment uh, as we as we can uh, to shape this and to work with you in partnership to do this, creating the right conditions for research, commercialisation and innovation. So since COVID-19 uh, first um, came to our awareness, uh, our government has committed $44 million in funding to COVID-19 research. Um, there are, of course, um, for each of these projects, many other partners and contributors. And so that is, um, you know, that is but the tip of the iceberg in terms of what's being contributed and achieved. And as well as joining the global search for vaccines and treatments, that research has also explored the ongoing impacts of COVID-19, not just in terms of health, uh, but in terms of uh, communities and the workforce. And of course, today I've had the opportunity to meet Professor Ben Cowie in person. We've only met in our little boxes before. Um, and uh, 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 Professor Cowie is our uh, um, Deputy Chief Health Officer and, and has worked very closely with our Chief Health Officer and with colleagues across government to help take uh, accurate messages and information and advice to people across the Victorian community, um, no matter their background or their circumstances. And so we thank you uh, for that um, into workplaces and deep into communities. We're very pleased to have supported the Women in Science Parkville Precinct Group to undertake research assessing the gendered impacts of COVID-19 on our medical research workforce. Um, it was certainly a, a, a topic that came up very, very often when I was first meeting you all um, in uh, the middle of 2020. The government's established a $2 billion uh, investment fund, Breakthrough Victoria, to accelerate research and commer commercialisation in this state. And since 2014, our government's very proud to have invested $1.3 billion in medical research, creating those new opportunities and programs that have enabled our biotech and medical technology industry to grow in size and impact and change lives, if not just here, but around the world. We have an incredible depth of talent uh, and expertise in Victoria's medical research sector, and we are very, very, very proud of what you do. We make up 40% here in Victoria, overwhelmingly in Melbourne, uh, of Australia's uh, national medical research effort, and we are committed to investing in you so that we can continue to build capability for clinical trials, new facilities, and more world-leading research. 
of specific interest to this event, of course, um, setting Victoria up for uh, further and greater success. We've invested $400 million to establish the Australian Institute for Infectious Diseases. This will be the largest centre of its kind uh, in the Southern Hemisphere and is already forming great partnerships with key networks and institutions around the world, cementing Victoria's reputation as a leading light in this arena. Co-located with the University of Melbourne, the Burnett Institute and the Doherty Institute, all of whom are represented here today, the purpose-built facility will significantly strengthen Victoria's research into infectious diseases, as well as fostering that all-important integration between our academic minds and the medical research sector. I was very pleased to be able to partner with bleeding infectious diseases researchers to take this bold idea and turn it into a reality. And I look forward to the development of the project that will see more than a thousand scientists and health experts working together in a built for purpose dedicated facility that will become a beacon of excellence in our renowned Parkville Biomedical Precinct. And our ambition doesn't just stop here. We've been pursuing mRNA technology as our next frontier. I was delighted to announce that the end of last year that in just five months, uh, Victorian scientists have manufactured Australia's first mRNA COVID-19 vaccine candidate with Australia's first ever mRNA uh, therapeutic or product. This manufacturing breakthrough has been led locally in partnership with Monash University Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences, the Doherty and IDT Australia, utilising our strong medical research and manufacturing capabilities and bringing those two things together. And we were delighted to partner with the federal government uh, to secure Moderna to come to Melbourne and establish a manufacturing and research base and to members of our scientific advisory group who have played such an important role in making clear to our friends at Moderna um, that uh, Melbourne was the natural and logical home uh, for them in this part of the world. Um, I thank you. This marks Victoria as the home of mRNA manufacturing in Australia and in the region and will complement a number of existing initiatives as we uh, now focus uh, on building an mRNA ecosystem. But this decision by Moderna is, I think, a reflection of the strength of our research and our manufacturing sector and our ability to support uh, Moderna's future therapeutic pipeline, but also our ambitions in next frontiers of research and theirs have a beautiful, beautiful synergy. All of this investment is essential and exciting um, and presents a real opportunity for our state. But we need to, of course, always, and, and perhaps um, this is not a group of people who need any reminding of this, why, why are we doing this and for whom are we doing this? Um, this is about a steadfast commitment to bettering the lives, not just of people in our own community, but of people around the world. And I thank you all for your commitment to that and the international partnerships that are so important uh, for health and well-being around the world. It is essential that we seek to understand the impacts of COVID throughout our society uh, and our global society. We're channeling what we've learned into initiatives that create jobs, cement our reputation as a global leader in medical research and innovation, drive that economic growth and deliver real results. Um, in the medical research sector, what that represents is comprehensive funding for long-term COVID-19 research, continued support for clinical trials and investing where our researchers can cement themselves on the global stage. Thank you so much uh, to all in the leadership of the Australian Institute of Infectious Diseases and to the Australian French Association for Research and Innovation for creating this fantastic event today. We do, of course, always have more to learn and more to do, but when we unite outstanding talent like is assembled in this room and is assembled in locations, um, in places uh, around the world and around Australia, um, to collaborate on the big ideas, we can achieve extraordinary things. So thank you all uh, for the opportunity to say a few words and to share a few observations of how we see the work that you do from the perspective of the Victorian government, um, for your dedication, for your brilliance, for your expertise. Um, thank you. Uh, and we wish you every success, uh, not just today, but in the work that you undertake with your colleagues throughout your careers. Thank you, Minister.
inspiring words. I, I now wish to welcome Mr. Boris Tukas, Head of Culture, Education, Science and Technology at the Embassy of France to say some words. Thank you. Professor Reveal, uh, Minister Paul Ford, distinguished guests. On behalf of the Embassy of France, I'm delighted to open uh, the first symposium co-organized by the Australian Institute for Infectious Disease and the Australian French Association for Research and Innovation, the AFRAN. In a context where our world is increasingly faced with democratic, sanitary and environmental challenges, we need to strengthen, to strengthen our means of interaction and cooperation on a basis of safety and trust. Opening up debates and sharing knowledge will inform choices and actions that will shape our collective future for friends as for Australia. This symposium that brings together the French and Australian scientific communities is an outstanding opportunity to strengthen the cooperation between our two countries to better fight current and emerging infectious disease worldwide. I would like to thank everyone whose work and involvement has made this even possible, especially the Victoria state government. Building French-Australian scientific cooperation is of course one of our core missions at the Embassy of France. And despite these challenging past years, we've been busy creating and promoting new tools and initiatives aimed at uh, fostering scientific collaboration. The 2022 PHC FASIC program closed its call with more than 40 applications. We, see, we also see a very good level of interest from Australian and French researchers for the Australian French Social Science Collaborative Research Program. Our SAF scholarship with ANSTO and ANC has grown in 2020 to include New Zealand students. Finally, our Bodin internship program diversified its activities during the COVID crisis to allow online internships. So this, despite the COVID crisis, we've adjusted and adapted. But one of the institutions that I would like to particularly thank, because it's uh, thanks to them that this uh, event today is also possible, is the Afran Association. As a major actor of our bilateral cooperation, Afran is active in making industry academia connections, providing networking opportunities, seed funding, promising collaborations, providing insights into the French and Australian research and higher education systems, and coordinating a platform of experts to support research, technology, and industry communities. It has now grown in a few years from zero to over 800 me members and counting. The embassy is, of course, proud to renew its support to the Afran Association, and we trust that Afran members will be a creative and proactive force as well as a ground implementer for scientific collaboration and innovation to address the most important challenges of our times. Today's symposium aims to tackle one of these challenges. It is now well established that our lifestyles and our impact on nature are accelerating the emergence of new infectious diseases. And because diseases know no border, International scientific co cooperation must be placed at the center of our efforts to address this major threat. The, the, the strong existing links between Institut Pasteur and the Peter Doherty Institute, for example, are just one fabulous illustrations of, illustration of such cooperation. For a long time, Australian and French scientists have been working together to fight infectious disease from HIV to, and hepatitis to more recently COVID-19. This symposium today highlights and strengthens this bond. And I'd like also to acknowledge today the, the, the presence of uh, Jean-Paul Tutin, the new head of the CNRS, which will, uh, uh, a French research organization that has just opened an office in Victoria, in Melbourne. So this will certainly help foster uh, bilateral scientific cooperation further in the future. 
I would like to acknowledge the eminent scientists who take part in this symposium today and who have contributed to major, major breakthrough in our comprehension and our fight of infectious disease. In particular, I'd like to thank our panelists today, Nobel laureate Francoise Barres Sinoussi, uh, unfortunately uh, on, on, on live stream, but hopefully we'll have her um, in presence in the future, Emeritus Professor at the Pasteur Institute, who discovered the virus, the virus responsible for AIDS, Nobel laureate Peter Doherty, Professor at the University of Melbourne, Professor Sharon Lewin, Director of the Doherty Institute and Virologist, and Professor Brendan Crabb, Director of the Burnett Institute and Infectious Disease Expert specialized in malaria. I would also like to thank all, all of our speakers today for sharing with us the, their work to protect people from an infectious disease. I am looking forward to hearing all your presentations and I wish you a fruitful symposium. Thank you. Thank you, Boris. Um, it's now my great pleasure to introduce Professor Sharon Lewin, Director of the Doherty Institute, to chair the first session. Sharon, thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Peter. And um, may I start by saying how fabulous it is to see so many people, friends and colleagues that we've only seen virtually for the last two years. It's just great to have been a situation that we can meet now and uh, learn from each other. Thank you, Minister Poolford, for your wonderful words and thanks so much for attending today. And of course, all your support for the AIID. I'm just as excited as you that this is our first formal event. And a very special thank you to for Mr. From Mr. Boris Tukar, who gave a wonderful opening and, and gave a little bit of the background about why we are doing this together uh, with our colleagues from France. And um, personally, I've had very long standing connections with France. Um, I did my sabbatical in Paris in 2008, which was a momentous year for France, and I'll explain why in a moment. But in, as you've heard from Mr. Tukar, um, you know, there's a long tradition of us working together in medical research, but particularly in virology, in HIV, in viral hepatitis, in emerging infectious diseases, as you'll hear later, as and now we hope COVID. There are many similarities in the French and Australian research sector, many similar, similarities in our healthcare sectors as well. So I think we have lots to learn from each other. So it's my very great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, um, Professor Francoise barre sinoussi Francoise was the recipient of the Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine in 2008 for her discovery of HIV. But as a friend and colleague, Francoise is just so much more than a brilliant virologist. She is an advocate for people living with HIV. She's an advocate for women in science, and she is an absolutely wonderful person. She's a member of our scientific advisory board at the Doherty, so she has given me personally great advice, not only in my career, but also in running the Institute. So we were so excited that she was going to be making her first trip out of France in two years to come to Melbourne. And in the era that we all live in, she had her PCR test 24 hours before boarding the plane. And unfortunately she had dodged COVID for two years, but it had eventually caught up with her and she tested positive. Um, the most important thing is that she is well and she's asymptomatic and she's fighting fit because she's going to join us live from Paris, where I think it is now 11.30pm, um, but that would never stop Francoise. So um, I hope that's all worked and I hope you can hear me, Francoise, but uh, welcome yes. to Melbourne yes. <laughs> virtually. Uh, I can hear you, Sharon, but I don't have the video. Um, so if I can have my slide, yeah, thank you. So thank you very much, uh, Sharon, for your very kind words. Thanks also uh, to you uh, and to Peter and to the organizer for inviting me to this symposium. 
on such an important topic. Um, I, uh, I would have loved, I would have loved to join you in person. Um, as Sharon said, COVID decided otherwise. And uh, at the last minute, I had to cancel uh, my trip. What I would like to do um, in the next uh, uh, min few minutes or so is to share with you some of the lessons of HIV AIDS uh, that uh, we, uh, we have learned and uh, whether we have been taking them into consideration for the response uh, to, uh, to COVID. So, uh, if I can have the next slide. Of course, HIV and SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, virus are not the same. And consequently, there are major uh, differences uh, between, uh, between the two infections. The magnitude of uh, the epidemic is uh, larger uh, with over 400 million, 400 million of SARS-CoV-2 infection globally compared to 38 uh, million today uh, for HIV. But the mortality uh, outcome has been much higher for HIV, as you know, with 33 million deaths compared to COVID with less than 6 million deaths globally. HIV uh, DNA integrates into a cellular genome, but not uh, SARS-CoV-2. Both viruses have variants, but HIV mutation rate is much higher. HIV uh, is a chronic uh, uh, infection uh, compared to acute SARS-CoV-2. Uh, so long COVID is, is of concern. There are some similarities between, uh, between also the two infections. These include key determinants uh, of vulnerability for both pandemic, such as biological determinants of our defense, social behavior, uh, social determinants, inequities, human rights, political uh, divides. Milestone in science have been quite similar, I must say, but uh, with a very different timeline. And I will come back on this point later on. Have we learned anything from HIV pandemic to COVID? Only partially, as you will see on next slide. Next slide. The two next slide are list listing some of the lessons in red from HIV. Uh, the first list include uh, the need to create an environment favorable to behavioral changes with rapid implementation of logistic resources and tools required for such changes. The need to promote access to prevention, diagnosis and care. The need to strengthen health system and human resources, the need to uh, have implication of community and of the civil society, the famous uh, no one to be left behind in HIV AIDS, which means the need to anticipate social and economic inequities and the need to consider both the benefits and the risk of communication. As you can see on the right in blue, uh, except the very rapid development of diagnostic tests and vaccine, those lessons were not enough or only partially considered for COVID. Indeed, the COVID pandemic highlighted the dramatic problem of inequities and scientific communication has been and is still a challenge today as we will hear later I think uh, during the symposium. Let's continue the list of lessons on next slide. Next slide. Uh, the development of uh, multi-institutional, uh, multidisciplinary 
research funded structured coordinated at international level science is something we really learn from HIV. We need how it is important to uh, mobilize the public and the private sector, the researchers, the health professional and communities all together. The, we learn how that improving and promoting global funding support is uh, critical and uh, how much critical is the political transparency, the rapid decision in terms of evidence-based intervention. Again, if you look on the right, uh, the, blue, uh, the blue is indicating that uh, what has been done is not enough uh, and except the fantastic, I will say, mobilization of health professionals and researchers in COVID. Next slide. To uh, let's say conclude this first part of my talk, uh, the lesson from HIV epidemic has not been sufficiently taken into consideration, in my opinion, at least in France and in Europe, but I believe also globally. Unfortunately, despite the request from HIV AIDS community a representative of the civil society, which have played a key role in the response to HIV, have not been su sufficiently associated to political decision. This, I think, at least partially explain public mistrust and vaccine hesitancy in addition to misinformation. However, as I said earlier, there are some similarities between the scientific response to HIV and the scientific response to COVID as shown on next slide. Next slide. Look at uh, this uh, scheme uh, summarizing uh, the, the, the milestone in HIV and SARS-CoV-2 science following the first clinical ob observation in 1981 for HIV in 2019 for SARS-CoV-2. There are some similarities. In both cases, the identification of the causative agent was followed by the receptor identification, virus sequencing, diagnostic test development, therapeutic and vaccine trial with success in antiretroviral drug for HIV and in vaccine for COVID. However, however, the timeline of the scientific response was clearly distinct, much more rapid for COVID than for HIV. This can be explained by the unprecedented mobilization of researchers I mentioned before, and, but also by the fantastic progresses in technologies since the 80s. The COVID pandemic is also impacting HIV AIDS as you can, we'll see on the next slide. Next slide. It has an impact on HIV science due to uh, the limited access of HIV scientists to their lab uh, during the lockdown. The strong mobilization of HIV researchers in SARS-CoV-2 uh, science also has an impact, of course, on HIV science. And as a result, you can see uh, the number of publications, which is over 15 times higher for COVID than HIV during the period 2020-2021. We cannot exclude also a long-term impact on HIV AIDS workforce and possible funding diversion. Next slide. The COVID uh, pandemic had a negative impact on access to a prevention testing and treatment. This can be explained uh, by stand Health care system fears to contract COVID, delayed deliveries, shortage of supply. And according to the Global Fund, but also to WHO UNH report, 
a COVID pandemic resulted in disruption in HIV testing and prevention services with 22% reduction of HIV testing, 11% reduction of access to, uh, to PrEP, and 40.5% reduction of prevention of mother to child transmission. We therefore are expecting an increase of new HIV infection in 2002 and beyond. But let's end with some more optimistic remark. Next slide. COVID science is offering new uh, wonderful opportunities for HIV. First, we heard about it, the development of new technologies such as mRNA uh, for vaccine, which uh, are already under investigation for HIV vaccine. Preclinical studies in monkey are encouraging and clinical uh, trials are already started in human. The effort for producing at lower cost vaccine antibodies for COVID could also benefit to HIV vaccine and treatment in the future. Next slide. In addition, next slide, in addition to, um, to vaccine mRNA, other scientific innovation like nanoparticle delivery, uh, drug discovery, digital health, artificial intelligence are among opportunities also for HIV in the future. The creation of a novel global initiative for testing drug and vaccine, the strengthening of health system globally, the global awareness of viruses may also serve for a better response to HIV. Next slide. Let's believe in better organization, coordination and collaboration of science as a result of COVID. And I would like here to give you one example of uh, reorganization in France as a consequence of uh, COVID. Next slide. The previous slide. May I have the previous slide, please? Yes. To better promote, coordinate, and fund research on COVID and on infectious disease, and to benefit of a lesson from HIV research, a new agency was created in January 2021. The decision, this decision resulted from a recommendation of a, a, a committee named CARE I was sharing in 2020 to advise the French government on scientific priority to respond to the pandemic. This recommendation uh, to merge two interim entities, the National Agency of Research on AIDS and on, on, on viral hepatitis research and uh, reacting is only in only one agency was based on their efficiency as research organization for HIV and viral hepatitis research and on emerging infectious disease respectively. Uh, and this was also an advice, by the way, of the NRS Scientific Advisory Board before COVID. Yazdan, Yazdan Pana is the director of this agency and uh, he will probably provide you with some more detail later. But I am glad to, to say that uh, Sh Sharon Lewin kindly accepted to be the co-chair of the scientific ad advisory board of this new agency. And next slide is summarizing the organization of this agency and, and the aim of the agency. The organization is based on review committee, coordinated action and working group, as it was for reacting and for the historical ANRS as shown on the slide. The aim of uh, the agency is really to move for, towards a strong and efficient interface of multi-institutional and multidisciplinary collaboration between researchers working on HIV, 
viral hepatitis, STI, tuberculosis, and emerging infectious disease, including COVID, arboviruses, infection, viral hemorrhagic fevers. Next slide is presenting one example of potential topic for collaborative research and on two scientific priority for HIV and SARS-CoV-2 uh, SARS infection for the NRS, MEA. This priority, as shown as this slide, are HIV persistence and long COVID. They include for HIV, pathophysiological mechanism of comorbidities, HIV persistence mechanism, uh, including the role of viral and host determinant, clinical research for cure and remission, and for COVID, pathophysiological mechanism of long COVID and therapeutic intervention. Clearly, you can see in the middle of the slide that cross-cutting uh, and multidisciplinary science can be developed between the two areas in the perspective of innovation and drug discovery. Such cross-cutting science will involve uh, ANRSME cohort, clinical trial platform, as well as international collaboration, and obviously collaboration with uh, the Australian uh, Institute for Infectious Disease. And last slide, next. In conclusion, much remains to be done in preparedness, collaborative science and evidence-based decision in response to HIV and emerging epidemics. We must keep in mind the lesson, the lesson from the past in HIV and present in COVID, but also the spirit of Louis Pasteur, the spirit of Nelson Mandela, Martin Luther King, and many others which are represented in this slide with some quotes. Finally, always remember, always remember what we are saying at the International Aid Society, we have been and we will be stronger all together. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Francoise, for a just brilliant and totally inspiring talk. And um, some of those uh, images of the timelines of how science can move when people work together, as we've seen in COVID, um, were pretty telling. And I think, as you say, could make a very big difference to many other major global challenges, including HIV. And of course, as always, Francoise, you've managed to take the very unbelievably um, insightful helicopter view of how we can tackle something of this great scale. So thank you so much, Francoise. We will let you go to bed because it's midnight now, but you're going to be up early in the morning and you and for those in the room and online, Francoise will be back on, with us on the panel at the end of the session and that will allow many of you to ask, I'm sure, many questions you have. Thank you again, Francoise, for a, just a superb talk. So it's my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Professor Ben Cowie. Um, ben is an infectious diseases physician at the Royal Melbourne Hospital and an epidemiologist based at the Doherty Institute. He's had a major long-standing interest in viral hepatitis, and he has been diverted a little bit from his usual business, as many of us have been over the last two years, but done a brilliant job in the health department in Victoria and is currently the Deputy Chief Health Officer. And Ben is going to tell us um, a bit more about what we've learnt in the public health response to COVID at a very local level in Victoria. So welcome to Ben Cowie. Thank you very much, Sharon, and uh, thanks to all of the uh, organisers today, Peter and Sharon and all the collaborators for this, this amazing event. I'd like to acknowledge that we are all on Aboriginal land, Torres Strait Islander land, for those joining from other parts of Australia, uh, and uh, acknowledge Elders past, present and emerging. 
So I've been asked to speak a little bit about some of the lessons learned in the public health response to COVID-19 here in Victoria. And I think uh, those lessons are still continuously being learned. There's no question about that. Uh, and that many of the people in the, in the room here today have contributed to that. The last two years have challenged all of us. Uh, no one has not has been untouched by COVID-19, certainly in Australia, here in Victoria and globally. Um, the challenges have been those posed by the virus itself and for people uh, affecting, whose health has been affected by COVID-19, the burden on our healthcare system and our healthcare workforce, which has been unrelenting uh, and has been something that we have seen very much play out in the last couple of months. And so grateful to all of our frontline healthcare workers for everything they've done to support the community. Uh, but also the challenges posed in delivering usual care for other conditions in, in the midst of a pandemic, which again, in health systems worldwide has been a real challenge. But there's also been challenges for the community posed by the necessary responses we've taken for COVID-19, limitations on our freedoms, limitations on the ability to connect with loved ones, friends and family, uh, economic challenges, and obviously the attendance, mental and social health impacts of the very necessary isolation and other public health and social measures, which uh, have really contributed to us uh, being on a global scale, impacted far less severely in terms of attributable mortality than almost any other similar health system or a society globally. So as a state and as a country, uh, there is no doubt that the sacrifices that we have collectively made uh, have, well, they initially bought us time, bought us time to develop some of the innovations that have been discussed and which I'll come back to in testing, in vaccination, in treatment, uh, especially buying us time to scale up what has been an absolutely, uh, uh, an achievement on a global scale of mobilizing a vaccination program that uh, by us actually preventing transmission through the community at the sort of scale that was, has been seen in many countries in the first year, two years of the pandemic, it allowed us to convert a susceptible population into a population, the vast majority of whom had had two doses for those aged 12 and above by the end of last year, before the Omicron wave really challenged us with very profound community transmission. And that has led to the the saving of many, many lives. Victoria, Australia have had uh, an attributable mortality roughly five to 10 times lower than many other countries in, for instance, Europe and North America. Uh, at, and that's a testament to the achievements and the sacrifices made by all of us. So uh, this is not to ignore that there has been tragic loss of life here in Australia and continues to be half of the people Half of the Australians who have lost their lives from the COVID-19 pandemic have done so in the last two months. And uh, it is the case that uh, nearly 90% of all diagnosed infections, whether that's confirmed or probable infections, have occurred since the 1st of January this year in this country. So uh, it is not to ignore the very significant challenges and the tragic losses that we've experienced, but it would have been so much worse were it not for the efforts of our entire community. So to the lessons, there, there are so many lessons, I think, and, and we are continuing to learn, obviously. Uh, and many of these will be discussed today and have been touched on in the context of HIV already um, by Professor Barre Senussi. But a few reflections from me. The first, really, and, and to echo Minister Pulford's comments at the, at the start of today's uh, today's symposium, the absolute world leading research and the, the amazing power of innovation that has guided us through the last two years and continues to do so. Uh, but innovation and, and uh, Professor Barre Sinusi's last point there, innovation is only able to achieve anything if it's matched by uh, the will to implement that those innovations and the resources being made available to do so. And I think, you know, governments across Australia and certainly the Victorian government have continued to take some very hard decisions guided by the public health advice and the advice of many of the people in the room here today 
uh, and made those difficult decisions. And as a consequence, some of those public health benefits have been able to be realised through the innovation. And we can't, I think, ignore the importance of that political will and that investment to actually deliver on the potential of innovation. So uh, I'm sure this will be discussed today, being the first, uh, not just country, not just state, but indeed one of the member institutions being the first place to culture SARS-CoV-2 outside of China, the rapid development of sequencing capacity of viral load testing. Uh, the, uh, and just to take that example, so the innovation to develop those assays and to that, that genomic capacity, then implemented at a huge scale to basically set up a completely new testing platform uh, to put testing uh, as close as possible to every Victorian uh, through the state system. A huge achievement and a, and a real itself, a, a massive logistical undertaking, uh, backing in the innovation and the, and the research and discovery that had happened there. Uh, one, one issue that we had through the first year was the linkage to care that was lost by actually having to necessarily stand up such a huge testing system uh, very rapidly. And this again, um, picks up some of the lessons learned from HIV about the importance of linking people to care and not just uh, providing a diagnosis at a point in time. And this is something that has then cascaded through. And again, the Royal Melbourne has taken a, a very significant leadership role in the initial development of COVID positive pathways to be able to link people's point of diagnosis through to public health responses to support that individual welfare responses, but essentially linking them to care. And if I could take that example for a moment and look at January when we had uh, hundreds of thousands of Victorians actively living with COVID-19, I think at peak in the middle of January, we had a, around 100,000 Victorians being cared for through some iteration of our community care platform. I think half on COVID positive pathways led by our health services across the state and another half on a self care pathway. Um, we would not, we would not have been able to look after Victorians had that innovation been backed in with the resources necessary to make that happen. And we would have seen a lot more people in hospital and we would have seen more loss of life. So again, amazing innovation being backed in and implemented in real time. But probably the, the most tangible and uh, exciting example of that process has been the vaccination program. And as I mentioned, the, the idea that within uh, the first year of the vaccination program, having nearly 95% of people aged 12 and above uh, being vaccinated in Victoria with two doses. And in the last three months, having over half of those aged 18 and above having had their third dose, despite all the challenges brought by the Omicron wave that was rolling out at the same time. Historic achievement, but to pick up on the messages around equity and the need to engage with community, which I'll come back to, Victoria, out of all jurisdictions, had the highest levels of equity in our vaccine program. The lowest degree of difference between people in the lowest and the highest socioeconomic groups and the lowest degree of difference geographically. Noting that we don't have some of the challenges that some of our colleagues do in some of the larger states and territories. Still, that is an achievement. It's not just about a percentage coverage. It's the equity that underlies that, of which I think we should all be very, very proud. So um, innovation. The next, I think, uh, lesson that I'd like to reflect on, keeping an eye on the time there, Peter, don't worry, is the importance of strategic intelligence. Uh, that applies to genomics and the capacity as we do right now to surveil what uh, variants of concern are predominant, to be able to get that guidance from our public health reference laboratories uh, in real time and see Delta being replaced by Omicron, being able to monitor the emergence of the BA2 variant. This is all essential for public health responses, whether we're thinking about the use of monoclonal antibodies, whether we're thinking about vaccination strategies, or indeed planning for the next wave. Traditional epidemiology and looking at some of the underlying determinants of testing and vaccination, and being able to examine inequities as they emerge, whether it's regionally or by country of birth or by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander status, uh, it's an absolutely fundamental capacity. I think that they're suggesting which I should be drilling down to in more detail to some of these points. 
Uh, and of course, we're going to be talking about uh, mathematical modeling. I know uh, Professor Jody McVernon is going to be talking about the use of modeling uh, through the pandemic. Honestly, I can't think of a single example of something that was of greater utility as some of those really difficult decisions were being made. And whether it was the Burnett Institute, the Doherty Institute, University of Melbourne, Monash University, all of the different modeling groups bringing to bear those uh, uh, amazing skills that really continue to fundamentally guide at a high level and right down to programmatic level, some of our responses. I cannot overstate how important that has been. But uh, I, the, the clock is ticking down. The third point I really wanted to make was about meaningful engagement with community. And I know we've got talks coming up from Professor Doherty around communication with, uh, with the public. And also I think uh, Professor Margaret Hallard is talking later about community engagement. Um, and again, reflecting the comments made by Professor Barre Sinusi. It is not just about translation. It is not just about having a website with downloadable resources. And it's not even about just having videos of people speaking in different languages. It's about partnership. It's about building trust. It's about co-design and co-delivery of the interventions you are making to make them not only appropriate and not only guided by, but led by the communities that we are seeking to engage. I think a fantastic example of this is again, the vaccination program where we had vaccine ambassadors, vaccine champions, faith leaders, community leaders, uh, primary care clinicians from the communities who are being disproportionately affected by COVID-19 uh, actually taking the lead, resourced by the health department and the vaccine program to actually take the messages to their community. And, and we saw a transformation in vaccine uptake in, in parallel with those activities. So uh, this all takes time. And one of the immediate challenges in a pandemic is time. Uh, and the question quite, can quite uh, rightly be asked, can we afford the time to do all of this? Well, I think the experiences that we had, particularly in the first year of the pandemic, is we can't afford not to. We must take that time. We can't afford to leave anyone behind. Because as again, the point has been made, pandemic viruses exploit inequities in our society. And we need to face this together and in unity. And so we have to do that in partnership with all communities. So whilst there's intersectional uh, inequities in our society that the virus has exploited, so thinking particularly about um, people who speak languages other than English, being from different countries of birth, maybe associated with higher housing size and more difficultly isolating, uh, socioeconomic status comes into play, being an essential worker comes into play. And, and these are the people that keep our society functioning when everyone else is able to isolate or to, to be in lockdown. Um, and so ensuring that we are supporting our essential workforces so that they can continue to keep our society functioning. And of course, speaking about healthcare workers there too. But it's not just about risk, it's about strength and recognizing the strength of these communities, recognizing the abiding trust and ongoing relationships they have with their own leadership, with their own faith leaders, with their own clinical leadership that we can leverage. And one of the really exciting aspects about Victoria's response is moving towards uh, that more localized responses, the local public health units. We've got some representatives of local public health units here today to really make those partnerships, not just with community, but with health services that much clearer. So it's easy to see uh, as we look around the room here, with all these uh, scientists and researchers and academics and those joining us online. It's easy to think about the direct contribution to innovation and to the strategic intelligence I mentioned. But I would really like to call out the fundamental role of scientists, clinicians and researchers as advocates to engage with community, to support public health responses, to support the hard decisions being made because those trusted voices, which are in partnership with, but outside, the direct uh, um, sort of influence of government really bring that authoritative, trusted voice into the public arena. And we know that if that voice is missing, then a whole lot of other voices which are potentially less helpful proliferate. And so that role of, of scientists and clinicians as, re as advocates and champions has been something that has been a fundamental support to public health uh, in Victoria and Australia and globally through the course of the pandemic. 
So we have faced many challenges. As I said at the start, nobody has been left untouched by this pandemic. Uh, there have been tragic losses, even if these have been limited very significantly here in Victoria and in Australia by the efforts of the community. But with commitment and through delivering those innovations and uh, engaging the strength of our diverse communities, we will be able to continue to respond to further COVID challenges. Uh, we can celebrate and reconnect with our freedoms, even that's just the freedom not to wear a mask inside an auditorium, uh, but more importantly, reconnect and unite, unite as a society again. So we're gonna learn more lessons today. I'm really looking forward to seeing the outcomes of today's discussions as we face down this pandemic challenge and build the knowledge base that we need to prepare to face the next one as a stronger and more united public health response. And so thank you, lastly, to everyone in the room uh, for everything they have done collectively and individually, because all of us have contributed to protecting the health and well-being of Victorians through the course of the last two years. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ben, for another uh, really excellent and inspiring talk. And um, thank you for your leadership, Ben. Um, I could think of no one better in your role because you bring to it exactly those values that you talked about, about innovation, equity, partnerships, and um, you walk the walk as well. So thank you very much. We'll, we'll keep moving because we're running a little bit behind time. Um, I should have said earlier that slides will all be entered electronically here, not from those in the room. So to have a bit of equity for those online and those in the room, it's all, you all do it electronically. It comes to us through a program called Slido. Um, each of our speakers has 15 minutes allocated. And if there's time for questions, we'll take them. Um, if not, um, uh, we'll need to move on. But of course, those in the room have the chance to speak to the speakers directly. Isn't that nice then? And, and having to do it virtually. Our next speaker comes from France. It's Professor Yazdan Yazdan Pana. Yazdan is an infectious diseases physician, and he was the previous director of Reacting, as you heard earlier from Francoise, it was a network established in France in around 2018 to um, develop capacity in pandemic responses. I know Yazdan well from that time because it was very similar to a network I was leading called A Prize. And in January of 2021, as Francoise and um, mentioned the ANRS, the major agency for funding research in HIV and viral hepatitis, expanded to include the um, challenge of emerging infectious diseases or maladie infectious emergent. So it's now called the ANRS MIE. And Yazdon was appointed the director. So Yazdon is going to give a pre recorded um, presentation because it's now midnight in Paris. And he's going to talk about the COVID pandemic, a French perspective. Um, outbreak and response. So welcome to Yaston. Good morning. Uh, so first of all, um, thanks a lot for your invitation. It's an honor for me to be with you. I'm so sorry that I cannot be with you in person and only remote. So first of all, I wanted to maybe mention uh, where we are uh, as far as the epidemic is concerned in France. In France, we have had until February 2022, uh, five, five waves of uh, infection, hospitalization and deaths, as you can see in this slide. And the latest being the Omicron wave, uh, which is currently decreasing. Uh, these waves were actually uh, uh, caused by different variants, as you can see here on this slide. We implemented a surveillance of variants since uh, January 2021 with about 10 to 15,000 uh, sequences performed each week in France. And uh, uh, we saw in uh, uh, beginning of 2021, alpha variants, followed by uh, delta variants in yellow, and followed by Omicron variants since December 2000, 
2021. And you can see that currently uh, we have BA2 Omicron variant that is replacing BA1 with last week 26% of sequences being uh, BA2 variants. As far as vaccination is concerned, uh, you can see on this slide in blue, uh, uh, complete primary vaccination series and red, uh, complete primary vaccination series plus booster. As you can see, we are almost about 80% in those 12 years, uh, 18 years and more, sorry, uh, of uh, complete primary vaccination and with lower doses as far as booster is concerned. So we are quite good, although there are people unvaccinated, of course, those who are less than 12 years old, vaccination is recommended since December, but not really working. And there are still population and mostly, for example, 18 years and older, 20% or 15% who are not vaccinated, which is a, a, an issue. Um, and the other issue is French territories, and in particular, as you can see, Guadeloupe, Guyane, and Martinique, where only about 30 to 40% of population has had, have had uh, a complete primary vaccination. How we organize response. Early in the course of the epidemic, in uh, March 2020, the French Scientific Council with 12 multidisciplinary uh, um, experts uh, were uh, nominated by uh, the president and the Ministry of Health to try uh, to guide uh, decision makers. Uh, the Scientific Council, which is headed by Jean-François Delfrassi, uh, is giving scientific advice, but the decision is made by the executive. Uh, this committee is independent with freedom of speech. Uh, even if it was created by the health ministry, it can self-size on specific questions, and it is in contact with other existing French structures. Here I have put some major recommendation, of course, most importantly, the lockdown in March 2020, but also in October 2020, when an uh, adapted lockdown was uh, actually recommended. In March 2021, uh, we uh, recommended to consider anticipated regional target interventions during the third wave. In May 2021, we recommended the pass sanitaire, which is testing or vaccination to be allowed to do some activities such as bar, restaurants, cinemas, theaters. In September 2021, we uh, decided, uh, uh, or we, sorry, recommended uh, uh, some um, interventions for school reopening. And in December 2000. 21 we can and that interventions targeting Omicron and in particular trying to decrease some isolation criteria given the high number of cases. In general, uh, these recommendations were followed, but not all. For example, in March 2020, when we reopened, we uh, asked not to reopen schools, which was not followed by the government, but we think today that it was right to not actually follow our recommendations. There are other entities that advise the government, the Conseil d'Orientation de la Stratégie Vaccinale, recommending vaccination strategies that was built during the crisis. And of course, other institutions that are even in place during the peacetime, although we had a lot of articulation with them, such as Santé Publique France, HAS, uh, Au Conseil de la Santé Publique. Finally, uh, regarding research, a new agency called INRS Maladie Infectieuse Emergente was actually created in uh, January 2021. So it is built on the continuation of the INRS that you know with the scope 
of HIV, STI, what are the hepatitis and tuberculosis to which emerging infectious diseases were added. And the objective of this agency is not only to fund, but also to coordinate and to animate uh, research. And actually, it's very important to talk for me regarding this agency here in front of you, because actually I am the director, but also because the president of the SAP is Sharon Levin, that I really thank because all of her input within the last year. Now, how this responses and how decisions, interventions we asked were actually designed. First of all, we use a lot of mathematical money. Here you have some papers around uh, the impact of the curfew, the impact of the lockdown, uh, how to open schools, the impact of booster vaccination. I'm going to give you one example that is very recent. In December, when we had the Omicron wave, the question was at which non pharmaceutical and pharmaceutical intervention we should implement. Should we remain mask, close uh, 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 bars, uh, close restaurants, use uh, uh, the pass sanitaire, etc. So here you have the modeling based on different scenarios that are different Omicron severity assumptions. And you can see that uh, if we concentrate on scenario one, on one of the severity assumptions, you can see that uh, reducing R0 with non-pharmaceutical intervention of 10% of 20% had a huge impact on the number of hospital admissions. It was the same case for the other scenarios. So this showed us that we should not completely stop non-pharmaceutical interventions. We should keep some degree, and that was what we did uh, by keeping testing, by keeping wearing masks, by keeping uh, what we call teletravail, working at home, that really reduced a little bit and um, the uh, impact of uh, the uh, uh, the epidemic on hospitalizations and deaths. We also use large epidemi epidemiological studies. For example, a national-wide online case control study that was implemented and give the decision makers advice on where on what were exposures associated with SARS-CoV-2. And for example, in October 2020, during the second lockdown, uh, uh, before the lockdown, we closed bars, restaurants that were considered at high risk of transmission. Uh, we use other population-based analysis to try also to see what population, in what population we should design intervention. So here, it's uh, actually um, a study that evaluates the incidence, here you have the incidence, here you have uh, 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 the number of test positive tests, and here you have uh, the uh, number of tests uh, that have been performed. And what you can see is that in population who were socially deprivated, Q Q5, the most deprived areas, we can see that the incidence of the disease was highest, the proportion of positive tests were highest, and the number of tests performed when you look at the adjusted the loss. So this give us an information that we should target this population, mainly because also uh, these population who are low income neighborhoods who have uh, the lowest income have the highest uh, uh, hospitalization rates, as you can see here in this. We also did uh, other studies, for example, this study by MSF, to see uh, what was the vaccination intake in this uh, socially deprivated population. Uh, this study was done at the end of uh, uh, 
uh, actually this is not 222 but 221 and you can see that the coverage especially in those who are in the streets um, uh, also uh, in gypsies and travel people were very low uh, at about 45 percent and 50 percent uh, given most information on who we should touch. We did other studies to see how the actually the characteristic of patients who were admitted to uh, emergency rooms and hospitals change here. A study that compared Omicron to Delta, and you can see, sorry, uh, that uh, a total of 1,700 patients were uh, enrolled. Half of them were Omicron, and you can see that 65% of the vaccinated uh, uh, of those who of those who were admitted were vaccinated among those with uh, Omicron. 70% one comorbidity, 50% immunosuppressed. So here we can see that vaccination for Omicron is not enough, that we should also have other control measures and treatment in particular. So that uh, guide us to try to uh, actually recommend pre-exposure prophylaxis in immunosuppressed patients, early treatment for high risk non-hospitalized patients such as Suprovina and Paxlovid. However, it is important to monitor vaccine and treatment in this special population. That's why INS launched cohort of vaccinated immunosuppressed patients, more than 6,000 patients, cohort of early treatment in at least patients, cohort of pre-exposure prophylaxis in some immunosuppressed patients. So now, what is the future? What are the hot topics of the future, which we should actually look at for the future strategies? One is the durability of immunity. How long this would last? When we should vaccine next? Finding the right balance between public health and social measures and what is needed to control transmissions. And we should probably go beyond the COVID. How to protect those who are the most vulnerable immunosuppressed patients, but also those who are older with comorbidities, socially deprivated. We should also treat and uh, uh, vaccinate low and middle income countries, huge impact in the future. And uh, we should also survey and identify new variants promptly, reason for which we should implement surveillance system. We should try to better understand long COVID that will be a very important topic in the future. And finally, we should progress on our food demiology. So thanks again for your invitation. And uh, uh, again, sorry for not being able to be with you today. Best regards. Thanks, yes, John. Like, like you didn't see me fall down the stairs then. Very ungracious. Um, but so refreshing to hear another perspective from outside Australia. We can get very parochial reflecting on our response. So good to hear other countries, the struggles they've had and what they've been able to achieve. And I think from what Yazdan has shown you, uh, France has done extremely well, particularly in how they've managed to coordinate research and therefore have great impact. It's a real great pleasure to now switch tack and talk a little bit about the immunology and science. We have Dr. Melanie Neeland here, who's a senior research officer at Murdoch Children's Research Institute. And Melanie will speak to us about the innate immune response during SARS-CoV-2 infection and household exposure in children. Great to have you here in person, Melanie, welcome. Thank you for that introduction. And it's a great pleasure to be here today to present our work on the immunology of COVID-19 in children. So we know that children have comparatively milder COVID-19 disease than adults. They are often asymptomatic and they have significantly lower hospitalization rates and mortality. And this was quite surprising at first because this is in contrast to most other respiratory viruses where we know children tend to be the most vulnerable age group. 
The proposed mechanisms that underline the age-related differences in severity of COVID-19 have recently been summarised in a review article just published a few weeks ago by uh, Professor Nigel Curtis here in Melbourne. Um, and the, the proposed mechanisms with the most evidence to date include differences in the innate and adaptive immune systems between children and adults, uh, off-target effects of vaccines and recent infections in children, as well as differences in the endothelium and clotting in between uh, children and adults. However, today I'll focus on some of the evidence we've generated here in Melbourne and that of others globally looking at innate immune responses in children. So just a quick summary in, or introduction to innate immunity. So the innate immune system is our first line of defense against invading pathogens, and this includes SARS-CoV-2. And innate immune cells include cells such as monocytes, dendritic cells, natural killer cells, and neutrophils, uh, which respond to viral infections by limiting viral entry into the cells. They limit viral replication. They identify and remove infected cells. And they also initiate inflammatory signaling cascades. And this then instructs the development of the adaptive or longer term immune response. And so as innate immune cells are really responsible for that initial, uh, initial response to infection, they're prim primarily located at sites of infection. So for example, with SARS-CoV-2, that would be the upper and lower airways. However, they also circulate in the blood where they can be recruited to sites of infection when needed. So to investigate the immune responses in children and adults here in Melbourne, we have established the FFX study. And so the FFX study is a household trans transmission study that assesses the key uh, clinical, epidemiological, virological and immunological characteristics of SARS-CoV-2 infection in families. And so we have the broad Australian FFX study at MCRI, for which there are several contributing organisations across the country. But we also have some MCRI specific studies, including the FFX plus and FFX 28 studies. And these are more sampling intensive and also include a longer term follow up. And across the three studies, we have recruited 121 families and 425 participants. Um, and this, this work is led by uh, Dr. Shadan Tosseth and Associate Professor Nigel Crawford at the Royal Children's Hospital. However, today I'll be talking to you about uh, responses we've seen in blood samples collected from children and adults with, with SARS-CoV-2 infection, as well as their household close contacts. I should mention that these samples were collected between April and September 2020, so that's before the emergence of Delta and Omicron variants, and all the COVID-19 patients in this study had mild non-hospitalised disease. So in our study, we uh, analyze blood samples from SARS-CoV-2 positive children and adults, as well as their household close contacts, which we refer to as SARS-CoV-2 exposed participants. These participants remained repeatedly PCR negative for SARS-CoV-2 throughout the course of the study. We collect blood samples at the acute phase, which is within 14 days of infection or exposure. And then we collect them again at follow-up, which is four to six weeks later. We examine a range of different immune cells in the blood, including cells of the innate and adaptive immune system. But today I'll focus on innate immune cells, including dendritic cells, monocytes and their functional subsets, natural killer cells and neutrophils. So when we analyze the proportions of these innate immune cells in the blood of children with COVID-19, what we see is a marked reduction in the proportion of monocytes and dendritic cells uh, circulating in the blood at the acute phase can't see that. Uh, circulating at the acute phase of infection um, in children with COVID-19. We don't see this response in adults with COVID-19. Okay. So to investigate these responses further in, um, sorry, in the, in the monocyte subsets of, uh, of children with COVID-19, we explored uh, the different monocyte subsets based on their activation status. So there are three well-known subsets of monocytes in the blood. This includes classical, intermediate, and non-classical monocytes. And what we show in children with COVID-19 infection, again, is reductions in all three populations of these monocytes, particularly the intermediate and non-classical subsets, which we know are more pro-inflammatory. In adults, which you can see below there, they, um, adults don't show the same effect and only show reductions in the non-classical monocyte subset. As we were collecting samples from children aged one all the way through to 14, we also wanted to explore if there was an age-related difference in the response in children. 
And so what you can see on the right hand side there is at the ages of all our children on the x-axis and the proportion of their immune cells. When we look at the classical intermediate and non-classical monocytes, we can see that uh, SARS-CoV-2 positive children in the purple demonstrate reduced proportions, uh, generally regardless of their age. But however, we do see particularly in the intermediate and non-classical subsets, more marked effects in children under five. Um, whilst we didn't see a difference in the proportion of neutrophils in the blood of children and adults, we did see some differences in the activation status of these cells. And so to measure this, we looked at CD63 expressing neutrophils, and this marker is a marker of neutrophil activation. And what we see is increased proportions of these activated neutrophils in children with SARS-CoV-2 infection during the acute phase uh, compared to the SARS-CoV-2 exposed children. And underneath there, you can see that the adults did not show the same effect. And again, we wanted to explore if there were any age-related differences. And what we can see is a consistent signature of increased proportions of these cells in children um, from all the way from age one all the way through to 14. So to summarize this part, uh, we show reduced circulating proportions of monocytes and dendritic cells during SARS-CoV-2 infection in children. And we also show increased proportions of activated neutrophils. And these signatures were not observed at all, or at least to the same extent in adults with SARS-CoV-2 infection. So what does it mean to have reduced proportions of innate cells in the blood and why might this be important? Well, several reports have also shown reduced proportions of monocytes in the blood of adults with COVID-19. And they have suggested that this possibly reflects the redistribution of these cells out of the circulation and into, into the lung where they can help fight the infection. This was particularly demonstrated in the second study there, um, which shows a marked infiltration of um, inflammatory cells in the lungs of adults with COVID-19 compared to healthy controls. And that can be seen by the infiltration of the blue, green and purple cells. On the right hand side is another study that looks at paired blood and bronchoalveolar lavage samples collected from adults with COVID-19. And what they showed was that uh, reductions in cells such as dendritic cells, monocytes, and those inflammatory non-classical monocytes were associated with increased proportions of these cells in the lung in the same patients. So the reduced proportions of innate cells in the blood of children with COVID-19 that we see in our study may reflect the greater infiltration of these cells into the site of infection where they can help respond to the virus. So as the reduced severity of COVID-19 infection in children contrasts with the higher prevalence and severity that we see in most other respiratory viruses for children, we wanted to compare innate immune responses in children with COVID-19 to children with other common respiratory viral infections. And so we were able to do this in our cohort because not only did we test these children for SARS-CoV-2, but we also tested them for a range of other respiratory viruses using a broad uh, respiratory PCR panel. And so what we did was compare innate immune proportions in children with SARS-CoV-2 infection compared to those without SARS-CoV-2 infection, but they did have evidence of another respiratory virus and then children without SARS-CoV-2 or without respiratory virus. And these were our negative controls. And so what we showed was that SARS-CoV-2 single and co-infected children showed the greatest change in innate cell responses during the acute phase. And that can be seen in the, in the red bars there, particularly for the natural killer and then natural killer cells and the non-classical monocyte population. However, we do acknowledge that the numbers are quite small and this needs to be explored further in bigger studies. Um, so uh, our work has been published in these three papers that are listed here. And we've also contributed to some other resources in Nature News and Comment, as well as the conversation. However, there has been other work done globally, uh, look, comparing innate immune responses in children and adults with COVID-19. And most of these studies have just come out in the past few months. And I wanted to highlight two of these because I think they provide really important evidence in this space. So this first study here was the first to profile innate immune responses in children um, in the upper airway. So what they did was collect uh, nasopharyngeal swabs uh, from children and adults with COVID-19, and they performed RNA sequencing to um, 
to perform differential gene expression analysis between uh, adult, uh, sorry, between adults with COVID-19 and children with COVID-19. And they also looked at some of the soluble inflammatory factors present in the, in the sample as well. And so what this study showed was that children displayed higher expression of genes associated with interferon signaling, inflammasome signaling, as well as other innate immune pathways. And they also showed higher levels of inflammatory mediators compared to, to adults. And this can be seen on the bar graphs below there with increased levels of cytokines such as interferon alpha, R1, beta, and R8, which we know play key roles in the inflammatory immune response. And so this was the first study to show a more vigorous and activation of the innate immune pathways in the upper airway of children compared to adults at the clinical presentation with COVID-19. This was then followed up um, by another study that also uh, collected upper respiratory samples from children and adults with COVID-19. But in this case, they also had a control group. So they had some children without COVID-19 and some adults without COVID-19 to compare to. And this study uh, performed single cell RNA sequencing on the cells of the upper airway to look at gene expression between the clinical groups, but also look at what genes were changing within each particular cell type they could identify. And so this study showed that children have increased proportions of immune cells present in the upper airway, particularly the innate immune cells compared to adults, and that's at baseline, so without infection. These cells then increase in children um, with COVID, COVID infection. They also showed that children displayed higher basal expression of pattern recognition receptors, um, and this was evident in the upper airway epithelial cells, the macrophages and dendritic cells, and this then resulted in stronger innate antiviral responses upon SARS-CoV-2 infection in the children compared to the adults. So the overall summary of this paper was that airway immune cells of children are already primed for viral sensing because they did show differences in the, in the healthy controls. And this then resulted in a stronger early innate antiviral response to SARS-CoV-2 infection when compared to adults. Uh, so to, to, to summarize, the mechanisms underpinning the age-related differences in the severity of COVID-19 are likely to be multifactorial. Today, I've only just touched on one of them being differences in innate immune responses. And so what we have shown here in Melbourne is that children with mild COVID-19 have altered systemic innate cell responses compared to adults. And other studies globally have shown um, differences in innate immune activation to SARS-CoV-2 in the upper airway in children. And so understanding the immune mechanisms that underpinning, underpin this age gradient in COVID-19 will not only give us key insights into disease pathogenesis, but also may provide important opportunities for prevention and treatment of vulnerable groups. So I'd just like to finish there and um, thank everyone involved in this study, particularly Chudan Tosif and Nigel Crawford, who run the FFX programs, Professor Andrew Steer, who's the head of our infection and immunity uh, department at, at MCRI, our FFX study team and clinical uh, coordinators, as well as our collaborators across the Parkville precinct. And of course, the children and parents who participated in these studies during what is a very difficult time for them. So thank you. circumstances and maybe being in isolation you can rest a bit because you don't have to go to basketball this evening but uh really really enjoyed your honesty and wish you were here with us today um thank you to all our speakers for some fantastic talks all very different i hope um and got you they're all thought provoking unfortunately we haven't had time for conversation hope they've given you some ideas about ways you want to work or research or advocate or think about COVID in the years ahead that we'll be facing. We're going to take a break now for 15 minutes and come back at 11.20. So we'll be just sort of close back on time. Um, and we'll see you back there here at 11.20. Thanks everyone. Well, welcome back, everybody, to this next session. My name is Brendan Crabb, the director of the Burnett Institute, and it's very, really my great pleasure to uh, to be here today and as part of the Burnett to co-host today's proceedings. 
Um, may I also begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land that we're on, the land of the Wurundjeri people, and pay my respects, I know, on behalf of us all, to the elders past, present, and emerging. Now, it, it's not often you get to um, hear from the person who um, uh, the Institute is actually named after, in this case, the, uh, the, the Peter Doherty Institute, but of course we do today, namesake and, uh, and patron of the Peter Doherty Institute is Nobel Laureate Peter Doherty who um, uh, is a T-cell immunologist and, and virologist, um, uh, obviously with extraordinary scientific credentials, scientific leadership credentials, um, but also uh, very much as an advocate, advocate for science and, uh, and advocate for science beyond even just uh, uh, the, the biomedical. Um, climate change, great passion of, uh, of Peter's, written many books as a part of that advocacy um, effort. And so quite appropriately, we're going to hear from Peter today on the challenges of science communication in COVID times. Peter, welcome. Thanks very much, um, Brendan. I'm, I'm kind of a neurotic about meetings being on time, so I'll try and be, be brief. Uh, I was told I'd get a clock, but I don't see it. Oh, there it is. Yeah, okay, it's a big clock. Good. Um, so I, I realized I had to give this talk uh, too late, so I pulled together some slides, which are highly inappropriate because they're from a, uh, a pre-COVID talk that I gave to science communicators. So what I'm going to do is talk um, fairly fast and, uh, and just ad lib as I go through these, and you can read them if you want, if you're so deluded. But um, how do I change this bloody thing? The... Button doesn't work or something? Or... Go forward? Or... Hey? Yeah, yeah. Okay, right. So, um, yeah, the reason I got an institute named after me is because years ago we won a Nobel Prize. And uh, uh, my friend uh, Zinkan Uncle there. We, we won the Nobel Prize for working out how the killer T cells work. These are the cells that bump off virus infected cells. Viruses only grow within cells. And if you're gonna bring an infection to an end, then you've got to kill them off. And, and we really made a chance discovery which led us into understanding how that whole thing works. And you know, 20 years later, we got a Nobel Prize and this is about hundred years ago anyway. I'm actually part of the living fossil record of science because I discovered how, how half the immune, adaptive immune system works. You heard adaptive immunity mentioned earlier. That's a specific response that we stimulate with vaccination, with infection. And then of course, we heard also about the innate response, which is that early holding response, which really holds things in check until the innate response can get going because it takes about a week or so. And, uh, and basically the, the killer T cells that we worked on, they're the ones that, that, that make you better. Uh, they don't stop you getting infected. They're not immediately mobilized. That's the antibodies. These are little molecules that float around in the blood and everything made by cells called B cells. They grab hold of the virus, stop it getting into the cells if you've got enough of them, which we rarely do, especially up in the nose. And uh, so these are the cells that make you a bit better. And that's what's holding with the, we think, that's what's holding with the vaccines because Omicron is very different from the earlier viruses in the antibody bit, but it's not that different in the T cell bit. So that's why we still think that being multiply vaccinated, and if you hadn't had your third shot yet, go out and get it. That's, that's where I think the vaccines may actually be working. So next slide. So um, vaccination, uh, I, uh, this is me back in 1997 when I was Australian of the year. I was living in the United States and they made me the Australian of the year. It wasn't a Miss America contest like it is now. Uh, it was a, a, a group of guys sitting around in a room in Sydney with a couple of bottles of Grange. They had to decide on someone before they started drinking and I just won a Nobel Prize. So they made me Australian of the year. I was living in Tennessee. So I was coming back here and I felt a bit like uh, uh, Davy Crockett at, uh, coming back to Australia at this end. And, uh, and basically, I congratulated John Howard on the progress the country was make, making towards becoming a republic. Because at that stage, they'd have been pushing forward. I'd left when there was a Labor government. Uh, and at that stage, they were heading forwards. And of course, John Howard started that process of taking us backwards into, into mediocrity and, and narrow-mindedness and all the rest of it that he's so well known for. And this is me vaccinating John against the republic 
Now, I didn't need to do that. He hated the idea. He's a monarchist. I didn't realize there were people called monarchists in Australia, but there are. Ah, they're, they're dying out, I think. And of course, this is where France got it really right in 1789. They topped them. Uh, they, the bastards came back to some extent, but you can never keep them completely away. So next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. Yeah. So suddenly I'm plunged into the public arena. Here I am, a lab science squirreling away. Well, I wasn't really. I was writing papers and the younger people were doing all the squirreling away. I'm writing papers and sitting on committees and being very important in my field. Uh, being very important in your field is, as my uncle, who was a very good tennis player, said, in the scale of tennis, it's playing B grade for Dolby which is a country town. So that's, that's the sort of prominent scientists have in the community, pretty much zero, except with COVID. They've all been out there. You've seen people you've never seen before. You've heard words like virologist, immunologist, and God forbid, epidemiologist. And uh, we know these words. We know about modelers. I get blamed for being a modeler. I'm not smart enough to be a modeler. I mean, they're all mathematical and wizards. Jody McVernon's sitting over here. She, she's, she's going to talk. And so here I am. This is the Rex effect. You come out of the lab, Rex, an old dog trying to do a new trick. And I've been trying to do that trick for years now. So I've learned a bit about science communication uh, for good or ill. Next slide, please. So we don't even need to worry about this. Science communication at the moment is all about one thing. What's going to happen with COVID? Uh, where's it going? And, uh, and what happens next? I don't know the answer to any of those questions and haven't ever prepared to do so. Jodie's got some ideas because she's a modeler, uh, but you know they're just good guesses anyway. And the bloody virus does things that none of us expect. Look at Omicron. I mean, we didn't expect it. It's like the, you know, that, that uh, Monty Python skit about the Holy Inquisition. Nobody expects the Holy Inquisition. And we, we've been instructed by nature, which is what good scientists are. They're people who study what's happening in the world and they're instructed by what's happening. Not what politicians want or what powerful people want or Vladimir Putin wants or some other nutter, but they're instructed by nature. That's the nature of modern science. That really started in the 17th century. And that's what's brought our science our society to where we are. Uh, not making pronouncements or having opinions or even writing for the Australian. Uh, it's basically studying the thing itself. So my role in the, all this has been talk about the thing I know about, which is virus infections, how virus diseases work. Virus pathogenesis is the field. That's the field of understanding how a virus causes a disease within you and the host response. That's the immune response, particularly the host response. And one of the things that COVID has done for us is it's provided the resources at a time when the study of immunity in humans was really becoming sophisticated because we can work with very small amounts of blood using modern technologies. And what we've been studying is not just measuring antibodies in blood, which vaccinologists did for years, we've been studying the cellular immune response. So learning from COVID, we are going to learn an enormous amount from COVID. We've got wonderful science being done here and around the planet. And all the scientists talking to each other, all publishing very rapidly and communication through preprint has been a really major feature of this pandemic. And uh, it's, it's also, we've got this phenomenon long COVID, which I hope, it's a horrible phenomenon. It's highly, it's a high frequency, but I hope, I hope that analyzing that with the sophisticated modern technology and knowing what the virus trigger is because we've diagnosed it by PCR will help us to understand this terrible problem of uh, myalgic encephala, whatever it is, that this chronic fatigue syndrome that has been bugging so many people and spoiling a lot of lives. And nobody's really been able to get a good handle on it. Now, hopefully with COVID, we'll start to sort that out. So there are pluses and minuses in what's been happening with COVID. But one of the pluses, of course, and from the point of view of a science communicator, is it's focused enormous attention on the science communication field. Next slide. So a lot of these things you don't have to worry about anymore uh, because it's not the worst scientists trying to tell people about something or, or shows people what's happening. 
in, in some area of science that is, isn't of much interest and you're trying to intrigue and draw people into it. Everybody's intrigued and they're drawn into it. A lot of them know the language. They know, they know words like T cells. Uh, they know words like virus mutation and, 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 uh, and, and gain of function experiments. Of course, we've got Australian journalists who uh, write books that are completely wrong, but you know, that's nothing, about, nothing to remark of that. So next slide. Um, yeah, and we also know, but this is a factor, is that though we are thinking in terms, and, and Michelle spoke about this rather well at the, when she spoke before about how she, she had to transition from being just a clinical doctor who's interacting with her patients and a good researcher too well, to, to actually thinking in the public health sense about the whole community thing. And so we as scientists, we're all think, well, let's say we're thinking about relative risk, probability, group sizes, all that sort of thing, which people don't normally think about. And even in this context they don't so much think about and a lot of the response of course uh, particularly from people who don't read a whole lot is at, at in the sense of an emotional response and so we see that over and over because that's what of course tv news programs love to play but it does confuse thinking look honestly the general public we in science we care we have to publish in cell or nature look as far as the public is concerned we can be publishing in the batuta advocate or the herald sun i mean they don't care and um and there are some good lessons though this is one good lesson and it's difficult especially online on twitter never humiliate anyone in any context if you're going to be a public science communicator respect your audience even if someone in the audience asks a question which people think is really silly and uh, they agree with you that this is really silly if you tell the person they're being really silly you'll lose your audience because that's the way we work as human beings you have to understand people and how they work next slide please um that's irrelevant let's go on to the next one uh yeah we can lose that one too uh, I've never turned down an invitation to speak. If you want to get a message across, it doesn't matter who you're asked to speak for. You may think it's great to talk on the ABC. It doesn't matter. I mean, ABC is watched by at the most 20% of people and you don't have to convince most of them anyway. What you want to do is be on heavy metal radio, talk back radio, sport radio, talking to communities you've never, never uh, talked to before. I think we, big mistake in the whole vaccination thing, we should have got tattooists giving vaccines. I mean, after all, when you get a tattoo, it goes exactly the same path as the vaccine. You have a tattoo with blue dye, you've got blue dye in your lymph nodes for the rest of your life. And when they break it up with a laser, it all goes into little bits which go all around your body. These people are worried, all these tattoo guys are worried about having a vaccine. God almighty, they're really risk takers anyway. They say they don't understand they are. Um, for young, if you're in the sciences, write for the conversation. You can have great stuff. If you're not reading the conversation, read the conversation. There's, there's academics writing and being edited by professional journalists. This is a Victorian initiative. It was helped with money from the Victorian government and it's gone global and it's a massively successful. Great way for young scientists to get a, posi uh, a position. Next slide. Um, yeah, visual imagery is important, especially if you're in science and you've got great visual imagery, you make videos or, or just talking or you've anything, maybe, maybe, uh, what is that thing where we're going to dance? I've forgotten, they gave, us, they gave us a lot of money. Yeah, yeah they, they wanted me to do that. No way. I mean, you know, but um, do that, do that stuff. Visual imagery is what really gets people. Everyone understands that you can explain really complex science with a little cartoon. I think we should have a budget and once Brendan joins us, maybe he'll provide the money because they're great. They're great in public communication, social science. The, the, the Burnett is fantastic in, in harm reduction. We, we should have a group that's really just doing cartoons, maybe on TikTok as well. Now, next slide. Um, and Rebecca Elliott, our chief of our communications thing is really lovely. Uh, some, I had to do something in this. I've already stopped running a lab. So I've been doing public communications all through the pandemic, writing a series called Setting It Straight for our website. You can read these. They were really good for the first 50 or so. They got more and more boring as time goes by. Um, but I'm still writing them. You know, uh, 
One of the things about being a scientist is stoicism. We fail all the time. So you've got to be a stoic or you never get anywhere. Uh, the next slide. And um, oh, this is advice if you're on Twitter, which I am. I've got 109,000 followers. I'm an influencer. I could be selling clothes or something. But, you know, I was invited to an influencer's dinner in New York. God almighty, I couldn't contemplate the sort of people who'd be at that dinner. I mean, just would make you weep. And, and so anyway, um, but this is good advice for Twitter. Never fight with turkeys. Um, okay, next slide. And I, I write long, for, long form books. Nobody much reads them, but it gives you a lot of satisfaction and uh, you feel you've done something. And it, it's something you can pick up and hold and they do last forever. And, you know, maybe someone in a bookshop, if there's still such things in a hundred years time, will pick up one of my books and read it with wonder. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Peter. And what you'll notice in those books is that uh, he's been writing about pandemics for a long time before, um, you know, and most of us, any of us, of course, had heard about COVID or really understood that we faced uh, such a crisis. Peter could have spoken on any topic at all um, for today's symposium. So thanks very much, because that is, um, is perhaps the toughest of all, given, given how much um, communication seems so linked and messaging seems so linked with how this pandemic's gone, good and bad, at least as equal as the science itself. Uh, so thanks so much, Peter. That was uh, um, uh, tour de force as, as always. We heard from Ben Cowie this morning about this state's response and a bit of Australia's response to COVID. And at the centre of that very much was the Victorian Infectious Diseases Reference Laboratory known as Vidral, um, that's based at the Doherty Institute. And our next speaker is the Director of Vidral, Professor Deb Williamson, who's going to um, uh, tell us about the role of public health laboratories in responding to the pandemic. The title sounds um, uh, boring, but it is <laughs> incredible. It is, it's what saved so many people in this state and this country. We, um, we can be incredibly grateful for those who led to Vidral being formed in the first place and those who now lead it and those who now work there. So thanks very much, Deb. Thanks, Brendan. And you're right, it is a, it is a boring title, not chosen by myself. And got to love following Peter Doherty at a conference, right? But yeah. All right, so look, I do want to talk about... Um, the role of the public health labs um, in responding to the um, pandemic and it has been quite a ride um, and um, I'm presenting this I guess uh, I am presenting it but it's, it is work that has been conducted on behalf of uh, actually thousands and thousands of people across the country um, and also you know a lot of people in Victoria and some of whom are here today and I've no doubt are online as well what I want to do is just to cover three main areas. One is, what are the core functions of a public health laboratory? What do we actually, what do we do? And I appreciate that, you know, even in our building, we're kind of locked away um, and people think, oh, what do they do in there? They go in, I see them getting in the lifts and going in there, but what do they do? Um, so I'll, I'll talk you through briefly, you know, um, I guess what our core functions are. I want to talk about some of the approaches that we've taken to um, COVID-19 testing. And these um, haven't just been, you know, churning out PCRs. There's been a lot of work that's gone on. Um, and I want to, um, I guess, think about some learnings um, from a public health lab perspective for future responses. All right, so what do we do? And, and actually there are documents that outline the core functions of a public health lab. And public health labs really, um, you know, cover the gamut of public health microbiology. And it's a, I mean, it's a great area for um, uh, those of us who are interested in microbiology, epidemiology, um, surveillance, um, uh, and actually uh, diplomacy as well as an absolute prerequisite. Um, so if you're involved, if you're interested in all of these things, public health microbiology is a great place to work and it cuts across a range of different disciplines. And really, you know, the, the, our labs 
play a central role in detecting, responding, uh, surveying um, infectious diseases uh, and outbreaks. So there's a core backbone, if you like, of public health laboratories across Australia, and we're kind of loosely grouped together, or formally, I should say, grouped together um, in the public health laboratory network. And that's a network that's been going for many years across Australia. It's a collaborative group of labs that really involve those labs that provide services in public health microbiology. Um, and there are some, I guess, there's some terms of reference around that. Um, and um, it's uh, formally designated as a subcommittee of AHPPC. Um, and really, you know, PHLN members um, worked um, uh, ultra hard really during the pandemic. The two labs, two public health labs in Victoria are based at the Doherty. Bre Brendan's told you a bit about Vidral and there's another public health lab, which I'm sure you all know that um, uh, MDU public health lab um, uh, led by Ben Howden. Um, and, you know, a lot of the work that I'll describe has been a, a really fantastic collaborative effort um, across both of these labs. So I'm just going to talk through a timeline, I think, of what some of the key events, if you like, have been in uh, public health laboratories and really focusing on Australia and more specifically focusing on some of the work we've done in Victoria. But I can tell you that the work that we've done here has you know, it's followed a similar timeline in public health labs across the globe. You know, we've all been working, I guess, um, around and on similar things. So the first thing was really in early January, and you'll, you'll all be aware of this. And actually, you know, when I tried to find a picture of this on the ABC News, the headline came up, Mike Catton smiling. I did not put that there. That was actually the headline. So I thought, mm, I know. <laughs> um, Mike smiles a lot. So I was surprised this made front page news. But Anyway, so that was um, uh, obviously the, the vidrol led by Mike Catton at that time was the first lab outside China to, to isolate the virus. Um, and, and, I, uh, and I think Mike Catton says this discovery is vitally important and I would 100% agree with him because you know, what happened from that was the sharing of that isolate. That isolate, um, and to Mike's eternal credit, that isolate was shared with laboratories, not just up the road, but across the globe. And it's, it has been used and it continues to be used in multiple papers, in vaccine development and evaluation, in assay design, in labs throughout the world. And I was just looking at this paper last week and I thought, and I saw the, the figure there, and you'll see there's alpha, beta, gamma, delta, omicron, and the Victoria strain as well. Not, I didn't realize that was part of the Greek alphabet, but um, there you go. Um, and so, you know, this, it's still continuing to be used um, in high impact work. And, you know, I, I think that that early decision to share the, and, and absolutely appropriate decision to share the isolate has been critical to, um, to the global response. All right, so thinking, moving on from that, and that really, you know, I want to talk about some of the challenges that we play, uh, we've faced with supply chain shortages. And this was something that hit really early in the pandemic when there was a massive, if you recall, there was a massive push on to upscale testing. And, you know, if 2021 was the year of the vaccine, then I think 2020 really was the year of the test. And everybody wanted to be, you know, epidemiologists, yeah, yeah, great. But in 2020, everybody... <laughs> Sorry, Jody. Everybody wanted to be a pathologist in 2020. Everybody had an opinion about diagnostic testing, and I've, you know, I've reflected on why that might be. And I think my own thoughts are that, you know, in that period between the pandemic arriving and vaccines becoming a sort of tangible reality, there was a lot of narrative around, oh, we can test our way out of this pandemic. Test, test, test. You know, that's how we're going to control it. And so there was a big focus on diagnostic testing. And I never thought that I'd be, you know, explaining to journalists or on telly talking about the positive predictive value of tests. It was, you know, it was quite bizarre. And so we tried, I guess, to innovate around diagnostic testing. And that was in response to clinical and public health needs. So in response to things like shortages of swabs, shortages of PPE. And one of the first things that we looked at was using saliva as a, as a diagnostic specimen. Um, and we found that it wasn't that bad. And then, you know, literature started to emerge on this. And again, this, this was a consistent theme, particularly in 2020. As soon as we did something and published it, it was, you know, it was leapt on. Um, and, and the saliva testing was picked up 
funded by the Victorian government. Bidrill did a lot of work at that time to, to upscale that testing. Um, and actually it was rolled out across the state and then across the country in, in things like managed quarantine programs. And in Victoria alone, there have been over 500,000 of these swabs now. And for a short period in time, you know, that surveillance testing using saliva as a sample provided a really kind of fragile shield, if you like, um, uh, uh, around the border. The other thing I want to talk about, we did a lot of work early on um, uh, across clinical and public health labs was looking at these lateral flow point of care antibody tests, not antigen tests, which I'll touch on, but antibody tests. And if you'll remember back in early 20, these were potentially the, ne the next great thing. We can use them as immunity passports, et cetera. Um, and uh, um, we did a lot of work looking at the sensitivity of these, the specificity of these, and at, at that point, I guess, how we might use them in, in what was for a long time a low prevalence setting. And, you know, no great shakes there. We find that the sensitivity improved, the, you know, the, the later you took uh, blood from, from somebody. Um, and we worked with the TGA uh, to do a formal post-market evaluation of these uh, of these kits, again, kind of highlighting, if you like, that intersect between the public health lab, government, epidemiology and diagnostic testing. Um, and again, this took up a lot of time. And I know Rebecca Elliott from the Doherty Comstock took up a lot of her time as well, you know, talking about where these, some of our findings and what these findings meant in relation to the, the broader rollout of these tests. All right, I just, I'm not going to spend too long on talking about the implementation of genomics because I know Narelle Sherry is going to talk about this this afternoon, but I do want to just highlight that this was really one of the, I guess, one of the better coordinated efforts across public health labs um, uh, in Australia and indeed globally, actually. I think it's a real success story of the pandemic, but it didn't emerge out of nowhere. So it was built on I guess, years and years of work and collegial collaborative efforts across public health labs in Australia. Um, and that was underpinned, I guess, by something called the Communicable Diseases Genomics Network, which was set up in 2015, a kind of loose, initially a loose affiliation of people who were using genomics, but then gradually became formalized, it became resourced. And you know, again, um, leverage from a whole lot of, this is non-COVID research, but leverage from a whole lot of additional genomics research in public health, food, looking at foodborne diseases, STIs, AMR, et cetera. So when the pandemic hit, people were really able to adapt the technology, adapt the knowledge and the expertise in their labs and focus on genomics. Um, and a lot of great work has come out, not just not just from Victoria in genomics, but public health labs across the country and, and obviously across the globe. All right, so I'm just going to um, uh, cover rapid antigen tests now. And these have been, uh, in case you've been living on the moon, um, these have been really prominent uh, uh, in the media. Um, and, and, uh, and obviously, you know, I would suspect that most of the people in the audience, uh, if not all, have used them at least once. Um, and so a rapid antigen test, as we know, is less sensitive than a PCR, but the trade-off from that is portability, speed, uh, uh, I'm going to say cost, but that, that in and of itself is a political issue. And we know they're less sensitive than molecular tests. And these were first introduced in the Australian market in September 2020. Just a few kind of trickled on then and, and then the floodgates opened. And, you know, the, there's been a real... Uh, it's uh, interesting to think about how these have been in a way politicized or were early on politicized, I guess, around we can use them to open up and no PCR is the gold standard. So it was quite an interesting narrative to watch and then and then subsequently be part of. We evaluated these in late uh, 2020, again, in what was a low prevalence setting at that time. This is um, Steve Mui, who's the first author on that paper and was really he heavily involved in setting up a trial across three different hospitals in, in Melbourne. Um, we struggled actually to get any positive cases at that time. So we didn't learn much about the, I guess, the analytical or clinical performance of the kits per se. But actually what we learned was a whole lot about the logistics of implementing these kits. And when we think of rapid antigen tests now, Yes, we know they're less sensitive than PCR, but what they are really, if we think about the issues around them, they're logistical issues, supply chains, how to roll them out, 
where to get them, where to procure them. Um, and we learned a lot about that from that evaluation. And again, we're doing a formal post-market evaluation at the moment with the TGA, and that is, that is ongoing. And again, I just want to highlight another innovation, and this is something that came out of MDU Public Health Lab, led by um, uh, Ben Howden, Sue Ballard, and others. And this is really, I think this is a fantastic innovation, um, looking at mobile testing. And so we were involved in setting up a shipping container um, on the university campus, and then subsequently MDU became really the first um, mobile testing unit that was not accredited in Australia. Um, and this, you know, provided invaluable rapid response for the Victorian government. So, you know, really fantastic innovation. And finally, I just want to talk about, about another, I guess, ongoing innovation, which is preparedness for the next variant. And again, this is a program across both labs, looking at things like rapid screening for, for variants of concern, genomic characterization, phenotypic characterization, um, immune, immune responses, and enhanced surveillance for box. And this is very much a live issue at the moment with a lot of work going on in this space. And, and we did some very early work, I guess, um, when Omicron emerged, looking at whether or not antigen tests would detect them. Um, and I can see that this, this program of work will probably keep us very busy in 2022. All right, but it's not all patting each other on the back and saying, great job. Um, but I think there have been some challenges and I think there are things that we could do better in the future. Fragmentation at local, national and global levels, I think has been a key feature, um, particularly, and I, I would say, you know, even in Victoria alone, where there are a number of different pathology labs, what that led to was competition for reagents, competition for resources, and some duplication, I guess, of time and resource. And I think that really highlights the need for better coordination and communication across different networks at different levels, state, national, international as well. I really want to highlight the absolute critical nature of translational research here. So research in a pandemic isn't something that just sits out there in a bubble. It's absolutely fundamental to drive policy. And we've seen that at all levels, whether it's you know research that's come out of mRNA research or research that's come out of assay evaluation or research that's come out of clinical trials. It's something that should just be taken as given in a pandemic. And I think public health labs have played an absolutely critical role in uh, research in the pandemic. But I would just say that I think, I think that there is room for better improvement of national um, national coordination across this. I look at some of the work that we've done and I think, gee, if we'd been able to do that across a number of states, it would have been, you know, it would have been more powerful. And finally, clinical engagement is critical. We can't just sit in, in isolation in our labs. We need clinical engagement. And, you know, we heard a lot about this from Michelle earlier, you know, around that need to, um, uh, uh, to really drive clinical research um, and clinical and laboratory research, they are inextricably linked. You, you know, it's, it's rare that you have one without the other. Um, and uh, again, I just want to highlight the importance of, you know, collecting and curating reference material as it comes through the labs, because that then, you know, that, that forms a bank of samples that can be used for subsequent research. And we've seen how critical that is when new variants arrive as, as well. All right, so I just want to acknowledge a few people here um, uh, and particularly um, uh, uh, the Victorian state government. I have to say that they have, have took a very forward looking approach quite early on in the pandemic where they decided to invest heavily in the public health labs in a program um, which has loosely been called innovative testing, um, but you know, it's driven a lot of this work. Um, and I think uh, hopefully it has, um, um, uh, I guess, paid off for them um, in as much as, you know, the, the work that we're generating is helping uh, to drive policy and is feeding back into decision making. Um, a lot of um, uh, people to, to thank across the public health labs uh, and Royal Melbourne as well, who've been great collaborators here. Um, and some key project staff and, uh, you know, the, the people that I've named here, again, have worked um, uh, uh, over above and beyond to underpin uh, a lot of these projects and to really keep the wheels turning on them. Um, so thanks very much.
Thanks so much, Deb. And uh, I'm sorry, we, we uh, have seven speakers in this session, so we're not going to do questions. Um, of course, we will have uh, time for discussion this afternoon, but thanks so much. There's, I wrote a lot down then, um, but I think the highest, um, the thing I remember most is, is just how strong institutions matter. And, and it means you're prepared. Uh, the institutions and, of course, the people behind the institutions and everything that comes from that, this state and country is incredibly well served. So thanks very much for, for presenting that story to us. Um, we move on now to another pre-record um, because it's now probably 1 a.m., I suspect, in, in France, at, uh, uh, in Nantes, at the University of Nantes, which is where our next uh, speaker is from, Antoine uh, Roquilli. And Antoine is, I know, has some connections to, to Australia and especially to a close friend and collaborator of mine, Jose Villadangos. Um, but he specialises in another um, area that I think has become part of the, the COVID lexicon, and that's intensive care and intensive care units. Now, that's one that's not as vague as, um, as epidemiologist, as I'll, as I'll speak about in a moment, but every person basically in Australia now speaks about uh, in intensive care. And so we're, we're going to hear from, uh, from uh, Antoine around um, the COVID-19 pandemic and intensive care units, the challenges and opportunities from that. Antoine. Hello everyone, my name is Antoine Rocky. I'm a professor of anesthesiology and intensive care in Nantes University Hospital on the west part of France and pleased to join the symposium remotely and to talk about challenges and opportunities in intensive care units during the COVID-19 pandemic. My usual research field of researches are hospital acquired pneumonia, which are recording in up to 500,000 patients every year in Europe. And for intensive care units, it's a common condition since 25% of the patients still develop hospital acquired pneumonia during their stays. My team is pushing forward a new physiopathology of these conditions, and we consider that severe pneumonia is not only the contamination of the lung by pathogens, but is a case of disruptions between normal interaction between respiratory microbiome and mucosal immunity. These new high ideas have the way to new therapies such as immune modulators and modulation and ed editing of the respiratory microbiome and to new biomarkers to develop tailored management of severe pneumonia. Our idea is that if we can assess and investigate at the bedside the status of host microbial interactions, we will be able to predict which patients would be safely cured and easily cured from the pneumonia which patients need uh, innovations in immune therapies or modulation of the microbiome. So when the COVID-19 pandemic hit France two years ago, my team has two challenges to face. The first one was to cure and treat patients because a lot of patients arrive rapidly in intensive care unit in France, but also to continue researches to propose and develop new treatments. So you can see that up to five Hundred and six hundred hospitalizations were recorded daily at the beginning in France. You need to know that the patients stay in intensive care unit between two to three weeks on average, showing that with six, only 6,000 ICU beds in France, after 10 days of such wave, all the ICU beds, critically ill beds, were occupied by COVID-19 patients. So we had to face uh, 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 too big number of patients to be treated in classical intensive care units. We also had to access to some device to protect the caregivers. These devices are not so easy to use. We didn't have such big stock to treat a such a big number of patients. And so we rapidly faced shortage in mask, uh, gloves and protection for the caregivers. So regarding the shortage in beds in critical cares, most of the hospitals have developed temporary intensive care units. To do so, you need to contact nurses and medical doctors with training in critical cares 
and place them in these new intensive care units. But for sure, the result is that you decrease the number of caregivers available for other pathology, and it will result in delayed surgical procedure, delayed or difficult access for treatment of strokes or myocardial infarctus. The second thing we had to face is an heterogeneous impact in France. So during the first wave of COVID-19, only three hotspots rec were recorded, the South, East, and Paris area, meaning that in some West parts of France or North, the, we still receive patients, but we still have capacities to recruit and uh, welcome uh, uh, patients in our intensive cares. So the France organized some transfer of patients from hotspots to hospitals with available capacities to treat patients. This is quite challenging because you need to move critically ill patients under invasive mechanical ventilation by trains, helicopter or planes. And uh, during some days, up to 100 patients were moved from one hospital to another. It's medically challenging and it can increase the risk for the patient's transfer because you can lost medical information. You have a, it's difficult to treat patients in a train and you also remove the patient from his neighborhood and relatives because you can place the patient at 500 kilometers far away from his home. We are currently analyzing the impact of these strategies on the outcome of transfer patients. And all this uh, impact has disorganize the cares for other COVID, uh, for non-COVID-19 patients. One of the main messages was if you have to be operated for a scheduled surgery, but you are carrying COVID-19 virus at this time, your risk of developing morbidity or even to die after the surgery was doubled. So now all the patients arriving for surgeries are screened for COVID-19, and if they are positive, the surgery is delayed. So it's not good for the control of cancer patients, and it's also a severe uh, cause of disorganization of health scares. The impact on the other patients uh, has been evaluated and uh, measured in this kind of studies where the increase in mortality per country where compared to the number of deaths recorded and directly due to COVID-19, and most of the cities of the countries had a higher rate of deaths than what was expected. Meaning that uh, all this disorganization of the uh, hospital system has increased the deaths of non-COVID-19 patients. It was also quite challenging for researchers, but uh, luckily the worldwide organizations has been able to coordinate some very big randomized clinical trials and big progress has been made rapidly. For instance, dexamethasone has been shown to reduce the risk of death of severe COVID-19 patients. And after only a few months of pandemia, uh, we, the world has been able to include more than 6,000 patients in this first randomized clinical trial. So from June 2020, we were able to treat patients with dexamethasone. Some other immune therapies have been developed and some recent has proven efficiency to decrease the risk of death, such as tocilizumab, which is an interleukin-6 inhibitor receptor, or baricitinib, which is a JAX1 and 2 inhibitor. So you can see if you treat COVID-19 patients, now the rate of the death was lower at the end of the pandemic than at the beginning in intensive care units. So a lot of progress has been done and now we have several immune therapies available. This has been possible, this rapid progress has been made possible by the new design uh, of randomized clinical trial because usually in, in medical practice, you test one intervention, you conclude, you test the second one, you conclude, you test the third one, you can conclude but it's very time consumptive. And now we have some new uh, randomized trial, crit critical trials, which are embedded platform and RemapCap, uh, for instance, is able to test the three or four intervention at the same time. And so you have four treatments tested, and if you are lucky, one or two are efficient and positive. And that's why in less than two years, we have now several immunotherapies efficient against COVID. 19 severe pneumonia in intensive care units. A lot of researches has also been made at the, uh, uh, at the, uh, at the bench. 
Uh, and we notably try to compare the specific and, co and common immune features of hospital acquired pneumonia and COVID-19 pneumonia. The aim was to define what is specific to COVID, what is common to all the case of severe pneumonia. And we have been able to find some characteristics which are specific and on NCAT uh, cells and monocytes, but also some other which are common. So it's a very good information and important information because you now can more precisely predict the outcome of COVID-19 pneumonia patients, but you can also find some features which are likely to be efficient in all cases of severe pneumonia, and it could be likely efficient for flu, bacterial infection, or COVID-19. So we think that this uh, pandemia has, from a scientific point of view, uh, reinforced our idea that severe pneumonia is a case of disruption of host microbial interactions. Uh, and this disruption is induced by a first pathogen uh, meeting, such as coronavirus, but could be another one. And if you can treat and restore these microbial mucosal uh, interactions, you can increase and enhance the outcome of patients independently from the first heaters, so independently from the viruses. So the aim of the treatment, which has been proven to be efficient, all aim to dampen the inflammatory response or restore some biosis. And this is the one which has been efficient in intensive care unit because all the antiviral treatments uh, fail to be efficient in intensive care units. So for severe pneumonia in ICU, this is the main target, and the good news is it could be the same target for different kinds of viruses. So I really want to thank my intensive care unit team for all the great work uh, and all the extra hours during the pandemic and my lab team. And I will also want to thank uh, the Peter Duarte uh, Institute where I performed my postdoc and Professor Vidadango's lab team. Uh, for the ongoing collaborations and also uh, the Department of Anesthesia and Critical Care from the Royal Melbourne Hospital for the future collaboration we will develop from next month. Uh, if ever you can come in France, please come and visit Nantes. It's a very great town and uh, I will be pleased to welcome you there. Take care and have a good symposium. Bye. Thank you so much, Antoine. I hope you uh, you see the, the the replay of this um, and and the questions and discussion later. But what incredible progress the world over, really, in our in our ICUs. The chances of survival now, if you enter one, are so much stronger uh, than uh, than they were now than they were at the beginning, with all the innovation that Antoine uh, spoke about and has played such a major role in driving and. Um, once again, you don't uh, uh, hear a talk about major innovation without microbiome coming up for those of us who work in that space. So, so um, very exciting progress. And thanks so much, Antoine, for that. Um, uh, ben also mentioned the uh, importance, Ben Cowie earlier, of the importance of, of mathematical modelling in, in guiding the response. He said he, he really couldn't overstate it. And... Um, the, we've also heard about, about scientists who are never um, heard of in the community becoming really well known. And our next speaker is the best known of all, um, I think, for, for both of those reasons. Um, Professor Jody McVernon, Director of Epidemiology at the uh, Peter Doherty Institute, um, has become uh, the person most people want to hear from. And it's been working with government, of course, uh, and separate from government, but a lot of the work with government. And we've all been hanging out to see what the next iteration of, uh, of Jody and her team's modelling will be to, uh, to help see where the, where the nation might go in the COVID response. It's really been that significant. It's a treat to have you here today, Jody. Um, the title of, of Jody's talk is Modelling the Health and Societal Impact of Pandemic Responses in Australia and the region. Welcome, Jody. Well, thanks very much, Brendan. And um, it's certainly been an interesting ride in the last couple of years, but epidemiologists have become known. Um, so in what I talk about in the next few minutes, I'm, I'm really not gonna focus much on the exact pieces of work we did. I think a lot of people are aware of some of the strategic advice that we've provided over the last few years. And we is a, is a massive distributed team of more than 30 uh, scientists, which you'll see on my final acknowledgement slide. So this is very much a, a joint national effort. 
But I think um, in, in thinking about what modeling does, you know, there were obviously a lot of armchair epidemiologists through the pandemic who could draw a line through data. But in fact, a lot of what we do as modelers is really try and distill down to the core um, drivers of epidemic behaviour, um, think about what we see and what we learn from it and how to synthesise new and emerging knowledge. And the last two years have been a time of constant adaptation as we learn new things and really try to synthesise that to anticipate what might happen next. So I'm just going to go through a few concepts that have been particularly important for us and, and I think uniquely relevant in our region where unlike most of the rest of the world, we have had countries with low or zero COVID burden over extended periods of time. So as modelers, we've had to develop new methods to deal with that. That's put us in a, in a position to be able to work with the region and actually given us a, you know, an important seat at the table with WHO's global vaccine strategy in really addressing needs that many other modelers have not been doing. So I'm going to talk a bit about transmission potential as a novel risk assessment metric in zero prevalence settings, uh, anticipating the combined impacts of layered interventions for health and the economy. And I think we've done some really interesting work uh, nationally with that. And then, you know, in terms of our next challenges, waning immunity, endemicity, whatever that means, uh, and the next variant of concern. And just to make the case of the position that Australia's in, and as I'm sure you're all aware, on the left, um, is the epidemiologic graph from Communicable Diseases Intelligence showing where we were to the end of November with uh, first and second waves, uh, the emergence of Delta really predominantly in New South Wales and Victoria coming under control with vaccination. Uh, and then to the right, here's the same chart from January with Omicron completely dwarfing all of the above. So we have moved, you know, in a heartbeat from a low prevalence to a high prevalence country. And that means we have to reset all our thinking and expectations. And globally, emergence of Omicron and its wash through the world is leading SAGE to rethink, well, what is the role of vaccine on top of this wave of natural immunity? And this concept of hybrid immunity is, is the hot topic right now. So thinking about transmission potential, so in a lot of countries monitoring um, epidemic transmission and growth, you know, it's been about looking at case numbers, seeing how they grow. We're all familiar with the reproduction number, the number of secondary cases per case as a metric um, that anticipates or, you know, assesses the rate of growth of epidemics. But in Australia, much of the time and in most jurisdictions, we've had absolutely nothing going on. So how do you assess risk? How do you understand the propensity for epidemics to occur in the absence of data? And here really is, is the novel methodology developed by Nick Golding at Curtin and TKI and working with others in the group to develop this metric called transmission potential. And really one of the things that we've um, really ramped up and used more than ever in this pandemic is mobility and understanding behavior. And I think, you know, I mean, I've always been a bit of a nagger that the frontline responders are walking on the street, not in the hospital, but boy, we would not have been where we were in Australia for the last two years without public cooperation and the public response. So it's a modeling framework that draws on time series data and on population behaviors and cases when the virus is present. So in Australia, even at low periods of activity, we did have the opportunity to observe epidemic growth. We did have the opportunity to observe the impact of different layers and levels of interventions being imposed. We knew what the characteristics and features of public health responses were, and we could see how epidemics grew and declined in response to those interventions. And with that, and with the intrinsic characteristics of the virus, we could think about the transmission potential and how it was altered by these different layers of interventions. And so there are uh, levels of information here from different sources, Google mobility trends, behavioral surveys, and obviously looking at um, people's um, behavioral responses, uh, and also the time to detection. So how quickly cases are isolated, it, you know, affects their ability to spread. So bringing in as much information as we could from purposive surveys and nationally listed line data, and often that augmented by states and territories, really thinking about how all of these different things were contributing to the observed spread of infection at times of infection activity, um, and then pulling those together into something we call the population-wide transmission potential. Because in all of those long periods of relative inactivity in Australia, as you will remember, there'd be a, you know, a hotel quarantine breach and importation into a city or whatever, and the, the um, state and territory chief health officers and premiers had to decide, do we impose restrictions to, to mean that this will not take off in our community? We have a window opportunity to act or not. And much of that was guided by transmission potential, which is saying, you know, your population, particularly in states without infections, is free range, your risk is high, or the population is mixing at relatively low levels, the mix is low. Um, and so these sorts of um, tools and measures of ongoing behaviour and mobility were used to guide much of the public health response. And then during times of outbreak, often there's deviation between this 
population-wide average transmission potential and what's actually happening um, with what we call R effective, so the rate of growth of the actual observed cases. And if that growth rate is lower than you would expect at the whole population level, that tells you the public health response is doing its job and it's actively getting to cases and shrinking that epidemic faster than you'd expect it to grow. If it's taking off more quickly than the average transmission potential, it often told us there were infections spreading in a subpopulation with a higher than average risk. And this certainly was the origin um, of, or you know, the, the key driver, I think, of, of what we saw in epidemics in Sydney and in Melbourne, where often outbreaks in, in cold populations with, you know, high household size, um, lower socioeconomic status, poor household quality, inability to isolate, requirement to attend work, uh, meant that that spread was higher than we would have expected. So these, these metrics were quite useful in telling us something about risk. And just to sort of show you how these mapped out in a time series for New South Wales, you know, we had the local case line list, we had the R effective of local active cases, we had this thing called transmission potential that came from all of these other inputs about mobility and behaviour, and then you could look for deviation between the two, which sometimes was lower in a good response or higher in a particular risk population. And these methods and approaches were taken out to the region, to Fiji, French Polynesia and some other settings, often limited by data, although these sort of Google mobility trends were really good indicators of the impacts of lockdowns in many settings. And actually, this, this notion of transmission potential was particularly useful in French Polynesia, where it became clear during their initial um, you know, alpha waves that it was much lower for some reason that we didn't understand than it was in many other high income settings. That seems to be a phenomenon across the Pacific. Um, that wave resolved, they had immunization. We were able using transmission potential as a metric to anticipate the peak of the Delta wave that subsequently came. And that was spot on. So this, this discount on transmission potential in that setting remained. So it's just something that allows us to characterize populations and anticipate risk quite effectively. And then this notion of transmission potential came through to the national plan. So um, as vaccination became available 2021, um, seeking to determine what our triggers and thresholds were for vaccination to allow reopening of the borders and some resumption of normal mixing and activity. Um, we were obviously commissioned to, to do some work to advise uh, health and treasury and, and prime minister and cabinet. And in doing that work, you know, we rapidly transitioning through a phase of emergence of the Delta variant, the fact that its transmissibility was higher, um, and, and realising that vaccines alone were probably going to be insufficient to hold it. Um, but, but in that work, using this notion of transmission potential, because as, as time rolled on, we obviously had states like Victoria and New South Wales under lockdown, working out when they could lift, and other states working out when they were going to be brave enough to open the doors. And these were very different risk appraisals in those states and territories, and this metric really allowed us to think about all of those conditions of, you know, the proxy two Australias that were in, 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 uh, in existence. We now have two Australians, just one of them is really tiny um, compared to the rest of us. So, and, and here using transmission potential as a metric. So here on the top, you know, what was the R naught or the, and, and then, you know, with that, the transmission potential of the Delta strain in our context, uh, that's the sort of top dotted line, halfway down there's a, a grayed out line, which is where we started with Wuhan strains. So we had a much higher target to, to reduce to a transmission potential of one or a reproduction number of one below which an epidemic will not grow because each case is only making one or fewer secondary cases. And with that, and using this metric, this, this diagram had real policy resonance in thinking about what it was that would get us to that line of one, of control. And so here, you know, we had our baseline public health and social measures, these changes in behaviours, hand washing, face masks, social distancing, uh, and the impact of the test, trace, isolate, quarantine response. So the public health response was holding us very well in Australia at that time. And then imposed on that, what can you achieve with vaccination coverage at different thresholds? And these were also optimised for the groups, the age groups in the population to be immunised. But there we could see that, you know, by about 80% coverage, we could get around this line of one, but at 70%, we still weren't there. And then overlaid, we had these estimated impacts on transmission potential of what we bundled as low, medium and high public health and social measures based on periods where these had been implemented in New South Wales, where we did have partial controls on top of epidemics um, to see how much they could reduce the transmission potential. And coming out of this was a recommendation that at 70%, we would be able to reopen if low public health and social measures remained in place. And at 80%, um, it should be sufficient to just have those baseline sort of expectations of changes in behaviour. So this was the sort of framing of the work that, that led to those national plan thresholds. 
And then on top of that, we had a really interesting piece of work with Treasury, um, who, who basically took just the economic costs of those interventions. So, yeah, they could tell you how many billions it was costing the country to be in full lockdown. Uh, and based on that and the balance saying, well, okay, at 50 or 60 or 70 or 80%, um, if we reopen and cases start to get out of control, what's the proportion of time that we would need to revert to more stringent measures to constrain epidemic growth? So this is in a period where lockdowns were still in play and showing quite clearly that at lower levels of coverage, when I can tell you there was a lot of political enthusiasm to reopen, um, that actually it would cost the economy more in terms of the costs of these lockdowns and restrictions than if we waited until coverage was higher and other measures were in place um, and that that would then um, be able to allow greater social freedoms and reduce this need for the knee-jerk lockdowns, which really were the massive cost of the pandemic. Um, and, and surprisingly, health and the economy weren't in competition. So maintaining low case loads, social stability, avoiding the need for restrictive measures was actually good for the economy. So we really enjoy working with Treasury and continue to, but yeah, this kind of thinking was really influential at the, at the whole of government policy decision-making. So the, the sort of final content slide I'll have really is this one about, well, what do we do next? So we have this notion of transmission potential. Uh, we, we then have new variants coming in. And so on the left is what's been coined the avocado plot. It was kind of more of an avocado shape. It was bigger and less certain when it first was created. But this again is Nick Goldingsworth and saying, all right, so, you know, Omicron emerges based on neutralizing antibody teeters, epidemic growth, what we see of within household transmission, a whole range of data sources. How do we synthesize that to understand how much of the relative transmission advantage of Omicron to Delta in populations was due to its intrinsic transmissibility and how much of it was due to immune escape? And back in um, you know, December, we had three points there, a sort of a, an intermediate, an optimistic and a pessimistic case. Uh, unfortunately, with increasing data and over time, we've converged more on the pessimistic case, which says it is intrinsically more transmissible and has a relatively high degree of immune escape. But then with that information, we take that back to, to what we understand about neutralizing antibody teeters, what's observed for this variant, what we've seen for previous variants, what happens with waning rates, and working with Deb, Deb uh, Kramer, David Curry, Miles Davenport's group. Again, Nick has um, taken their work and put it into a Bayesian framework and thinking about, okay, so what does this mean for vaccine efficacy, uh, both at peak teeters and over time? And so here, these are the sort of inputs that we use in our models when we're saying, all right, how do we map from what we see in terms of ant neutralizing antibody? At the moment, it's our best proxy correlate. It can be mapped to observations of clinical effectiveness, largely derived from UK studies. Um, and with that, we've estimated, you know, what we believe those teeters and those curves look like for two doses of vaccine, for, for three doses of vaccine, and then any sort of natural immunity and boosting with that. So, so these teeters are, are very, um, well, th these particular assumptions are very influential in models in thinking about what a country's balance of exposure has been, whether it be vaccine or infection and what will play out next. And so we're currently working with Health and Treasury and DFAT and, and again at the WHO level to help think through and anticipate what this all means in terms of future trends. So models are useful tools to enhance understanding of the drivers of infectious disease and minimize their impact. Modeling can help support decision makers through times of uncertainty by helping make best decisions, even when best evidence is unavailable. Uh, and, and evidence is only one element of the complex process of policy decision-making, I can tell you, uh, which involves whole of society considerations. But um, many unknowns remain, and to make longer-term projections um, is really important. And I think globally, the, the, um, the conversation is turning to population resilience and response readiness, uh, because we're learning the limitations of the tools at hand. Thanks very much. And that's all the people. Thanks so much, Jody. And um, and if ever there was an understated conclusion slide, it was that one. Um, you know, thanks to you and all of those colleagues, uh, uh, both within Doherty and, and around Australia, made an absolutely profound difference to the outcome for Australia and uh, and for the region, which uh, which is great that you uh, you introduced. So thanks so much for speaking to us today and for representing that incredible effort. Um, uh, over the last two years. We heard um, from uh, Ben Cowie before and um, from Deb Williamson about the Victorian effort and Vidral 
and the other public health laboratory was already introduced by Deb um, that's played such a crucial role is the Melbourne Diagnostic Unit or MDU, um, public health laboratory also based at the Peter Doherty Institute. And I'd like to introduce the acting director, Dr. Narell Sherry, who is gonna talk genomics, tracking the pandemic in the genomic age. Welcome, Narell. Thanks very much. And I got a bit of a uh, uh, promotion there. I'm acting deputy director at MDU. Uh, ben Howden's our director. So um, I'm very pleased to talk to you today. Oh, official now, great, okay. <laughs> bit of a lag sorry all right very good um so thanks very much to Deb and Ben Cowie and others for setting the scene about um I guess who we are and, and what we've been doing during the pandemic so I'm here representing the big team from the MDU public health um, laboratory of which genom genomics is a large component so we're a group of um of genomic epidemiologists bioinformaticians wet lab staff uh, medical microbiologists and support staff using pathogen genomics to support state and regional surveillance, diagnostics and outbreak response across a range of pathogens. And this is something that, uh, you know, was, was happening certainly well before COVID. Um, and so at the time that COVID came around, we already had implemented a, um, a genomics uh, enabled uh, public health pathogen surveillance um, program. So how, how do you do public health pathogen genomics? Well, it really is, again, a very big multidisciplinary team. So we have wet lab staff who uh, process samples and, and come up with the sequences. And then this, it's this really collaborative um, analysis and integration of data between bioinformatics, genomic epidemiologists and medical microbiologists. And then we engage with our external stakeholders, with our health departments, um, at the, the national and the state level, and also reporting to our diagnostic laboratories and hospitals. And so as with pretty much every other lab, um, uh, internationally uh, in early 2020, we had to pivot to um, SARS-CoV-2 genomics. And this meant a, a really rapid development of, of relatively new workflows. So um, uh, changing our, our sequencing approaches to, to cope with an RNA virus, um, uh, but one of the keys was uh, rapidly uh, developed the bioinformatics pipelines for SARS-CoV-2 with our in-house uh, bioinformatics team led by Torsten Seaman. And then the genomic epidemiology team was really, really important there because uh, there was a lot of uncertainty about, uh, about how, we, how we deal with SARS-CoV-2 when there was very little known around the world. Um, and so at the start of the, uh, the pandemic, we were really aiming for a complete sequencing of all SARS-CoV-2 cases, uh, which was, um, at, at the time, case numbers were quite small, but uh, it was a, a very, um, uh, an aim to really get a good handle on what was happening in the state and nationally. So in Victoria, using this really comprehensive data, we were able to have this really high resolution view of what was happening um, uh, in the state. So we saw the first wave in, in March to May in 2020, which was really polyclonal. So there were a lot of different introductions from overseas. Um, uh, but then we had the, the and, and that was really resolved largely by public health interventions. And then there was a second wave um, from June to November 2020, which seems like an awfully long time ago now. And that was quite the opposite. It was a really clonal outbreak uh, when 97% of cases originated from a single hotel quarantine breach. We were actually able to identify um, the source of the, um, of, the, uh, of the second wave based on this comprehensive genomic sequencing and surveillance. There was, the, the key there was also the integration with the public health data with the department, working collaboratively to, um, to understand what was happening there. And then unfortunately we shared the love with our neighbors uh, interstate and uh, led to a lot of border closures. And one of the, the key um, developments there was OzTracker, the um, public health um, pathogen genomics um, data sharing platform. And that's something I'll come back to later. So one of the other important activities um, during COVID for us had been uh, working with the hospitals to identify a transmission in healthcare settings and aged care. 
And the idea was to identify putative SARS-CoV-2 transmissions uh, between staff and patients and all other combinations of the above. And this uh, data was fed back to hospitals so that they could really integrate this into their understanding of what, what transmission was occurring in healthcare and modify their infection control policies to hopefully prevent future transmission. And uh, we've, uh, we've gotten together um, a look at uh, over 25 of these analyses across the state. Um, and interestingly, there was, there was a lot of differences between hospitals. So every hospital and every outbreak was different, but there were some recurrent themes uh, such as mobility of staff and patients within hospitals and between hospitals, and also um, particular factors uh, about patients, their behaviors and characteristics that make them more likely to transmit. And uh, so looking at, at the, um, our experiences, uh, we've summarized them in an upcoming paper and really tried to include things like, what are the minimum metadata that you need to actually do these analyses? Because that was something that really wasn't well defined at the start of the pandemic. And so using this to, um, uh, for other uh, healthcare, healthcare settings and public health teams to incorporate into their pandemic preparedness models. So prior to COVID, uh, on a national level, there was a recognition that, the, um, that there needed to be a, some more coordinated surveillance of what was going on in the genomic field. So about seven or eight years ago, um, pathogen genomics started to move from academia into, and started to be applied in public health. Um, but some of the problems uh, with sharing data between states whether that we're a federated nation and uh, data governance and sharing across borders was quite difficult. And some of the things that helped that along with the formation of CDGN, the Communicable Diseases Genomic Network that Deb's already spoken about, as well as the release of the National Microbial Genom Genomics Framework in 2019, which was very good timing just before COVID. So when COVID came along, there was a, an even more uh, important recognition of the need for immediate national COVID-19 surveillance. And here, OzTracker was endorsed um, by government as a national genomic surveillance um, platform in uh, about May or June uh, 2020. And this was developed at MDU uh, by uh, Torsten Seaman and Anders Gonçalves de Silva, our uh, lead uh, bioinformaticians. And it uh, continues to be um, maintained out of MDU. So I think one of the great successes has been that all states and territories, plus New Zealand as a kind of additional state, or not really, um, are contributing actively to the platform so that there's open sharing of genomic data and limited metadata to identify transmission across borders. And that's something that really hadn't been done for any pathogen in Australia and actually in many countries around the world. Um, so it's really broken down those barriers to national and international data sharing. And it's meant that there's very consistent reporting. Um, so we're all using the same genomic methods or similar genomic methods and data to come up with similar conclusions rather than having clashing definitions. It was also invaluable for assisting jurisdictions that didn't yet have genomic capacity um, early on in the pandemic and as well as real-time monitoring of variants of concern or VOX. And so 2021 saw this shift to surveillance of, of VOX. So nationally we had several incursions of VOX uh, in 2021 and it was kind of miraculous really in retrospect that there were only small local outbreaks uh, that were extinguished by public health measures and that we didn't get any sustained local transmission until Delta in mid 2021, which again, seems a very long time ago now. Um, so there's now a much better coordinated statewide and national VOX surveillance. Um, so, so genomic surveillance here is key really to identify VOX because it's they are difficult to identify by, by PCR or diagnostic assays. And so early on when a, when a VOC was uh, introduced or at risk of being introduced, um, rapid turnaround times were needed. So we were going from, you know, in the second wave surveillance with about a seven day turnaround time just to inform what was going on in the background with, with, um, uh, for public health to needing results as in within hours. So we were able to do um, uh, rapid uh, ONT sequencing uh, with, with turnaround times, uh, sometimes uh, as low as 12 hours, which is, is pretty miraculous really. 
Um, and, and this data was then used um, by the public health units to identify incursions, new incursions of Vox and uh, transmission networks and really focus their public health interventions there. And one of the important things was that an international, uh, sorry, a nationally consistent approach was really required. So the National uh, VOC Working Group through the CDGN, which I co-chair, meets uh, every week or sometimes more often um, uh, to establish national laboratory case definitions, um, which is fun because they change about every three days with a new software release and updates, um, as well as defining what VOX we're looking at in Australia and reviewing the international literature and keeping government and public health teams up to date. So we all know we don't exist in isolation despite being a big island nation. And import, I think it's been really important to, um, to be connected in the region. And so through our existing strong connections to the Asia Pacific region through uh, programs such as Combat AMR and the Fleming Fund, we, we, uh, we've played a part in, um, in helping the region uh, pivot towards SARS-CoV-2 in 2020 uh, by setting up a regional genomics uh, referral network, focusing on education and training of laboratory staff, assisting with genomic sequencing strategies and uh, looking at genomics capacity building and implementation in the region, which has been very exciting. So looking towards the future, what, what does uh, pandemic preparedness look like with pathogen genomics? Well, I think one of the key things that we've learned is being ready to go is really important. So genomics is a pathogen agnostic technology, which is great in that as long as you've got the programs set up, so you've got sequencing cap capacity, you've got genomic epidemiology, you've got links to public health and overarching data governance and sharing agreement, agreements, it's actually relatively easy to pivot to a new, a new pandemic or a new pathogen. And so in addition to our existing public health genomics programs, uh, we're broadening our range by uh, looking at things like the Oz Pathogen Program, which is an MRFF funded translational research program, connecting public health labs at both the service and research interface, as well as the, the DFAT Foreign, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and Regional Genomics Network. So facilitating that regional genomic surveillance for COVID and the next pandemic. So what have we learned about uh, pathogen genomics as a public health tool? Well, we need to be ready to go, have those established programs there. It's been really key uh, having strong relationships uh, between academia and public health service delivery. So that's something that's beneficial for both, and really improves the quality of work in both teams. Um, the integration of the public health labs with the public health units and the diagnostic labs, so having those strong, strong relationships is really key. The critical value of genomic epidemiology, which is something that wasn't actually even considered about five or seven years ago. And it's important to be rapidly ad adaptable to, um, to changing public health needs. Um, so the only thing about constant about COVID has been change. And that's something that we've had to incorporate uh, flexibly into our, our workflows. And on a regional level, so having those really respectful relationships based on good data governance and trust has been key. So uh, a lot of acknowledgements here. So a uh, huge thanks to the MDU team, as well as Vigil Health Department, Doherty teams and our funders. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, uh, Narelle, the likely possible future director of MDU, currently the acting deputy director. Thanks so much. And the extraordinary power of, of genomics and disease detective work moving into, into you know, great real-time practical benefit. Um, it's been mind-blowing to see that as a, as a uh, genomics person myself. Um, I never would have predicted it would go quite like that over the last two years. Phenomenal. Our next speaker, um, someone I've worked with, the next two speakers, in fact, uh, closely for more than a decade, Professor Margaret Hellard. She'll be via Zoom uh, live, though. And Margaret is, uh, is also an epidemiologist and, and runs a, a modelling team. Um, but she's particularly uh, a, a researcher, particularly focused on community, on beginning with community and, and finishing with community. We've talked a lot today about um, tools that 
uh, get developed that are of practical value, whether they're tests or, or, or vaccines or, um, or therapies, uh, but will they get taken up um, by the community? What are the barriers to that? And, uh, and Margaret is a champion of that, has been for a long time in HIV and hepatitis C world and now has uh, been heavily involved in COVID. Title of Margaret's talk is Pandemics, People and Outcomes of the Optimised Study, the Central Importance of Engaging and Working with the Community in Responding to COVID-19. Welcome, Margaret. Thanks very much, Brendan, and I'll just uh, share my screen. Can everybody see that screen? I can't hear any feedback, so I'm going to assume that everybody can hear it. But um, so today, and thank you, uh, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which I'm, I'm doing this presentation on the land of the Gadamanud people at the back of the Otways Ranges. And I'm talking about pandemics and people and the central importance of engaging with community in the COVID response. Ben alluded to this, and I think it's just really important, and as did Jody and others, community is central. Um, what you are doing in a global pandemic and an epidemic in your country is requiring all of the community to engage in what I call a public service, that you can have vaccines, you can have tests, you can have many things, but unless the community are engaged in what they need to be doing in public health restrictions, um, you're going to get nowhere. And so uh, this work is based on the optimised study that most of the data I'm going to show you today. And optimise is actually a, a really great partnership between the Burnett and Doherty Institutes. Um, when um, the pandemic started back in March of 2020, or was, it was looking like it was going to be impactful. Um, the Victorian government provided some in, um, funding to the Doherty and Burnett Institutes. And this was one of the pieces of work that was um, done with that, as well as support from the Macquarie um, Foundation as well. Catherine Gibney is the co-PI on this, but as well, it's a partnership with the Victorian government. Importantly, La Trobe University, Swinburne University, the University of Melbourne, and also a number of community engagement groups and Monash University. So it's a big collaborative piece of work. And I need to really acknowledge that this is not just me talking about the work today. Many, many people have had input. Optimise is an unusual study. And, and the way we designed it was quite deliberately to have an innovative multidisciplinary platform because we recognise that we, as well as doing research and needing epidemiology and evidence to inform government, um, the government response and the public response, that we needed to give them that information in real time. So we needed high quality information to help and formulate informed, precise and impactful responses, but there's no point in providing that information at 18 months down the line. We needed to be doing it in real time. So the thinking was around this. We wanted to collect strategic information to understand compliance and adherence. And partly that was because I'd been involved in the H1N1 outbreak, where one of the key things I recognised is that most people did not actually follow the quarantining and those things. And they all had very good reason not to follow it, but it was just difficult community behaviour. And the kind of question I posed in March 2020 is how are we going to help manage um, a, a single mother on the seventh floor of the North Melbourne Housing Commission flats with their three small children? How is she going to buy milk? Because that's actually what was the reality of H1N1. How did that mother buy milk? And I think it was the same with, with COVID. Um, determine key factors that might impact on cooperation. Assess unintended consequences. There are always unintended consequences of public health responses and restrictions. Michelle Giles talked about that. Identify if there were particularly vulnerable populations or key populations we need to have in mind. And I think COVID has played that out. And I feel like I'm back working in the area where I was with my normal populations, where it's basically people of social and structural disadvantage that suffer most because of COVID and characterise social networks because we aren't islands. We work and, and we interact together with our families and our friends. And so understanding the social networks that were driving influence. And then we had this sort of way of providing this information and thinking about how we provide it to government that is impactful. As I said, we set up a multidisciplinary platform where we had a modelling and social networks working group um, and the COVASIM model, which has been um, informing the Victorian government response and some of the New South Wales government response, and sorry, the national response arose from this, as does social network work by Dean Lush's group at, at Swinburne. Quantitative research, which I'll go into in a moment, interventions and diagnostics, which um, Catherine Gibney has been driving, qualitative research, which was driven by Lisa Gibbs at the University of Melbourne, and knowledge translation and policy work, which Sophie Hill um, from 
Latrobe and, and Lisa, Lisa Pedrano from the Burnie, because this was critically important, was that once we had information, how do you translate it and get it to government, um, importantly, but also what's the community's view of that information that we're providing? Uh, does it have resonance to them that we then provide to the government? It was quite deliberately not a, um, a representative sample, but a purposely selected sample, thinking about who was at risk of getting COVID um, and, and those uh, greater unintended consequences of it. And so this is sort of was quite deliberately and we adapted as we went along because it was also meant to be adaptive and nimble as to who we were recruiting, depending on what was happening with the pandemic. This is um, of late last year, I would have been refunded from the Victorian government to continue COVID, um, sorry, optimise study through to, to um, sort of really the, the second to really August of, of this coming year. So we've got over 720 participants and in particular, we've deliberately focused on having a high number of people from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds or who don't speak English at home as their, their, their main language. Um, and we have uh, bilingual speakers, many on staff now to do that. Um, and, and this is just a snapshot of where we were late last year. As I said, the recruitment strategy was quite deliberately a non-representative social network style sample where we recruited the seed, an initial person, and then ask them to recruit their networks in so that we could understand what was going on within groups because we know that that's critically from work we've previously done how information is transmitted between people and we collected the backbone of this of this uh the, co this, the longitudinal cohort um we collect diary information and as well as a monthly survey so people uh respond by one uh, this diary which they fill out every two weeks one day working day, one weekend day. And it allows us to look at how um, people change in their behaviours in response to the pandemic. Obviously, I have no um, chance to go through all of the details today. So I'm just going to give you little snippets of the kind of information we have about it. As well, the really important thing about collecting, and I should say Mark Stuvay heads this, this quantitative uh, working group, um, Mark Stuvay from Burnett. It allows us to look at changes in attitude over time. So we were able to look at um, people's attitudes towards vaccine uptake before we even had vaccines available to us, and then to also look at what happened when we had vaccines available. But also importantly, things like asking what their attitudes were about having their children vaccinated as well. So really important information that we're providing to government in these four weekly um, uh, reports, but as well um, looking at sort of community engagement and the information we needed to be giving back to the community about what was going on. We ask as well, so we say, number one, what are your intentions, but where are you getting information, which is again, critically important when government is thinking about how do they communicate their messages about, and for this example, as I said, I'm using vaccines. So this is other kind of things. Where do you get your information from? How is the best way for us to communicate with you? And qualitative research is really important because as I say, as a person who trained as a quantitative um, epidemiologist, you sometimes can't quant your way through a question. And it's critically important as well to have um, uh, qualitative interviews with people to get to the nuance of the issues that they are facing. So we also have, and as I said, Lisa Gibbs group runs this from the University of Melbourne. As well, we recognise that we can have this long um, uh, sort of longitudinal survey, but we also deliberately brought in what we call quick snapshot surveys. So every now and then we quickly put into the field a snapshot where we ask, some pertinent issues. So the, the two snapshots we did uh, late last year was one around whether or not people would be prepared or their attitudes to people being vaccinated, paid or reimbursed for vaccination. And another one which we did in November was really the idea of rats in schools because we'd done that work with Jody and her team around the modelling of schools and we recognised that rats would be important in terms of keeping children uh, in schools and keeping schools open. So we had that information to give to the government prior to the beginning of this school year in Omicron, which was really useful. This is a hot off the press snapshot that we've just done, um, which is we want to know what you did last summer. So really we were trying to as well inform our models. So we use this information from Optimise to inform the models, which are then provided to government. So the Coberson models and other people's models, but as well, we use it to then inform the government directly in terms of community engagement. But literally, I got this data last night. Um, so I just added these two slides, but say of the people in the survey, 697 were snapshotted um, in the last few weeks, 577 responded. 58% had a COVID test in January, of which 78% tested, uh, 78 tested positive. So that's a significant number. Six of those that tested 
And as well, we'll be doing some triangulation to do prevalence work. Another significant proportion were not able to get a test when they wanted to. So only 25% were able to say, I always got a test when I had symptoms. Importantly, when people were being tested, even if they were testing at home and doing rats, because the contact tracing system um, was required of people who were doing self-contacting, a significant proportion contacted almost all or most of their contacts. These are the kind of information we give to government, but it also helps inform our models to understand prevalence estimates and the like. People talk about the shadow lockdown, and I've just put this slide up just so people are aware it was impactful. So we can talk about um, government responses or when governments don't do responses, what this clearly shows, and again, we're still doing the analysis of this, but I've just put this slide up just as an example, that a lot of people stayed away from bars, clubs, outdoor areas, meetings, gatherings with family because of, of, of um, Omicron. So people self-regulated. Uh, so we need to think about that when we're thinking about what we call social license and governments bringing in um, public health restrictions, that if we have uncontrolled shadow lockdowns in response to outbreaks, perhaps we're better having more controlled ones because it's going to happen anyway. Critically for me is that with the optimised study, we report a, we provide a four weekly report to government on key issues. But prior to that, we have the report looked at. So we get the data, we analyse it every four weeks. We then run it through a community engagement group, um, which have selected from all areas of the community. They then provide their feedback and we provide that report to the government. It's a monthly report. It's sometimes cross-sectional. It's sometimes longitudinal. There's different ways that we can do it. But also we report back to the community and community is critical. And for me, community engagement is critical because you can basically know things and you can develop vaccines and diagnostics, but you have to be able to implement the action required. And this is really difficult, particularly with key populations and people from social and structural disadvantage, with social and structural disadvantage. There's the complexity of the activity can make it more difficult. We need community-led communications and sustained community engagement. One of the things that we were doing is co-design pieces where we set up design sprints, where we had information and we had interventions, but we set up community engagement design sprints running alongside um, Optimize, where we were working with community. And the idea of a design sprint is that you have a challenge, you identify from the community, as well as say government, what a critical issue is. You then uh, do a rapid scanning. You do the design sprint where you work with community and, and co-engage with them. You then do a pilot of information, and then you may develop materials and behavioral interventions, but all designed by people from the community. And often the question is also coming from the community or the critical issue is being raised by community. And this is an example of it, is that we understand the community's needs and perspectives. You ask the community what their issue is with vaccinations. What do they think's happening? You connect with experts, and then you co-create and validate health communications and messages that you then work with government and the community to get out to the relevant people. As well with this, we then decided to set up a, a comms and a handbook of how one might do these things. And importantly, more recently, the Department of Family, Fairness and Housing have funded VOICE, which is the Victorian Online Initiative for Community Engagement. And the idea of VOICE is that we have a sustained investment in a community-led approach, where we have an online platform to share approaches, answers and questions, facilitate two-way communication, it helps us have rapid identification of community needs, community-led projects, capability building, and cross-network, um, cross-sector networks. The reality is COVID's not going away, as all the people in this audience know, but not everybody else does. So we need a sustained response. My view is community engagement is critical. Optimise provides us with a base for that and directly works with government and community. And VOICE will provide that sustained engagement of community-developed projects. What we learn from Optimise and Voice can also be, go beyond COVID in informing our response to other health issues that are already with us or will arise in the future. Thank you. I'd just like to say there's a lot of people have contributed to this work um, from the Burnett, from Doherty, University of Melbourne, Latrobe and others. Thank you. Thanks so much, Margaret. And, and I know that um, we have a panel later on sort of what we might do better well, differently next time and um, and I hope one of the themes that comes up is you know while we need to do our, our biomedical research better and faster and more coordinated uh, across the country and across the globe we need to do the social sciences vastly better a step change to what uh, we've done uh, this time 
And, uh, and it's, it's great, though. I know a lot of people don't hear that there is some great work happening, as you've, as you've just seen from Margaret and all her colleagues, Burnett, Doherty, and, and throughout um, Australia. I think um, Francoise said, you know, the lessons of HIV uh, in, in her opening comments. And the biggest lesson of HIV is, of course, listening to communities, communities who, um, especially at that time, were, were largely invisible or fringe or um, illegal. And, uh, and, you know, we still haven't um, by any means totally learned those lessons, as Francois said. So thanks, Margaret. And our last speaker in this session is also um, a, a deputy director at the Burnett, um, Associate Professor David Anderson. And David has a, uh, is a lifelong virologist who I've also learned a great deal uh, from, very similar background to, to myself. Um, but he's passionate about point of care diagnostics and especially tools that can get to people who can't really afford the tools that they're about to get. Thanks very much, David. Thanks, Brenda. And no, I was expecting a promotion in that introduction uh, like Narelle got, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Um, I, unlike Deb, I did get to choose the title for mine and I really wish I hadn't used the word adaptive for a talk in front of a bunch of uh, many immunologists because what I really meant was point of care tests for things beyond initial diagnosis and Deb gave a, a beautiful talk about the responses in terms of how we diagnose uh, COVID-19 among other infections but really what we've focused on very largely in our work over a number of years is point of care tests to address other needs beyond the initial diagnosis of an infection. And I'll talk about two different bodies of work today. The first and the one that I'll spend the most time on is our work to develop uh, point of care tests for CD, measuring CD4 T cell counts in HIV, which uh, of course was initially required for people to be eligible for antiretroviral treatment, but now is important to identify those with advanced disease, uh, with, which requires a different approach. And this was a very uh, important uh, collaborative venture with Rush University and later Duke University, uh, funded through the Gates Foundation and NHMRC, uh, and ultimately commercial partnership with Omega Diagnostics. But then I'll also uh, tell you about what we, the lessons we took out of that effort towards developing a point of care test for COVID-19 neutralizing antibodies, which is very much a, a collaboration driven by an initial, an initial suggestion really from Dale Godfrey and Damien Purcell at the Doherty, but using the expertise we had developed to try and make a point of care test to measure neutralizing antibodies. And this project with very strong support from the Victorian government and uh, thank Minister Pulford for that. So why did we want to be able to measure CD4 T cells in HIV? Well, as I'm sure most of you will know, it's the loss of CD4 T cells that actually results in the immune deficiency and most of the pathogenesis of HIV AIDS. And when antiretrovirals were first available, they were expensive, they were in limited supply, and their use was restricted to people who had advanced disease. So you had to have a CD4 count under a certain level in order to be eligible for treatment. And the only way that could be measured, your CD4 count, was by flow cytometry, which was only accessible in uh, wealthy countries if you had access to a lab. But when generic antiretrovirals became widely available or became available, but not easy to get hold of in 2004, then the biggest hurdle to access to antiviral treatment was really getting a CD4 count because most countries would not allow you to be prescribed antiretrovirals unless you were either clinically had full-blown AIDS, in which case it was really too late to get the benefit, or you had a CD4 count, which was simply not accessible. That has changed now. Most countries will, uh, fortunately, and it's the right decision, treatment for all people once diagnosed. But it's still the case that in many countries, low and middle income countries in particular, a substantial proportion, and in some cases, the majority of people when they are first diagnosed with HIV infection already have advanced disease 
And this requires different management practices, particularly diagnosis of concomitant TB infection, uh, cryptococcal antigen for uh, cryptococcal uh, pneumonia, et cetera, and timing and intensity of antiretroviral treatment. So now we just need to identify those with advanced disease on first diagnosis. So Suzanne Crow, a key collaborator at the Burnett Institute in setting this project up, came to me and said, you know, how could we measure CD4 T cells using lateral flow immunochromatography, which was, you know, this is what's used for malaria tests, pregnancy tests. We knew that if we could make it work using lateral flow, it should be able to get to the people in the world who need it most. One assumption in the community at that time that we very much relied on was that the actual number of copies of the CD4 molecule on each T cell was the same with or without HIV infection. And if that was true, it would mean that the total amount of CD4 in a drop of blood was directly proportionate to the CD4 T cell count. But there were two complicating factors that we had to take into account. The first is that there's a substantial amount of soluble CD4 in plasma that has nothing to do with the CD4 T cell count. And it was known that that was highly elevated especially in advanced HIV. So you might have 100 CD4 T cells, but 1,000 CD4 T cells worth of soluble CD4. The second is that CD4 is also found on monocytes. And even though it's less abundant on monocytes, you can have a lot of monocytes. And then if those problems could be overcome, it all had to be incorporated into a low cost, simple device. And, and I'll go through the, the solutions to these problems very quickly. Firstly, to, so that we didn't measure soluble CD4, we simply used a pair of antibodies, one against the cytoplasmic domain of the protein and one, one against the ector domain of the protein. And in that way, we wouldn't be able to detect soluble CD4. And by setting up a very simple uh, ELISA using these antibodies, one of which we had to custom make, we were able to show that indeed under these, when using... Oh, the point it doesn't work, but never mind. Um, indeed, when you measure the total amount of CD4, having in this case removed monocytes uh, using uh, a standard sort of laboratory approach, you see a very close correlation between uh, the CD4 mass and the T, T cell count by flow cytometry. So then we had to uh, remove the monocytes. Fortunately, there is a commercial reagent called Rosetzep which is a, a mixture of antibodies against, in this case, a monocyte surface antigen and glycophorin A on uh, red blood cells. And the approach was that if we agglutinate uh, monocytes together with red blood cells, and we already have a reagent that agglutinates red blood cells in the sample pad, it should mean that we can separate the uh, lymphocytes, labeled here in green, from the monocytes, sorry, the monocytes labelled in green and the lymphocytes labelled in red once we add the rosette separate agent. And I'm sorry, the pointer isn't working, but you can see in the uh, middle panel on, oh, I can get it working. You can see here that when we have the rosette separate agent, the monocytes in green get stuck in the sample pad while the CD4 T cells can migrate into the rest of the test. And so we were then able to incorporate that into a, a lateral flow uh, point of care diagnostic test. I'm not going to go through any of this, just to make the point that remarkably, all of this actually happens, just like you draw it on a cartoon. Uh, it's still 15 years later, amazes me that all of these reactions happen in the space of a few seconds in a nitrocellulose pad. And it gives a readout. And the readout in this case is a control line at the top to show you that it's worked. Uh, a middle line, which was a reference equivalent to what at that time was the uh, recommended CD4 cutoff of 250 cells per microliter, and a bottom line, which is the test line, how much CD4 is present in that sample. And you can see there that it was able to discriminate people with below uh, 250 CD4 T cells. You could see the line was fainter than the reference line. And that was then incorporated into a cassette so that it could be 
uh, fully tested. That was around 2007 to 2009. Uh, it took a long time before this was uh, partnered with uh, Omega Diagnostics, fully manufactured, CE marked, et cetera. But we're very pleased that now we have the uh, advanced disease version of the test, the 200 cutoff test, uh, which has achieved WHO pre-qualification so that it can be used with uh, donor funds and, and is endorsed by the WHO. But the really important point I want to make with this slide is that as part of that WHO pre-qualification, our method of doing a semi-quantitative point of care test by visual reference to, a ref to, a, to an internal reference line was endorsed as a way that you could have a point of care test. And there are a lot of people involved in this work. I, I really particularly want to highlight uh, Suzanne Crow and Alan Landay, well known to many of you, uh, and Mary Garcia up the back of the steps uh, with me, who was really our, our pair of uh, golden hands with the point of care test development. But really also to highlight, I think one of the things that we've been very proud of at the Burnett over the years is how well we try and do commercial engagement and really highlighting uh, Serena Kukutsa there and our commercial partners at Omega Diagnostics, Andrew Shepard, unfortunately, who passed away last year, who really saw this as something that his company should get on board and do. Uh, and Jag Grewal, next to him, who is now the CEO and continues to support this work very closely. But the other thing that was very important about having the Burnett involved was that we then had people like Stanley Luckers who were able to drive field validation studies of this test, which ultimately was so important for getting the WHO pre-qualification. But pivoting there from COVID to COVID-19, we wanted to see if we could make a test for neutralizing antibodies because it's known now that they are the major correlate of immune protection from severe disease. But if you measure the total antibody of the IgG in a point of care test or in an ELISA, it has very poor correlation because most of the antibody is not neutralizing. And as new variants come along, that total antibody is likely to be less and less predictive of protection. But the current assays for neutralizing antibodies, depending on the real virus, which needs BSL-3 laboratories, or surrogate viruses that still need uh, days to give a result. There are assays based on inhibition of the receptor ACE2 virus interaction, uh, which still take hours for a result in the laboratory. And then the commercial uh, version of that assay, the CPAS assay, developed by Lin Fa Wang, who's a good friend to many of us here. But we wanted a point of care test, uh, which we now call the COVID-19 NAB test, uh, as I said, a, a very close collaboration with Dale and Damien at the Doherty, but bringing on board many of our other colleagues uh, at both Doherty and Burnett Institutes. And really what we wanted to do was, well, can we, can we take advantage of what we had learnt from the CD4 test? And in particular, the fact that we had a, a reader available that could allow us to do quantitative data to validate everything. But as I pointed out before, we had this validated approach of comparing a result to an internal reference line. And to cut a long story short, uh, if we simply swapped around what we were doing in each of the lines, we could have a, a very similar test where instead of measuring the amount of CD4, we were amount, measuring the amount of inhibition of RBD, the receptor binding domain, ACE2 binding in the bottom line. So instead of you know, a strong line, meaning that you've got lots of CD4 T cells, a strong line here means that you have no antibody against that's able to neutralize COVID-19. And the test works, uh, shown on the left, uh, a single uh, individual C1, with blood drawn over time. And you can see that the, the bottom line, the percent inhibition is very weak. So they have strong inhibition of virus. C2 is another individual who has strong total antibody, the top line, but not very strong inhibition 
of virus and then uh, some negative controls on the right that show no inhibition of virus and no total antibody. We were able to show that it works with uh, mon neutralizing monoclonal antibodies spiked in whole blood. Oops, oh, and it seems, uh, sorry, I clicked it too many times. Uh, shows very good correlation with neutralizing antibody teeters uh, by real virus micro neutralization shown here for naive individuals and individuals after immunization or infection or a mixture thereof. And very pleasingly, we were able to show that it works equally well with uh, plasma, venous blood or finger prick whole blood. And it was designed in such a way that we can easily substitute to measure uh, neutralization of variants of concern. In this case, shown for uh, effectively the gamma variant uh, in red, showing lower levels of inhibition. But we now have good data, uh, preliminary data, but very good evidence that we can do the same for Omicron variants. And we'll be producing a lot more data on that shortly. This was published uh, late last year, and obviously we want to take this much further so that it can actually get into people's hands. But there's a lot more work to be done before we get there. But I really just want to highlight uh, with this final slide, uh, which is taken at uh, Norton's Hotel across the road from the Doherty Institute and where we very much look forward to in the future, this being our local as well, once the Burnett moves up there as well. Um, but, uh, but there's a, going to be a lot more work and a lot more people involved before we get to that stage. And the Burnett Diagnostics Initiative, uh, a new initiative set up last year to help us drive our diagnostics innovations into the real world. We're very uh, confident will help us make that transition. Thank you. Thanks so much, David. And that was our last um, talk in this session. We now have 45 minutes for lunch, Livia, which brings us to bring us to really near two o'clock um, to come back and we'll adjust the program accordingly um, by then. So thanks very much. We'll see you outside and, uh, and back here at about two. Um, and I'm delighted to be able to spend a bit of time with you um, today at what I can understand from having spoken to various members of the audience has been a, a really wonderful day um, full of uh, diverse talks and it sparked a lot of reflection and um, questions for the future. And I think you're going to be very um, satisfied with this afternoon's program as well. Um, we, as you've been used to, we've got about 15 minutes for each speaker um, and we'll move on pretty promptly in between. Um, I'd like to start uh, by introducing Richard Keane, who's the Chief Executive Officer of Living Positive Victoria. And I love the title of Richard's talk, um, Secondemic. So um, over to you, Richard. All right, have we got the slides going? We do. Terrific. So, okay. Hang on. Doesn't seem to be coming up. Oh, terrific. Thank you so much. Um, we'll just go to the next slide. That was the introduction. So, brilliant. I just want to talk about um, the beginning of the COVID response and the strength of partnerships that kind of really helped us chart a way through for people living with HIV who, as you could imagine, being immunocompromised, having a whole range of fears about COVID and the potential impacts on our community. I think um, 
I was on the board of Living Positive Victoria back in around about 2012, and I came across an old document with some planning, preliminary planning around a SARS response for the SARS pandemic, where we'd gotten together across our communities and had a discussion about the potential of closing down the Positive Living Centre, reducing um, connection between people living with HIV across the community. And there were it was a really basic kind of document but what it did was provide a starting point so when we picked up the phone and we started engaging across our sector um, we had at least uh, a place to start and a foundation to begin with and um, I think the other key factor at the beginning was a shared consistent response across the HIV service providers so I engaged with my fantastic fellow EOs um, Dr Kirsty Macon and also Simon Ruth from Thorn Harbour Health and we made a decision very early on to do joint communications. So regardless of where people living with HIV were accessing their services and their service delivery, that we were all on the same page and that the information was consistent and constant. And we made a decision not to update that every week. We did a couple of really big major um, kind of engagements across the community at the beginning to lay those foundations and then started to move through that process. Um, leveraging the strength uh, and expertise of the broader response was also key to our response here. Um, I can't speak highly enough of the partnerships that we've been able to develop over the life of HIV and with um, community kind of being central to the response and, and following up from what we heard from Margaret Allard before about co-design and other things that we're moving to, the foundations of getting to this place was having community central to that response, but it doesn't uh, affect that response by itself. It's in partnership and it's in partnership with research, it's in partnership with medicine, it's in partnership with a whole range of arms of the HIV response. And providing the ability and accessibility from our partnership to engage with our community was also central. Um, we've got a few of the EPI rock stars in the room um, that really made a really big impact on engaging with community and breaking down the science and breaking down the facts for people. And we were really privileged in the HIV sector to have those people accessible for us and for them to make their time to engage with forums with our community, both at the national and state level. Um, and also too, I just want to acknowledge because I think um, a lot of people that were engaged in the health department carried the can a little bit in the first 12 months of the uh, response to COVID. Um, and I've got to say without their support and ongoing leadership, um, we would have found it really hard to have that direction, to have that support and to have that partnership as central to our response was absolutely um, really, really important for us. I wanted to take just, uh, and I'm probably rushing through, so I'll, I'll breathe between slides. Um, I wanted to take just a couple of snapshots of some cohorts um, that particularly were disproportionately impacted during COVID. The first, um, of course, was people over 50 living with HIV. More than 53% of all PLHIV in Victoria now are over 50 years of age, and I'm one of them. I was diagnosed at the age of 19 back in 1989. Um, and the research, the development of therapeutics and other things like that, I could not be more grateful. And it's the reason that I'm standing here today. Um, over 85% of this cohort have one or more other chronic medical conditions. And I was just having a discussion over lunchtime and many people in this room would also have probably one or more chronic medical conditions as well. It's not just people living with HIV. One of the challenges here with this community was trying to um, engage continuity of care during the last two years. There was a real fear from older people living with HIV about the potential of being exposed to HIV infection by engaging in healthcare services. So we had to do a lot of work and we did that again, leveraging off our partnerships and holding a number of forums about the importance of continuity of care, not just for your HIV and picking up your meds and getting your bloods done, but for the other conditions that may also exist. Um, Yes, and with this cohort, a lot of people went down uh, into lockdown before there were any directives. People had a really high fear of the potential of exposure to, H uh, to um, COVID and the potential impacts on them, particularly those people that were engaged in pre-art um, and had existing conditions back from uh, the AIDS 
kind of era. Um, and it was um, really, really difficult and remains really difficult getting those people re-engaged and slowly connecting to community again. They've become those shadow lockdowners that everybody's talking about in Victoria with the removal of um, a lot of the restrictions that Victoria in particular has had a disproportionate uh, share of over the last couple of years. Um, it, we've had to kind of adapt ways of bringing people back together. And one of the things that we've decided to do is having much more smaller community events, like a maximum of five people, ensuring that everybody has had their booster dose, which also provides the confidence for older people to re-engage. As we move through, I guess, the next section of living with COVID, it'll be about up to date or overdue uh, for our events and connections to our events, just to provide that ongoing security that it's safe for those community members to start to re-engage because COVID isn't over. Um, I also want to talk about social isolation and the intense concern and vulnerabilities of this population as well. Already many of these people live by themselves and were socially isolated prior to lockdowns occurring. There was a real challenge until we got into that um, friendship bubble. Uh, once that was done, it started to ease a little bit. But I, I remember actually going around to some of our members' houses and sitting out front on their porch and talking through their wire doors because of people's concern about engaging and other things like that. So we also had a really intense phone tree with all of our peer workers, including myself, at the organisation and checked in with clients from time to time about their wellbeing. And I've got to say, I got a phone call one afternoon from uh, an older gentleman who was really, really upset and said to me, you know, they didn't lock down for us. We lost 8,000 lives in uh, the early years of AIDS. There wasn't the same kind of response. And instead of buying into that, I just took a deep breath and allowed him to sit in that space and then decided to talk to him about what we've actually achieved over that 40 years to balance that out, that immediate fear of that we were treated differently because of stigma, because of the communities that were impacted by HIV initially. And just to be able to have that conversation also gave me, uh, centered me in my approach and um, gave me the strength to move forward, um, reflecting on what's been achieved and what's yet to come for us. Um, I also think this cohort, mental health and wellbeing, in this year and beyond is going to be absolutely central. Uh, many people were triggered, um, particularly those pre-art and the discourse around COVID deaths has not helped that. Uh, when we have politicians and people standing up reporting daily deaths every day, and we have them talking about, oh, that person was old, or that person had a pre-existing condition, um, a lot of those older cohort were sitting watching the television going, that's me, and uh, I feel very vulnerable, and I feel like I'm devalued in our society, and I think that that's something that we really will continue to need to work upon. The second snapshot, um, more than half of all new diagnoses in Victoria are individuals born outside of Australia. Many felt left behind in the initial response uh, and were left outside of the social welfare net. Some of our members were people who were here as students, uh, travelling internationally on 457 visas and other things which meant that they had no financial support whatsoever. They really did feel like they'd been left behind and abandoned by um, the response initially. They had an inability to stop working. They were in higher risk working environments and so um, were much more likely to come in contact with um, COVID infection. And we did have a number of our members um, that experienced COVID in that first wave. Um, the development of a special emergency fund uh, via our peer navigation program. So we negotiated with uh, our funders and we were able to allocate around $10,000. And it was just a one-off $200 payment to those individuals that fell outside the welfare net before those other work assistance plans and things came in later on. And it doesn't sound like much, but that $200 payment kept some people connected to care. And even more importantly, it kept them connected to us. It made them feel like they were valued. It made them feel like they had a space to go where they were acknowledged. Um, it was frustrating at times because we were very limited in what we could provide for those individuals other than peer support. But I think that was also essential. And it's helped us build connections into that community that I think maybe otherwise we may not have developed, even though we're on that pathway. Um, I think it's, it's strengthened the, the connection into those communities. 
and the role of in-language information. I'm sure that we've, uh, we've covered that already across a whole range of talks today and the diversity um, of talks today has been fantastic as well. But the importance of in-language information around um, this and health equity is just so, so important across both responses. And there's parallels and, and um, synchronicities across the whole range as well. I just wanna finally um, wind up by addressing some really invaluable lessons that I felt that we've learned over the last couple of years. The adaptation of our service delivery model is here to stay. Um, and I was really skeptical about moving into virtual environments. I was concerned that it would leave some sections of our community behind because not everyone has equity of access to those facilities or the ability to use them. But what's happened over the, those two years is people have had to engage in those facilities. And so as a result of that, the offerings that we can have to engage our community um, have just expanded and the diversity of those has been fantastic. We had, for example, a few hit and miss things because we couldn't stop, uh, we had to stop doing in-person stuff, which is really essential. And that peer-based face-to-face connection really is the foundation of resilience that starts to build someone's ability to move through their whole lifetime of living with HIV. But with that put aside, we trialed, we had a few hit and misses. We had a, you know, one or two people turning up, but then we started putting our thinking caps on and thought about what parts of our program can we kind of snap off and put online. And I know that we had a heterosexual dis serodiscordant discordant couple who came along and held um, a virtual engagement with heterosexuals living with HIV. That was so well attended. It's been held three times since. And it's really given people the ability to connect in a different way over issues that are specific to um, more marginalised communities in our response. Um, in language information, as I was saying before, it is crucial to health literacy and health equity. Moving forward, as we, I really do believe that we can reach virtual elimination of HIV in this country. I really believe it's achievable by 2030, but we can't do that unless we have more access to translators and to in language information available to organisations like ours to share with our communities. Currently, our fantastic peer navigation program working with brilliant clinical partners across a range of organisations. If we meet the client there, they certainly have the funding to access translation, but equity means that we also want those clients to be able to participate in other programs that we run. And the cost, for example, of our Phoenix workshop uh, for women, we've used interpreters for Thai women who've come along to that engagement, but it's about $1,500 a pop to do that. And we've had to find that money out of our own funding. Um, so I think as we move ahead, and I'm talking to Farmer at the moment because I know they've done amazing community work all over the globe, and I think the information that we need is out there, but it just hasn't been coordinated and brought together. So it'll be a real endeavour for us to move towards getting that done. Um, I've discovered that there's been a broader interest and really genuine understanding around HIV due to COVID. Um, it's just shifted. I felt like it was pushing it uphill for a very, very long time. But the discussions, um, particularly over the last 12 months with us heading towards 40 years of HIV and everything else, a lot of times when you engage with the media, you're kind of sending them a cheat sheet to inform them. But what I've found with the recent engagements is the information and the knowledge that's there in the community about the experience of HIV, not just from a biological point of view, but from an actual lived experience point of view is really strong. And there's absolutely uh, a genuine interest that's come out of, and I think arising from COVID and the experience that everyone has now experienced a pandemic. I think it makes people reflect it makes people feel like HIV are not othered. Um, so it's an experience that people um, are really genuinely interested in understanding a little bit more. Finally, I just want to ring a warning bell. I want to acknowledge the cost of the COVID response and the potential of the funding constrained environment into the future for HIV. Um, I'm concerned. I think as we get to that last little bit and we try to reach for virtual elimination, the communities that will be represented in whatever number we settle on, whether that's 50 a year, 100 a year, 
they will be communities that are very hard to engage with already without that in language information. My concern is that instead of reducing stigma, virtual elimination will just focus it on the communities that still represented in that virtual elimination number. So I plead to all the fantastic people that work with us and partner with us to ensure that when it comes down to brass tacks that community organisations like ours aren't the first to receive a cut or to be forced to merge or relocate into a larger institution. I thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thanks, Richard. Um, you've raised some really important points there about community and, and the networks that support people. And at the end of the day, how important the actual human connection is as well. Um, so now we move to Associate Professor Sheena Sullivan, who's Head of Epidemiology at the WHO Collaborating Centre and at the Doherty Institute as well. And we moved to influenza and how it prepared us for the pandemic. Over to you. Thanks very much, Jane. And thanks to the um, organisers for the opportunity to speak. I have confusingly used a PDF for my slides and I think that is slowing things down. Uh, Richard just mentioned that there is a diversity of topics. So we are changing to flu now, talking about a very different population. I still can't see my slides. All right, this is the real pandemic virus, just so you all know. We've had lots of pandemics in flu. We were all expecting a flu pandemic. I did not touch the pointer then. We we're all expecting a flu pandemic and we haven't had one. Uh, these exploding arrows will tell you that, you know, the bigger pan... I'm really not touching the arrows, I'm sorry. Um, all right, so the, the bigger exploding arrows are uh, telling you that, that those pandemics had a, a greater burden of disease. And <laughs> this is getting silly. Um, and also that some pandemics have actually had very minimal burden of disease. Um, I'm just gonna stop and I'm just gonna say next slide please, because this is getting very confusing. <laughs> um, so the, the one up here, H1M1, widely believed to have been potentially due to an archived influenza virus, archived in a lab, not an animal. Uh, that one had nearly no morbidity and mortality. And part of the reason for that is that so many elderly people um, have been pre-exposed to older H1M1 viruses and were naturally immune. But then we've also had, um, and, and then we had the, 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 the new H1M1 again in 2009, our more recent pandemic. And I'm not even touching the pointer now and it's changing. Um, all right, I'll move on. Next slide, please. Maybe I'll take the batteries out of this thing. Maybe that'll help with things. Good Lord. All right. Um, all right. So influenza type A is, uh, influenza type A is the virus that we worry about when we talk about pandemic risk in influenza. Um, and it's because it, it reassorts. So it's got lots and lots of animal reservoirs and it, um, it, it uh, has this potential to be transmitted from birds to pigs to humans and reassort and so you develop these new viruses. We get a natural evolution of um, influenza viruses within any kind of host. This is these minor changes that allow the, the virus to escape host immunity and um, uh, in this process that we call antigenic drift. Um, and this is the reason we get reinfected and the reason we have to get revaccinated every year. But then there's also this process of antigenic shift where you get this reassortment and it's an entirely new virus that most people in the population or no one in the population has seen before and were entirely susceptible. And so um, we, we have these pandemics. And so the timeline along the bottom here just shows you um, not only the pandemic viruses, but also these zoonotic viruses that have been of concern. So there's been a number of um, viruses that have infected humans that have been um, uh, transmitted from, from, from pigs or birds um, and caused a little bit of spread, largely in um, China has been really, really good at documenting this. Um, but they're not necessarily pandemic diseases. But when we think about pre pandemic preparedness for flu, we think about these zoonotic viruses as well. Next slide, please. Seriously? <laughs> um, all right. So because of this risk, and I'm going to talk a lot about this particular surveillance system, but because of this risk, the WHO in 1952 established what is now known as the Global Influenza Surveillance and Response System. Um, it consists of five collaborating centres, including our own here at Doherty Institute, um, that are for human influenza and one collaborating um, institute in Memphis, uh, which is for zoonotic influenza viruses. There's also a central regulatory laboratories. And then the really, really crucial part is these national influenza centres. And I can see the dude is playing with my slideshow, but can you advance to the next slide, please? Um, just to give you a bigger picture of uh, the map. 
the, there are these 142, 144 national influenza centres, those are the little blue triangles, and they're the real core heart of this surveillance system. They are their labs, they're public health reference laboratories in, in nations um, around the world. Australia weirdly has three of them, but most countries only have one. Um, and these have been a really important part for um, the response to the COVID pandemic. Um, those, those laboratories will identify representative samples of influenza, either through established sentinel surveillance systems or just through opportunistic surveillance systems. And then they will um, try to characterize those viruses a little, a little bit themselves. And then they forward viruses onto the collaborating centers for further characterization. And that's how we keep up with what's happening with the flu viruses, how much it's drifting away from the vaccine, how susceptible we are, whether or not the viruses are still working, um, are still susceptible to antiviral treatments. Next slide, please. Um, all right, so there's a lot of information that goes into this system. So the purpose of GISRA is, is um, to monitor human influenza disease, but we do that through monitoring antigenic drift. So how well um, our antibodies are going to continue, antibodies induced by vaccine are going to um, continue to protect us against circulating influenza viruses. We also monitor those changes to antiviral drug resistance. Um, there's a lot of um, genomic analysis that's done as well. And like I said, the NICs will get um, the sensory viruses. And so those, some of those viruses will be grown in eggs because influenza vaccines are still largely produced in eggs. Um, so we have to obtain suitable isolates to be candidates for the next uh, vaccine update. Um, can I get the next slide, please? <laughs> um, all right. So there's been a lot of shocks to the system over the years, and this has been really important for, for COVID because some of these influenza surveillance systems weren't so well established, but there's been a lot of effort that has been made over the last few years, a uh, few decades, um, to improve surveillance. And so shocks like bird flu in Hong Kong and in China, or like SARS in 2003, have really um, supported the um, enhancement of existing surveillance. And China is an ex really great example because you can see that between 2000 and 2009 they expanded their sentinel surveillance network enormously and China's um, you know China's a very independent country they've done a lot of this on their own back recognizing the risks I worked in China um, for a number of years at the China CDC which previously had been called the Chinese Academy for Preventive Medicine it became the CDC because of SARS because the government recognized the enormous economic risk of, of any kind of pathogen not just a pandemic pathogen so they've really bolstered their um, system but this has happened in a lot of other countries there's been a bolstering of the systems in a lot of countries and that's been due to the support of WHO, CDC, Institut Pasteur and other organizations um, around the world. Next slide please. All right. So with these systems in place, um, a lot of countries have been able to rapidly adapt their um, influenza surveillance systems to monitor COVID. And so this is mortality surveillance that was routinely done in the US. You can see the first few wavy lines are what would normally happen in a flu season. The red bar that is popping up, that was a really severe flu season. Nothing like the COVID seasons that the US has seen, but they were easily able to adapt this surveillance to be able to monitor what's happening for COVID. So those um, systems and supports that have been put in place because of the threat of pandemic influenza have been readily adapted to, to um, SARS-CoV-2. Next slide, please. Um, and so... WHO has also tried to take um, a leading role in this, particularly for lower and middle income countries. So they've now got GISRAs Plus. Um, they've gone through, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of sentinel surveillance that's done in a lot of countries. Um, and the GISRAs team have gone through, they've adapted the ILI influenza like illness case definitions um, to repurpose them to be able to capture, sub, capture sy syndromic surveillance for COVID as well as flu. Um, and then those existing connections within the GISRIS network have been really important for a lot of um, particularly low and middle income countries. So that's really basic things like deployment of reagents and primers. CDC have their international reagent resource, which is a really crucial part of influenza surveillance and now surveillance for, for COVID and RSV because they provide these resources and primers for free. And they provide the polymerases as well for free for the lower, lower income countries, although not the middle income countries. Um, and then there's also that network of technical support. So the Doherty has been involved through um, uh, with support from DFAT to do a lot of um, technical support and uh, in, in the Pacific. And um, a couple of members from our team at our collaborating center are currently in the Solomon Islands, um, helping that country to um, build up its molecular testing capacity. So a lot of those labs existed before, didn't necessarily have molecular 
molecular testing capacity, partly because it's so difficult to get um, service contracts in countries like that. Um, but COVID's really helped enhance those capabilities. So that's, you know, a benefit from COVID to flu is that a lot of these countries, which previously, you know, in Solomon's, they would have to send samples to Fiji for testing. They will now have in-house capacity. Um, and of course, a lot of this has come with WHO and particularly CDC financial support, but also other organisations. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so one of the quick little things that WHO did just to sort of prove that sentinel surveillance can be pretty good is when they compared um, the, the data that were collected using their sentinel sites that already existed for flu with the sort of crazy census case testing of, testing of every case that a lot of us have been doing. Uh, they said, actually, sentinel surveillance is pretty good and it costs a hell of a lot less. So this is probably okay for countries that can't afford to test absolutely everybody. Next slide, please. Um, I'll go to the next slide, please. All right, back to China again. So outside of users, but also part of this general preparedness for these kinds of um, uh, events, some countries like China and Vietnam have these additional surveillance systems for pneumonias of unknown etiology or severe viral pneumonia, I think it's called in, in Vietnam. Um, and these are the systems where they've got these sentinel hospitals around the country that detect unusual viral uh, pneumonias, although it's kind of hard if you actually can't test for the virus, but they have this system of, of referral. And so in China, that's obviously very, very well suited to the, 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 the structure of China, China's health um, system. But this is how we detected the second outbreak of SARS in China. This is how we detected H7N9 and a number of other zoonotic events um, that have occurred in China and in Vietnam. Next slide, please. Um, another um, uh, a framework that's been set up with the WHO in partnership with uh, manufacturing organisations is this thing called the PIP framework, the Pandemic Influenza Preparedness. And so this is um, a system where the, um, the companies that produce vaccines and produce um, other products for, for flu viruses and take any kind of advantage of the GISRIS network have provided um, what they call a partner contribution, which is about $28 million a year. And that's really been used to bolster the lab capacity, the, the epidemiological surveillance capacity, um, regulatory capacity in a lot of countries around the world. It includes training, it includes development of protocols, it includes shipping, it includes all kinds of things. But the, the fact that this work has already been going on for 10 years meant that a lot of countries were better prepared for COVID when it hit. Next slide, please. Um, and <laughs> just to add, well, we've talked about genomic data today. Um, the GizAid platform, which has been used a lot to share genomic, genomic data in the past two years, was originally established for flu. The A in GizAid stands for avian influenza. Then it became all influenza. And now they don't even bother uh, writing out what their acronym means anymore because it's just anything. And the, the point of GizAid is that you, um, you got kind of some sovereignty to your data. You weren't just uploading it to GenBank and God knows who did what with your, with your sequences. Um, so GizAid has been a really, really important platform. You can see here that as of yesterday, they had 8.7 million um, genome sequence submissions for, for SARS-CoV, which is ridiculously enormous. Um, and so showing the sort of the, the global use of this platform, which has been really important. But again, this is this was set up for flu. Next slide, please. Um, and then just to bring it back to how we do surveillance for flu, genomics is really, really important. But one thing that's really missing from COVID that we know well in the flu world is that you also need to have an antigenic test. You need to have a phenotypic test. And David mentioned earlier about um, understanding how well antibodies protect against new variants of concern, but it works the other way as well. You need to be testing all those new variants of concern against antisera raised against different um, pathogens. And that's missing at the moment, probably largely because COVID is still treated as a BSL-3 pathogen, which probably shouldn't be anymore, given that it's now riskier to catch the bus than to go into PC3. Um, but um, this is a really big piece that's still missing. And, you know, maybe we're old fashioned in the flu world because we're used to thinking this way. And this was the test that we used for many, 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 many years before we had genomics, but it does seem to be a big gap on the COVID side at the moment. Next slide, please. All right. Um, so just quickly on vaccine delivery. So a lot of, um, in 2009, it became very clear that um, countries which already had seasonal influenza vaccine programs were better able to deliver vaccine to their populations. Next slide, please. Um, and as part of influenza pandemic plans, WHO recommended that countries identify who they think are the most at risk 
of disease and who should be prioritized for vaccination. And so we saw that, right? We saw those vaccine prioritization frameworks um, last year. And so some of those were developed for flu. They're always written in flu pandemic plans as being adaptable to, according to the epidemiology of the pandemic. And, and that's what we've seen with COVID. Next slide, please. Um, and just to say that in the flu world, at least because we had vaccines existing, there's also this switch program where we would liaise, WHO would liaise with um, manufacturers to say, okay, it's time to switch from preparing seasonal influenza vaccines to start preparing this pandemic vaccine. Next slide. Um, and then just quickly, lastly, of course, all the non-pharmaceutical interventions to which we've been, um, which, which we've had to endure in the last two years, they're all in flu pandemic plans. These are not new. These were developed for other viral respiratory pathogens. Um, and so, you know, that's all those things, the masks, the border colleges, the quarantine. We did that for flu. That picture there is the quarantine facility down in Portsea. We put people in influenza huts back in 1918. That's, you know, none of these things are new. Um, they've been around for a long time. Um, and next slide, please. And so just to close, the world would have been less well prepared if it hadn't been for flu or some other pathogen like it that, you know, has this pandemic potential to which we've, we've all been preparing. It meant that we had existing expertise in epidemiology and mathematical modelling and virology and many, many other fields. And he just listed a few um, and existing platforms to share viruses and to share information. And then the corollary of that is COVID-19 is also going to help us prepare better for the next influenza pandemic. Thanks very much. Taking the batteries, I've taken the batteries out of this. Thanks, Sheena. Um, you, you've not quite destroyed the entire um, podium, but <laughs> well done. Um, I think it will still go. All right. Look, we're running a little bit behind time, so I'll ask our our, come, our speakers um, coming up to stick to time. I know it fifteen minutes goes very very quickly. Um, but our next speaker is Melanie Eagle, um, and she's the advisor of Liver Well. Uh, from incorporating hepatitis Victoria and going to move now to the implications from a hepatitis organisation perspective. So thank you, Melanie. Thank you. No, no, no. no, no. Right way. Thank you. You'll be relieved to know I haven't got a slide presentation, so there's no risk at all. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Uh, of course, it's incredibly uh, intimidation, intimidating to be here amongst uh, the other people who have spoken, uh, but it does reflect, the invitation does reflect one of the joys of me, uh, my work for the last decade at what was Hepatitis Victoria and is now called Liverwell, which is those partnerships that Richard's spoken of and others as well. It's been such a positive part of the experience and the impact on our organization and its capacity to do the work has been those collaborations with, as Richard says, the uh, medical field, but also particularly the research field, Doherty, Burnett, etc. And anyway, uh, if we follow the theme of what I'm partly talking about, which is those collaborations equal on an equal footing, I shouldn't be feeling intimidated, shouldn't be, should I? I should not be deterred. So I'll press on. I'm uh, here to speak, as was said in the introduction, about the impact, particularly of COVID, on people with viral hepatitis. Um, many shared experience, as Richard's spoken about, in relation to um, HIV, uh, not particularly on the condition, but uh, generally on the community, marginalisation, etc. But if we try to take that helicopter view or perspective that was referred to this morning uh, in in the early presentation on HIV, if we think about it, you know, people with viral hepatitis, immunocompromised commonly, particularly as the de disease has progressed, and I'll use a couple of examples with uh, liver transplant uh, in a minute, uh, commonly marginalised, commonly cold communities, particularly um, hepatitis B, largely is the group that's affected, but also Aboriginal communities. Uh, so already perhaps harder to access health services or lower health literacy, et cetera. Uh, and uh, that we've got that added uh, complication for hepatitis B about people uh, wondering what to do about their vaccination program that they're being encouraged to do or part already doing in relation to hepatitis B. And what does that mean for uh, vaccination for COVID? So really high confusion uh, and complexity in some of that. So I will 
talk a little bit or break that down a little bit in what's already meant to be a rush speak speech and uh, presentation and then I'll go to talk a bit about what that means about trying to provide services during this time and then some comments or uh, exploration about the future perhaps. So a couple of those examples from uh, people with uh, who've had transplants just yesterday. I got an email from a friend who'd had a transplant 20 years ago, still uh, happily living positively due to our great uh, healthcare system, but said, I'm laid low with a touch of COVID at the moment, RA positive uh, tested early yesterday, already booked in for an antiviral IV tomorrow. So that's a pretty quick turnaround to support my reduced immune system. Now his life for the last two years has been isolating down the bush, hiding, as people said, retreating, et cetera. He had emerged to do his annual bike ride finally that had been delayed as, you know, we're all emerging. How quick do we go? Possibly done it too quick. Uh, and this was the consequence. Uh, I asked for a bit more of uh, understanding about his um, antiviral IV treatment. Uh, he unpacked it for me, it was approved on the 20th of August uh, last year. So that's our fantastic scientific response that we're hearing about, you know, it's for people uh, over 12 in the first five days of symptoms, et cetera. But, uh, and his parting comment was, well, antivirals are my friends after all, because he's been on them for <laughs> decades. So uh, that was one example. And another one that, because I asked staff for some input into this and uh, one commented on, got a call on the, our liver line uh, from a nurse at the uh, Austin Hospital for a person who had had a transplant and she didn't want the person to go back to the crowded accommodation. And that poor person didn't have alternative accommodation, didn't have the nice separated bedroom and the family to look after, et cetera, or shared accommodation. So we've got to think these are people with a whole variety of circumstances, of course, in the community. And uh, was wondering about from us as a community organization trying to assist, did we have suggestions? We spoke to Cancer Council Vic, who are active in relation to um, this person got the condition in relation to hepatitis uh, B originally, uh, active in that space. We, we conferred and we made some recommendations about housing accommodation. Now we're not a housing provider, but um, this is where you get to when you're trying to support people. So they're just a couple of illustrations to put you in the zone of uh, personal impact. But to delve down generally, uh, I would say some of the impact has been challenges in accessing health services. None of this will be a surprise to you, but you know we've got to think of it in the personal. You know, hard to make appointments with uh, people's doctors, as we've all perhaps experienced. Uh, longer health service waiting lists, uh, you know, wait times for ultrasounds and pathologies significantly increased. Uh, some of them not functioning or prioritizing COVID. Uh, reduced access to community supports, as Richard's also referred to, uh, heightened anxiety levels, which then has an impact on, on their interaction with us. Uh, and people generally concerned and confused about whether to access COVID treatment and how, particularly, as I said, in relation to vaccinations, needing a lot of reassurance. I'll, I'll just make a little comment there about telehealth. Uh, some of us, like me, love it. I don't have to trek out to wherever to see a specialist, but uh, I'm used to, uh, it's an established relationship I'm used to perhaps trying to make the best of uh, my interaction with healthcare prof professionals. So some it's a comfort, for many it's not. If they're uh, already dis disconnected from trusted voices and they cannot develop them with new providers uh, and the effectiveness does depend on their communication capacities, which have said with high call communities, it's gonna be probably uh, less and also their technological capacity. Uh, 
uh, even phones aren't available, obviously, to everybody. And then libraries went and closed down, so you can't do it down in the on the library. So you know, you just got to think through all these uh, impacts. Uh, so I did also want to make a comment that was pointed out to me from another staff member about the international context that can occur. Now he's Cambodian speaking, did a live stream uh, on a Cambodian Cambodian live stream entity uh, to try to explain to people around COVID, exactly this topic, COVID and um, hepatitis. And there were significant uh, inquiries posted online afterwards, not only from Australia, but from people in Cambodia who listened to this source as an authoritative source, this live stream. And so our attempts to inform people uh, can reach further if we do it in that digital theme, which shows partly the opportunities that exist digitally. Uh, and there he was trying to respond to the fact that initially the Cambodian government asked people not to get vaccinated. So very curious, these little interplays and how we're trying to work in a circumstance where people are getting competing sources of information. What we've tried to do in large part, given that service delivery wise, our, uh, our capacity to reach out to the community is reduced. And you can just imagine how people aren't gathering face to face. Uh, they're, you know, they're not um, open to meeting, having us into schools when schools aren't functioning senior sits groups aren't, you know, gathering in the same way, et cetera. So that huge impact on our health promotion program of work uh, is to provide this information front and centre on our websites, as other organisations have, keep it up to date, you know, guidelines from GISA, et cetera, on particular impact on people with uh, compromised limit, livers, liver damage, and uh, give referrals to also up-to-date sources, particularly uh, state and federal Department of Health and uh, also translated materials as has been referred to. And then just briefly, what might it mean for the future? Yes, work here because, you know, we're, none of us are confident about talking about the future anymore. <laughs> they were the old days. Uh, is this an advocacy opportunity? I think uh, this is a really interesting question with a heightened perhaps knowledge or sensitivity to uh, infectious diseases uh, and the importance of public health. So people are more talking about public health and its significance. And we're hearing this from secretaries of departments down. We've got a uh, DEPSEC for pub uh, public health here in Victoria being created. Uh, we've got nine Victorian new local public health units uh, also created across the states. So there's a sensitivity to the importance of this. So I'm hopeful, but uh, it won't be automatic. Uh, as Richard's already alluded to, there's going to be very strong competition for uh, dollars we all know that uh, so the the way it's been thrown at this condition will reduce um, and it will take concerted collaborative uh, effort to translate the opportunity into some reality of course i'd like the public health units to take on viral hepatitis next sorry Richard, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> uh, i'm sure there'll be others competing as well and I'll just put in a plug in any work going forward, uh, we can't leave the consumer perspective out of it. So we not only need the strong institutions as Brendan referred to that are so critical uh, for our high quality uh, response that we're uh, able to have here, but we need trusted partnerships as we have in this room uh, and online. And we also need authoritative uh, voices working together with the community and being brought in on the journey. Thank you.
So thanks, Melanie. So we've heard, I think, from two different um, perspectives in two different viruses and very similar, <laughs> some very similar needs, um, as well as um, from the influenza needs at, at coming around community and people drawing together and the opportunities for advocacy, which I think were really important and the, the way that the health system is re, restructured in this state and whether we can make um, the most of that and, and what that might mean. Um, the next speaker is going to be um, delivered via video. So that's Professor Fabian Zulim from um, Lyon University, Head of Hepatology. Um, and he's going to deliver a, a speech on harmonising global efforts to eliminate hepatitis B um, and using the example of the ICEHBV initiative. So I'm imagining this will happen miraculously by someone pushing play. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Fabien Zulim from uh, Lyon University, uh, and I'm really delighted to give this presentation uh, on harmonizing global efforts to eliminate hepatitis B, the example of ISHBB initiative. And I would like to, to thank Professor Peter Reville for the invitation to give this talk. As you may know, um, hepatitis B is a major uh, public health problem with more than 250 million chronic carriers, and every 40 seconds, another person dies from the complication of hepatitis B, uh, which represents uh, 900,000 deaths every year. The majority of these deaths are from liver cancer. Uh, and this is a little bit paradoxical because we have now a, a, a low cost uh, vaccine, a global commitment to elimination from uh, WHO, and we have uh, effective suppressive uh, uh, treatments, but unfortunately, these treatments are, are not curative. So we still need a cure if we want to um, manage this um, uh, uh, challenging uh, infectious disease. So what is the uh, current uh, uh, status of antiviral treatment? So um, first of all, I want to, to remind you that uh, hepatitis B virus leads to uh, a chronic infection and chronic uh, hepatitis that may lead to uh, liver cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma or primary liver cancer. Uh, the uh, current antivirals, the uh, nucleoside uh, analog, in, uh, can achieve valve suppression in the majority of patients, which lead to uh, an amelioration of the uh, liver disease uh, status by decreasing inflammation and fibrosis and decreasing the incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, however, uh, the uh, risk of uh, HCC is not completely eliminated by antiviral treatment. Uh, another uh, challenge is the fact that uh, despite long-term uh, suppressive therapy with nucleoside analogs, the, the rate of HBS antigen uh, loss uh, is at maximum 10% after five years. Uh, and this marker is really the one that um, uh, can decide whether we can stop therapy. So in the end, it means that um, lifelong therapy is necessary in the majority uh, of our patients. Uh, um, additionally, I would like to, to mention you uh, another virus, which is hepatitis delta virus or HDV, uh, which is seen only in uh, chronic carriers of hepatitis B virus. So it is a satellite virus of HBV and it aggravates uh, the liver disease progression. Uh, and there is still a, a, an unmet medical need because uh, we still need uh, specific treatments for, for hepatitis delta. So coming back to uh, uh, hepatitis B, uh, the overall uh, community is really uh, uh, looking uh, uh, to um, a functional cure of HBV infection. And this uh, functional cure is defined by uh, um, um, the loss of HBS antigen uh, in serum that would be uh, achieved uh, with a finite duration uh, a therapy. And this, um, uh, loss of HBS antigen needs to be sustained after treatment withdrawal. Uh, with uh, short-term uh, uh, duration treatment, achieving functional cure, we would be able to treat uh, more and more uh, patients that are infected with, with HPV and prevent uh, uh, the uh, complication of the infection. 
So now um, to achieve this, we, we need to have new, new treatments. Uh, and this was um, made possible um, thanks to a, a major research effort at the, the level of basic science and translational research uh, for, for uh, the cure of HBV. So using uh, experimental uh, uh, models in cell culture and uh, animal models, uh, we have learned a lot in the past 10 years uh, regarding the mechanisms uh, involved in uh, viral persistence and in the molecular pathogenesis of the, of the infection. Uh, and with this knowledge, it was possible to uh, identify novel targets of, uh, for antiviral treatment uh, and to uh, identify uh, uh, novel antiviral or immune drugs. Um, and this uh, knowledge were also very important to uh, define novel biomarkers and develop uh, novel assays uh, to uh, uh, monitor these biomarkers uh, for the cure of the infection. So now um, there are a lot of ongoing clinical studies to validate these biomarkers and to evaluate the no novel antiviral treatments uh, with the aim of improving the cure rate of the infection and in the end to uh, uh, prevent the occurrence of hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, with this, I'm showing you um, uh, a summary slide of where we stand in terms of uh, uh, novel targets and uh, novel antiviral drugs, which can be classified in uh, uh, three main categories. So drugs that inhibit uh, viral replication uh, with different uh, uh, um, uh, drugs that target the viral life cycle at different steps. Uh, drugs that uh, reduce viral antigen uh, uh, load, which is um, um, a major uh, driver of the uh, exhaustion of the immune uh, responses, and again with different uh, um, mode of action, and uh, strategies are aiming at stimulating the immune responses, either by invigorating the uh, endogenous immune responses, or uh, by stimulating uh, HBV-specific B or, or, or T cell responses, again, with different uh, mode of action with these different drugs. So you see, we, we come uh, at a stage where we have a lot of uh, uh, assets and uh, the real uh, uh, challenge now for the uh, uh, community is to know uh, what will be the best uh, combination uh, of the drugs and how to uh, combine them in the best manner to achieve an HBV cure. So there are strategies that are now uh, being uh, uh, evaluated, uh, evaluated uh, by um, uh, aiming at uh, uh, evaluating the uh, combination of direct acting antivirals, uh, inhibiting viral replication and antigen reduction, uh, as well as strategies that are more complex um, based on the uh, 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 inhibition of viral replication, it, together with uh, strategies aiming at either uh, invigorating immune responses or stimulating these immune responses to achieve uh, a sustained loss of HBS antigen and uh, an HPV cure. So these strategies are now being evaluated in phase two uh, clinical trials and some are, are, are uh, at, the, at the door of uh, phase three trials. So now, uh, where, where ISHBV uh, uh, stands? Uh, ISHBV is the International Coalition to uh, Eliminate HBV. Uh, it was formed uh, six years ago uh, from the HBV basic and translational scientific community. Uh, it is organized with a, a governing board with worldwide uh, representation by clinicians, basic scientists from academia and governmental research institutes. Uh, we uh, have uh, working groups that are uh, targeting challenges in HBV and HDV uh, biology and cure research. And ISHBV is also working closely with industry as well as with patients' representative. The current vision is to um, uh, fast track the discovery of a safe, effective, affordable and scalable cure to benefit all people living with chronic hepatitis B. Uh, worldwide, uh, including children and people living with uh, HCV, HDV, and HIV co-infections. 
and uh, ISHBV clearly uh, intends to contribute to the elimination of chronic hepatitis B as a global public health challenge, uh, as stated by WHO. Here I'm showing you a, 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 um, a photo of the inception of uh, ISHBV uh, in Barcelona six years ago uh, at the uh, European Association for Study of Liver uh, um, uh, Annual Conference. And you see here on, on, on this picture, uh, um, uh, Professor Peter Reville and Professor Locanini from uh, uh, Melbourne uh, um, uh, and Professor Levrero and, and myself uh, together with uh, ANRS uh, a representative, and that during that meeting, uh, we really defined the uh, uh, the basis of the organization of ICHBV on this uh, uh, on this uh, paper, with a, uh, where the structure of the organization was uh, written down uh, with a pencil, um, and these were really good good memories, uh, and this led to a, a very uh, strong. Um, uh, organization uh, uh, structure that you can see here uh, with uh, governing board, uh, uh, senior advisors, stakeholders, uh, consulting groups, uh, and a specific scientific working group, which is really the essence of the uh, ISHPV uh, with different um, uh, 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 priorities on virology, immunology, clinical science uh, with innovative tools and clinical studies. So the uh, key initiatives that we've been uh, addressing are, are summarized here uh, with the publication of uh, cure strategy white papers, um, uh, protocol repositories that can be found on the website, HPV reagent repository that we're working um, uh, closely with the US uh, NIAID, uh, defined standardized protocols for the HBV CCC DNA quantification, uh, which is the uh, uh, viral uh, reservoir of the virus and important for, for cure research, research symposia think tanks on, uh, on cure, as well as educational materials in many languages, and um, patients focused conferences uh, uh, bringing together community activists and leading HBV researchers. You see here some example of the scientific workshops, uh, um, very recent ones on uh, mecha scientific mechanism behind combination therapies and um, a community forum that we are trying to, to organize either as a specific event or in combination with uh, uh, um, scientific uh, uh, seminars. Here uh, also other example of scientific workshops and community forums addressing different parts of the world and different uh, uh, communities uh, involved in HPV cure. So we've been able to achieve key publications uh, in major journals such as uh, Nature Reviews, Gastroenterology and Hepatology at the inception uh, uh, of uh, uh, ISHBV, uh, um, uh, a white paper, position paper, defining the priority on scientific strategies to cure hepatitis B and the roadmap uh, of serum biomarkers uh, to assist the development of novel uh, drugs to cure HPV. We've been collaborating with uh, stakeholders, and here is an example of the Melbourne Declaration uh, two years ago, where all the major stakeholders that are represented here in this uh, uh, um, uh, uh, slides um, signed a document where we, we called for a substantial increase in government and uh, industry funding dedicated for increased testing, molecular diagnostic treatment, and curative HBV research and facilitate equitable, affordable, universal access to an HBV cure within the next 10 years. So I think uh, with this, I hope I've convinced you that HBV cure will be an attainable goal within the next decade, thanks to the collaboration of uh, all the, the uh, stakeholders involved in HBV, uh, which will allow to uh, um, really uh, have uh, uh, efficient uh, drug discovery uh, effort with antivirals and immunotherapeutics uh, that will be evaluated uh, in clinical studies thanks to uh, also novel biomarkers to, to uh, evaluate these novel uh, uh, treatments. And we will have to 
tackle the uh, public health issue where, um, and mainly access to care in these where, where uh, HBV is uh, highly endemic in low uh, and middle income countries. And with this, I would like to acknowledge all, all the collaborators at ICE HBV, the ICE uh, HBV management team, governing board, uh, the uh, uh, donors and the uh, funders, as well as the uh, industry uh, um, for support. With this, I would like to thank you for your uh, attention. Well, uh, wonderful um, talk there from Professor Fadivian Zulim and the power of international collaborations to, to tackle really challenging issues. And I think that um, there were lots of lessons in his talk just then. Um, now moving on to Danielle. So Dr. Danielle Anderson is a senior research fellow at the Doherty Institute. Um, is going to talk to us about zoonotic virology, the Wuhan experience before COVID. So thanks, Danielle. Thank you. Um, so I'm really honoured actually to be here today to um, be part of the AI, AIID first um, event. And fantastic talk so far. And what I've been listening to um, while I've been hearing these talks is I wanted to change my introduction and address particular things. So I was really inspired by Peter. So um, one of the things that I've had to go through is the Wuhan experience, but I worked in Wuhan before, prior to the outbreak. Um, and I worked in China and I would be asked like, where do you work? And say Wuhan, and people would say, what is that? You know, why not Beijing or Shanghai? So um, yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna give a perspective from a very, like a different point of view. So, Everyone have asked, have uh, lots of people asked these days, um, who would have ever predicted that this could happen? And um, that's a common thing. So listening to the past talks, um, everyone in this room, we all could have predicted this would happen. So <laughs> let me touch on an outbreak from September 9, 2011. So there was an unknown respiratory virus and the index case had travel history to Hong Kong. And um, as this virus spread, there was panic buying, looting, violence, and um, sounds a little bit familiar. Um, this new virus was identified as MEV1, and it had a mortality rate of 25 to 30%. It was a paramyxo virus, recombinant virus. Some might say it, was a, it could have came out of a lab. Um, and through collaboration with AL in Geelong, which is um, provided cells that this virus was able to be isolated from, the novel virus is isolated and it was linked to a spillover, spillover event where in China land was bulldozed and that disrupted bat habitats and then those bats flew, took shelter in a piggery, pigs um, got infected, ended up in a slaughterhouse in Hong Kong and a, um, and a restaurant in Macau. Remember the outbreak? <laughs> this is the plot of contagion. <laughs> so yeah, who, who could have thought that this would have happened? Um, if Hollywood could think it happened in 10 years ago, we should really know about this. So I promise that these are all non-fictional viruses. So um, the pictures here is a virus, which I'm not going to talk about, a virus out of bats in China called Mengelovirus. So you can look up this later. It's quite scary. It's a filovirus. But um, it might be a bit hard to read, but on, on this list of um, other zoonotic viruses, which are viruses that have jumped from animals to humans, we have rabies. This virus has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. Then there was an outbreak of Marburg virus, came from um, bats. It's a filovirus related to Ebola in 1967. And then moving down the list, we have things like, again, Ebola outbreaks, Hendra and Nipah, which are paramyxoviruses that I'm going to talk about today. And then SARS, MERS, and of course, influenza. So um, why, why, when people ask me, and I'll touch on the more recent Wuhan experience a bit later, is why, why do you think that you have um, an understanding on where this virus came from or, or what, you know, what, what's your authority? We've been working on this for a long time before COVID. And so that, and um, in like communicating with the public, um, we, 
now I think that a lot of thoughts are is everyone is, has a right to their opinion and everyone's opinion is equal. I, that's not true. You didn't study these viruses for the last 20 years. So I, I don't believe that. So let me go back to those Hanipa viruses. So Hanipa viruses, which is Hendra and Nipah, um, are bat-borne paramyxoviruses. So shown up the top um, close to home in Queensland, Hendra uh, came about in 1996. And this, these are both BSL-4 pathogens, and it's important to have BSL-4 facilities that we can study these things. Uh, this virus has a 60 to 80% mortality rate, not that many cases of um, Hendra. But Nipah, uh, that originated in, um, there's an outbreak in Malaysia and Singapore, and that virus has a 40% mortality rate. Since then, there's been more cases of Nipah in um, Bangladesh. And sorry, the outbreak in um, Singapore and Malaysia went from bats to pigs, from pigs to humans. Nipah, Malaysia, um, uh, Nipah, Bangladesh, and India, there's human to human transmission. The mortality rate of this is 70 to 90%. So, uh, as I mentioned, these are bat borne viruses. And so, what I've been interested for a long time to study is what. Um, why do bats have these viruses and then what makes the viruses spill over from bats to humans? So um, on Nipah virus, this, as I mentioned, this virus was first detected in Malaysia in 1998 and it was initially thought to be Japanese encephalitis because it was encephalitis present in pig farmers. There, um, this, once the virus was discovered to be this new paramyxovirus, it led to the culling of over 1 million pigs to control the outbreak. And there are yearly outbreaks of the newer strain, um, the Bangladesh India strain. And the latest outbreak, there was a big outbreak in 2018 where 19 people were infected and 17 died. And then in 2021, that's the latest outbreak. So JE, Nipah, what about this? So there's an outbreak in Victoria or there's detections in Victoria right now. So. All the people that are excited about flaviviruses or worried about flaviviruses, maybe it's Nipah, so I don't think so, but that's um, what I want to say about this is things that we've worked on for a really long time is making sure that we have assays that can detect these pathogens and to detect new things that are coming out and that we're up to date in um, using those assays and looking at knowing what's out there so we know what can spill over in and um, cause these sort of pandemics. So. These are bat-borne viruses and we um, want to know, so I've studied bats for a long time, we want to know what, what makes bats special and this is, I promise, again linking back to how I ended up in Wuhan. So um, I was working on uh, Nipah but also these pictures are taken in Singapore and we had a bat colony that we were looking at um, pathogenesis of MERS in bats. So we infected these bats in the PC3 in Singapore. And yeah, bats are unique and they're special and we really want to uh, learn a lot of things from them. So um, in the study of Nipah and um, developing new methodologies to detect these different viruses, we developed some novel uh, molecular enrichment techniques that goes along with genomics where we were able to um, figure out ways that we could pull the virus out of, um, of samples to make next-gen sequencing easier. This was all before everyone knew what next-gen sequencing was, before anyone knew what contact tracing was and all of those things. So what we found, um, we had done, uh, developed these molecular probes to capture HNIPA viruses, and we also adapted this to coronaviruses. So one of the papers shown here is we found a novel um, bat-borne coronavirus in Singapore using this technology. The other paper, we also, once we knew that this worked, we made a panel that we could detect unknown coronaviruses. So we had a big coronavirus panel. This paper was rejected first in 2019, where we found novel bat-borne coronaviruses in China. Um, and it was rejected because their, the thought was SARS is gone, who cares? Um, it was published early 2020. So that technology is kind of important. So same technology, more recently, just last year, we were able to, to find a novel Hendra genotype. So Hendra um, has only caused sporadic um, outbreaks, very small numbers in horses. But it's really important to know if we do have variants. Again, I've done this talk a lot prior to the outbreak. Having to explain what a variant was is something that I'd, I'd have to go over. Anyone on the street knows what a variant is now. 
Um, so yeah, so we could use this technology to um, find this new pathogen or a variant of uh, Hendra virus. And then we wanna make sure that we adapt our uh, detection methodologies to be able to detect these things. Otherwise this horse that died, we perhaps wouldn't have known, we would have thought it was either Hendra or, or some, something else perhaps. So um, how, how I actually got to work in, in Wuhan. Well, that, so Wuhan had a, um, their new BSL-4 opening um, and I was wanting to do, in, I was, I've been in Singapore for the past 10 years. We didn't have a BSL-4 in Singapore. So the options are China where we had a collaboration with people in the Wuhan Institute of Virology and also CSIRO in Geelong. And I had a, um, a fellowship from a, a, a very short-term travel fellowship from the National Centre for Infectious Diseases, NCID in Singapore. And this particular project focused on enabling us to look at functional genomic strategies and try to determine what antiviral mechanisms are in BAPS and what we could learn from BAPS. So what I was doing there, I was running a lab, um, the BSL3 lab in Singapore, working on MERS, and I was going to implement this high throughput genome-wide screening strategy, um, but it was a new lab. There was a concern about, let's make sure that we can get everything right and make sure our procedures are all, all correct. I'd done this on measles um, at BSL2. So the work between Singapore and China, in China, we were going to develop um, all of these assays and we were looking at bat gen genome-wide screens instead of human screens that I'd done before, implement this for NIPA and figure out how exactly does that work and then translate that back into uh, the MERS screens um, in Singapore. So that's how I ended up in Wuhan at the end of 2019. And so I'd been in Wuhan since 2016, 17, um, and then this is 2019. So. The picture here is November 29, 2019 in the BSL-4 lab. Um, and that's the last time that I, I was able to go there. My passport is filled with Chinese visas, wasn't a concern. I'm a little bit worried about it now. And because of that experience, hopefully you're asking me to speak here because of my expertise in pandemic virology, but also I do have this unique experience um, that led to this situation where um, I became known as the last foreign scientist in, in Wuhan. And what I've spent a lot of time doing is I feel defending um, the lab in China and, and my friends and colleagues there, because I've worked in that lab for a long time. I've seen how the lab worked. And um, also with my background in um, zoonotic virology, I am an expert in these things. And so, yeah, a lot of a lot of hate about um, you know all around this whole situation. So it was something where this was part of my job and part of things that I've done got twisted into um, you know discuss, a political discussion about pandemic origins and things. So um, one thing I'm going to switch to COVID now. So that. That last trip to Wuhan, I had planned to go back and continue the nipper work, but then um, SARS-2 emerged. So what I want to point out is there's a timeline at the top and the very, uh, in 2019, what the group of people here are scientists from the Wuhan Institute of Virology in Singapore and elsewhere. So we're in Singapore, attending a meeting that we were organizing on to discuss the 20 years of research that's been on, on the last 20 years of nipper. That was December uh, 2019. No chatter at all about there's a new outbreak. We, as scientists, we know if there's something new, we're talking about it during the tea break, guaranteed. So we're talking about JE out, outside now. So this is, there was nothing going on. Then because of the work that we were doing on coronaviruses in my lab, we were prepared and had things in place that we heard that there's a coronavirus that, that was possibly out there. When it arrived in Singapore, we had samples on the, from the first patient in January the 24th, and then we isolated the virus in my lab. And then that was super important, as everyone knows, because to make sure that we have reagents available, develop diagnostic tests, and then uh, once CPAS, which um, was one of the things that was spoken up about before, we, we developed that. So again, the, it's living the pre preparedness that you're talking about. And 
early on in the outbreak, um, and I know I'm getting short of time, so I'll speed up. Um, it, this was very, very early days. So what, what this shows out briefly is uh, we had four patients and these there was two variants circulating again before VOC was a thing. Uh, we found a virus, which is a SARS-2 that had a 382 nucleotide deletion. And what we were able to track in the patients in the hospital was they were both infected with both those variants of the virus and the mutant outcompeted the wild type strain. But at that time, every single patient was in hospital in isolation and that those viruses disappeared. So would have that been, um, what would happen now where everyone's mixing and the virus is out in the environment? And so that is the work that we're doing here and continuing to do here, looking at if there's variants coming out, what, how do they behave? And, that's, and this work is done in the BSL-3 um, at the Doherty. And it's really important to just to make sure that you are prepared and just keeping on track of everything all the time. So um, I've only been back in Australia uh, for nine months, but um, I've felt extremely welcomed into the Doherty Institute and um, I'm switching to vigil next week. So, and after hearing about all the work that's done there and learning more, I'm really, really excited about that. And I'm excited to continue on this journey. Um, and I've been at Duke NUS Medical School in Singapore for the last 10 years. And um, so I really thank the people there um, and NCID in Singapore for providing that uh, opportunity to, I'd worked in Wuhan before, but to continue on those projects. And very finally, learning from this whole experience and, and the past 20 years of virus research, um, it takes a village. And one of the really, really important things that I think no one is in this room needs to be convinced of is the importance of um, sharing data, um, surveillance, the one health approach, um, diagnostics and open collaboration and just keeping the dialogue going and then having Peter people like Peter who can take our work and then give it to the public and make it sound a lot better than I can right now. But um, yeah, so thank you and thanks for inviting me. Thanks so much, Danielle. Fascinating, a fascinating talk. Um, and uh, lot, I'm sure uh, lots of interest in asking questions about all of that. I just keep thinking of walking through the bat colony down near the Yarra River there. Um, and, and one story I have to share is that at night time, if you go walking around the, the wilds of the bat colony with a very high torch light, you can see all the bat urine coming down through the, through the sky. I don't know if that's a problem or not, Danielle. Um, Okay, so now to our final speaker for this session, Professor Sharon Lewin, um, Director of the Doherty Institute, and um, is talking about role of antivirals. So welcome, Sharon. Thanks, Jane. And um, now I stand for, between you and afternoon tea. So I want to tell you in advance, I'm not going to give you a dissertation on antiviral treatment of either HIV or COVID. I want to tell you about three things. Why we need antivirals in a pandemic response and learning from HIV. Why it's taken so long to develop direct acting antivirals for COVID. And really spend most of my talk about, about what future technologies might look like where we will approach antiviral development quite differently. So AIDS related deaths have continued to decline because of one thing, and that is antiviral therapy. The pandemic of HIV continues, but its devastation completely changed because of three things. First of all, community advocacy and partnerships, as you heard from Richard, behavioral interventions, which was all we had in the early eighties. But what absolutely transformed the face of HIV was the development of antivirals, which happened in the mid 90s with new technologies that were very fancy back then but they're now quite old and you can see as antivirals were rolled out across the world and the orange bars show the percentage uptake of antivirals across the world now 70 percent of people living with hiv we've seen aids related deaths plummet now in addition what we've learned from hiv is that antivirals don't just treat people that are infected they have a really powerful impact on transmission and so um, first we discovered 
that if someone's treated with antivirals, it re dramatically reduces their chance of transmitting it to another person, something we call treatment as prevention, hailed as scientific breakthrough of the year in 2010. It's led to a dramatic change in how we approach HIV and the whole stigma of HIV, because now we know that U equals U, undetectable equals untransmissible. So antivirals have altered the source of transmission. And then around the same time, we demonstrated that antivirals protect people from becoming infected or what's called pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. So we now have this situation and Richard alluded to it previously that we're talking about virtual elimination of HIV. Many other cities and countries around the world are seeing HIV incidents not AIDS incidents, HIV incidents plummet just because of treating people with ART, treating people at risk with PrEP. And we're seeing numbers of HIV infections plummet in London, San Francisco, Sydney, and Melbourne. We still have a big problem though. There are 1.8 million new HIV infections in 2020 alone. So antivirals will never end the HIV pandemic, but they've made a pretty good job at turning it around. And really the main issue that we face is implement implementation, getting those antivirals to both prevent and treat HIV. So it took us a while to work out how to use antivirals in COVID-19 and we're still learning. So first of all, just like in HIV, you can reduce the risk of acquiring infection. We also now know you can reduce the risk of acquiring disease and you can reduce the risk of acquiring hospitalization. Over the last 12 months, we've worked out that antibodies do all each of these activities. And we now know that the antivirals, molnupiravir and Paxlovid can also dramatically reduce your risk of acquiring disease and hospitalization. But why did it take so long to sorting that out, really two years into the pandemic? And I think what we've learned is that there have been some tremendous challenges in developing antivirals. I don't mean the steroids that we heard about earlier uh, from um, Antoine in France and the anti-immunity anti agents. I mean the direct acting antivirals. So first of all, the pathogenesis of COVID-19 is complex. There are different phases of disease, viral driven at the beginning, immune driven at the end, and you need to use those antivirals early. Very different to HIV. Antivirals, you treated the sickest people and it worked, and we just began treating earlier and earlier. Second, the current available technologies for antiviral development are actually pretty time consuming. They are not, work, they're not appropriate for urgent pandemic response. And in fact, the technology technologies we use took us down some wrong turns. We actually don't have existing models of really good antivirals for respiratory pathogens. Antivirals have been fabulous in bloodborne viruses, HIV, and of course, hepatitis C, which in fact, it can cure the virus. And the investment has been minimal in antivirals. We recently um, commissioned BCG to look at this for us in detail, and they came up with a figure that the investment in COVID-19 vaccines has been $137 billion over the last 24 months, compared to the investment in antivirals of around $7 billion. About 5% of the total research budget has gone towards antivirals. So we can definitely do better. So what are the current ways we find new antivirals for a drug like, for a virus like SARS-CoV-2? This is just one example where we would use high throughput screening with a known um, library of compounds and a certain assay to read out. This is one of many, many assays from one of many, many laboratories around the world that have looked through these libraries. The second is what really revolutionized HIV drugs, rational drug design, where you have the structure of the target, and this is the HIV protease, and you can actually design the drug that you want to fit in the appropriate pocket of, pocket of the enzyme you want to inhibit. So the first approach of screening um, available drug libraries or using repurposed drugs really did lead us down some wrong pathways in COVID because the screening was done in vero cell lines and they actually are very different to human cells. They gave us hits with drugs like hydroxychloroquine and ivermectin, which never actually worked in vivo. 
The second approach of using repurposed direct acting antivirals that have worked for other viruses have given us modest success and maybe some better success most recently with Paxlovid. So remdesivir was an RNA dependent RNA polymerase inhibitor that was developed for Ebola and was repurposed modest antiviral activity. Molnupiravir is the recent drug for Merck, also an RDRP inhibitor developed for influenza and also actually has modest clinical activity, we've now learnt. Nematrovir, which is Paxlovid, it's co-formulated with a drug to improve its pharmacokinetics, Rotonavir, was in fact developed for SARS-1. So that paid off having some drugs on the shelf that we already knew in this family of viruses. But you can see that 24 months into the pandemic, we still don't have a great range of antiviral drugs. This is just a really nice comparison of the same company, Pfizer, that developed a COVID mRNA vaccine, which was in phase one studies, phase one trials within three months. That's the top row that you can see. And on the bottom row is a clinical pathway for development of Paxlovid. And you can see the phase one studies didn't start until 12 months into the pandemic. And those, that, the, the capacity to develop antivirals quickly is really important in a pandemic. And the calculations BCG went on to make for us was that if we'd had an effective COVID-19 therapeutic, just like Paxlovid, and it had been available within six months, we might have averted close to 4 million deaths. So that speed of drug development really matters. So what are the, some of the ways that we might completely change antiviral platforms for the future? And I'm just going to talk about two of them, um, antibodies and RNA technologies, some work that um, my own lab's been doing. So I was a little bit um, misleading saying we haven't done that well on antivirals. Monoclonal antibodies are, I think, a success story of COVID. They were synthesized pretty quickly. Lilly licensed its first monoclonal antibody by June of 2020. And they have actually worked quite well, but immune evasion is clearly a major challenge. I think we've got a really good pipeline now for working out monoclonal antibodies and how to develop them quickly. A lot of this came from investment in HIV. Infected person, you pull out their um, cells, you can pull out envelope specific cells or his spike specific cells sequence the RNA and that allows you to then manufacture those antibodies in vitro. And this can be done quite quickly as we saw. The real challenge of course has been resistance. Every single antibody that has been developed to date with COVID, we've had a variant follow it that is resistant. And that's just happened now with the best antiviral we have, citrovimab and BA2 looking like it's resistant in vitro. In addition, antibodies um, require intravenous infusions, but recently some of these antibodies, particularly from Regeneron, have been given subcutaneously, which holds promise. They're also very expensive, but I'm hoping that with COVID, we're going to get better and better, make these cheaper and make them far easier to administer. But what we really need is pan-coronavirus antibodies, and we need pan paramyxovirus antibodies and pan phylovirus antibodies and have these all available for future pandemic response. And that actually is now happening. This work comes from David Hove um, at Columbia University, who's identified a monoclonal antibody that is active against all sars coviruses, the family where SARS-CoV-2 comes from. And, and David's lab is just one of several groups that now have these pan coronavirus antibodies. And what this shows you is a, is a panel of viruses on the left, um, some of them full viruses, some of them what we call pseudotype viruses, and then um, all the different antibodies being tested in each column. And where it's dark red shows that the antibody, the virus is sensitive to that antibody. So the antibody on the far left, 10-40, actually was had sensitivity of every single cybicovirus, including animal viruses. A great tool to have ready, and we need it for every every virus family pandemic potential. But I'm just going to talk very quickly about one approach that um, we've been looking at, which is directly targeting viral RNA. And we've now got really good ways to do this. Many of you would have heard about CRISPR-Cas9. It's a gene editing tool, something called a nuclease Cas9, which can um, cut DNA and you just need to target it or guide it to the right spot. 
Well, we've also got nucleases that target RNA, um, something called CRISPR-Cas13. And very early on in the pandemic, around March 2020, Joe Trapani and Mohamed Barre from um, the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre came to me and said, you know, we've been working on CRISPR-Cas13 for the last few years in managing um, on, on oncogenic um, um, RNA species. Do you think this could work as an antiviral? And um, the first thing I said to them was, what's CRISPR-Cas13? Like I'd never actually heard about it and I work in RNA viruses. I'd of course heard of CRISPR-Cas9, but I had not heard of CRISPR-Cas13. I've since now learned there's like eight orthologs of Cas13 and there's a ton of differences. They're, it's a really great molecule to target RNA. And that's because the guide RNA that steers you to the viral RNA is very long. It's about 30 nucleotides long, at least with the CAS13 that we've been working with. So it's highly specific. So I'm just going to show you one piece of data. And this is data that comes from uh, Muhammad and my lab, where Muhammad transfected the CAS13 molecule, a range of guide RNAs that recognize SARS-CoV-2 into a cell line. He brought this, that over to the Doherty and then Wei Zhao from my group infected those cells and then measured how efficiently virus grows, looking at RNA and infectious virus in the supernatant. And what um, they were able to show was that if you made guide RNAs to almost any protein, and here this is just one protein, nuclear capsid, you could effectively abolish viral replication. And um, they went on to show this in multiple different cell lines and with different targets. So you, viruses can evade from these guides, um, but we showed that the guides can tolerate one mismatch and you just design the guides so they go to conserved areas, not to the spike protein. Now, the real challenge in gene therapy in every area is delivery. How do you get these has 13 molecules and guide RNA to where you want it to go. But there's also been incredible advances in this area. And again, this comes from a sort of COVID. These are mRNA lipid nanoparticles, exactly what you all received as, vac as uh, Pfizer or Moderna vaccines that can deliver CAS9. And that's been done as a paper for the New England Journal of Medicine last year, delivering CRISPR CAS9 for a very rare inherited disease using mRNA lipid nanoparticles, exactly what has been used in our COVID vaccines. So we're currently working with Damien and Colin Powton and Frank Caruso and others, mod generating modified lipid nanoparticles that can bind to the surface of the nose. So CAS13 is just one of several RNA targeting strategies. Others have used something called siRNA. This is work that comes from, um, from uh, Kevin Morris in Griffith University, where they showed, showed siRNA works really well in vivo, and another group um, in, uh, from UCSF, Lior Weinberger, who's used um, something called uh, viral interfering particles delivered again by lipid nanoparticles to the nose, but it works very well in the lung. So just finally, what can we do better in the future? We need to learn from CEPI. CEPI was a center for epidemic preparedness innovation that developed these molecular platforms for vaccines. And it meant that Pfizer could be in phase one by three months because of the investment in different technologies. And we need to think about similar platform technologies of the future, but for antivirals. And I wanna end on, um, on my, the slide I started with, and that is that um, global access to these antivirals will take much more than science alone. We got from no antivirals in Africa to 70% of people living with HIV in Africa having antivirals in 20 years. And that's supposed to be the big success story of HIV. And it happened because of changes in patents, changes in drug pricing, major global advocacy, and still we haven't got enough antivirals out there. So at the moment, we don't even have enough Paxlovid probably for, um, to even cover Australia. It's still very expensive, $750. So this whole issue about access will also need to be addressed. And finally, I'll just um, acknowledge all the different people that I've worked with um, on the CAS13 project, but particularly Wei Zhao, who did all the virology, Mohammed Fare and Joe Chapani, whose idea it was, and the funding bodies. Thanks very much.
Thanks, Sharon. Um, and thanks to all the speakers in this session. I think we've covered everything from the, the community to the latest in antivirals and, and everything in between. Um, and I think one of, you know, it's, it's just wonderful to see the Australian Institute for Infectious Disease getting up and running and having this big first start gathering. And because it's all about collaboration, isn't it? It's all about sharing ideas. And that's why afternoon tea is so important because it's the bit that happens in between the sessions where those good ideas and connections will happen. So please um, go and enjoy afternoon tea. It, you'll have until 4 p.m. before the final panel session. I hope um, you'd like to join with me to give a final round of applause to all our speakers. Bonjour, Francoise. Can you hear us? Yes, I can. No. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Can she hear us? You can hear us, Francoise? Perfectly well, yes. Great, thank you. Well, we, we might start, even though we have yet to get uh, your appearance on the screen. Oh, on the screen. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> I am on the screen. Okay. Okay, thanks everyone for staying the uh, duration. Today we have an amazing panel comprised of Professor Francoise Barre Sanusi, Nobel Prize winner for discovery of HIV and further work on HIV. Uh, Professor Peter Doherty, Nobel Prize winner for immune cell recognition and virus infected cells. Professor Sharon Lewin, Director of the Doherty Institute and uh, uh, key interests in HIV cure and Professor Brendan Crabb, Director of the Burnett Institute with interest in malaria and global health and amongst many. Given the experience and interest from the panel today, we have a really unique opportunity to tease apart two very different pandemics, one with a silent, insidious introduction into as it spread into at-risk populations, being HIV, in the early 80s, and the current SARS-2 pandemic with its noisy fanfare and its daily impact on our lives for the last two years. So to get us started, Francoise, can you take us back to the early 1980s and describe how it became apparent that something sinister was unfolding and how you identified the virus? Oh, <laughs> I have to go back a long time ago. Uh, <laughs> uh, First of all, I, 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 I must say that uh, when we were contacted by a clinician in um, 1982, at the end of 1982 in my country in France, uh, I personally was not aware about uh, what was going on, uh, about the emergence of this epidemic. So it's really uh, uh, through interaction with our clini clinician colleague, uh, that we real, realized what was going on. Uh, later on, uh, of course, uh, we decide together what would be the best uh, strategy to try to identify the causative agents of this emerging uh, disease. So as a reason, I very often re remind uh, students how important if they are PhD students to remain in relationship, in contact uh, with uh, a clinician. Uh, secondly, uh, of course, uh, we isolate the virus quite rapidly uh, in only, uh, let's say, a few weeks, but uh, we, did, we needed several months to confirm that was a causative agent of AIDS. Uh, however, we had no idea at all about the magnitude of the epidemic that was uh, really later on uh, that we realized what was going on, uh, let's say in countries like uh, African countries, for example, that was probably at the end of 84, 1984. So um, again, it's, it's 1984 when we started to, to work very close also from representative of patients. As a reason during my talk, I mentioned how much it 
pause important and to remember uh, the, uh, the implication of uh, civil society and community, which is critical really uh, for making progress um, to uh, respond to epidemics like HIV, it was for HIV, uh, and uh, it is today for COVID-19. Okay, thank you, Francoise. Peter, uh, for your next question, uh, HIV unfolded slowly with a silent uh, early infectious phase. Why was this from an immunology perspective and, why did, and how much did this hamper the response? Well, I guess the, the problem early on was um, it was being identified as a major drop in CD4 T cells. I mean, um, Cheryl, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I was already quite a good, well-established immunologist by then. I'm really ancient. And uh, so drop in CD4 T is an immunosuppressive disease. But basically, um, there were all sorts of theories about there about what caused it. I mean, a, a lot of people, especially on the American right, wanted to believe it was related to the drug problem, and that these. And of course, it was a gay community. It was called initially GRID, gay-related immunodeficiency disease. Pretty unfortunate, as it's essentially a heterosexual disease in Africa, as we know. But um, so there was all this weirdness and speculation and the resistance to the idea it was a virus, including from the blood banks who didn't want to test for it even when the test came along and then of course Francois isolated it and Bob Gallo wasn't far behind and basically we knew it was a virus people like Tony Fauci were saying from the outset this is a virus it has to be a virus and I thought that too and and then it became clear so it took a while for that to evolve the, the immunology of it was really complex and uh, and difficult and there were enormous attempts made to develop vaccines uh, which for various reasons I thought wouldn't work. And we, they we, didn't. we might get that to that bit yeah. later. But, okay. um, but in terms, so you, you really think it was more of a political impact in some ways than a science? No, I, I think it's a little bit of what we've seen with COVID is, is, is when something like this happens, all sorts of people with vested interests in particular social positions or economic positions or wanting to make some other group look bad buy into it. And, and basically... And also, there's, a, there's a something there, and you can see it here, and Danielle really was talking about it, all this thing about the virus uh, being manipulated and, and the virologists essentially saying, we've got COVID because the virologists have given it to us. So the people who are actually studying it, identifying it, helping us are the people to blame. I'm really interested to see how they blame the climate scientists for climate change when it really is, because they will do it. You can believe it. And, and so basically... Um, this always happens. There are those people out there, anti-expert, anti-science, want to find something to blame on people. Bad guys. They hate the idea of bad viruses. There are bad viruses. They're not bad. They're just bad from our point of view. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Sharon, you'll be next, so I'll pass my microscope. So with such a slow reveal, um, HIV obviously has an incubation period of five to ten years or, or more. When did you think it was really going to get bad? At, at what stage in the, the unfolding of the, um, the early days of HIV? Um, yeah, thanks, Julian. I do just want to disagree with Peter. I don't <laughs> disagree with him much because I think the anti-science, anti-expert thing is very much the world we live in now. The world of the early 80s was no one even knew about gay activity. It was all underground. So we were, we were just with, I mean, now we, we, we were very comfortable. We know we all, you know, there's gay marriage in Australia, but that was just unheard of in the early 80s. So there was this whole undergrad, there was this whole world that conventional scientists didn't know about. And, um, and also what was there, the, the, the people that you, I mean, that I know Peter dislikes intensely, as do I, that were anti-science, were, of course, anti-gay and anti-drug use and anti-sex work. And so it was really, and Francoise was, you know, Francoise was living and breathing it, but it was very easy to ignore those people and not care at all about what was going on. I mean, I was very young then, of course, Francoise. I was, <laughs> I was just a first-year medical student. So I didn't, HIV didn't come on my radar until 1985 when I had, a fantastic pathology tutor at the Alfred Hospital who died of AIDS. And, and that was the first time I'd heard of really, really became aware of it. And I remember the shame and the stigma and the secrecy around that. 
and it's really tragic. I think about that man often. But Francoise, um, yeah, you know, you would have experienced the fact that no one would have wanted to talk about these communities and it was terrible. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, it was unbelievable. And that was something that, in addition to HIV, I discovered the lack of tolerance for communities affected by the disease. I could not imagine before HIV AIDS that was existing uh, in the world, uh, really. And I agree with you, Sharon, by the way. Uh, uh, in the early 80s or the 90s, it was not really a mistrust. For, for, for of scientists by, by the civil society, by the public. This is something new, I believe, for COVID, in my opinion, which is probably related also uh, to, because of the social media, which were not existing uh, in, in the 80s. Uh, and also the different opinions of different scientists um, that was not as strong for HIV AIDS as it, as it has been for COVID, in my opinion. Thanks, Francoise. Brendan, at first sight, it seemed that HIV was a wealthy country disease with specific stigmatised cohorts. How long did it take to realise that this was really going to be a global problem with huge implications for low to middle income countries? I don't know, put it precise time on it but um but quite a while actually um before before that was realized and before it was realized that it would be go beyond a um you know a gay man disease to to something that would affect the whole community you know in the world uh, at least the last time i looked more women and children had hiv than men um but that took a very long time and and you know, it's probably a, a theme that we will we will get to. But in my in my list of big lessons and things that we we need to prepare for the next pandemic, the HIV and COVID have a couple of those of very common lessons. And the, the first is they're both kind of nuanced. We don't do nuance very well. Like if we said, let's prepare for the next pandemic, our policymakers and and the communities who don't live in breathe it every day, and even ourselves, probably have a particular idea about what that's going to be. But what it's going to be is probably different to that. And HIV was that COVID, often called COVID, the Goldilocks virus. It really wasn't quite bad enough to instigate, I mean, I think it was, but but to instigate the kind of controls that I think need, were needed at the time to, to shut it down. Um, and HIV, you know, affected people we didn't think existed to, to um, Sharon's point. So it took a long time. And of course, that then left a pandemic um, uh, that continued, that effectively got shunted from the developed rich world to the developing world, which is exactly what's happening now with COVID. Yeah. So like, also interestingly, we had a very public element in the West and there was obviously transmission through the trucking routes and all sorts of places in Africa and prostitution networks, all, all avenues of everything. How much was it disbelief in those areas and sectors that, that really led to further transmission? That's well, another major um, common theme, you know, the, for, for kind of different reasons. It's amazing to hear. I didn't realise there was a time without social media, but I've just remembered that there was a time without social media. Um, but there was certainly a time uh, just like now where, where um, you know, it's, it, it takes a very, it's very hard for science to, to, to penetrate traditional beliefs, uh, remedies and so on. I'm, you know, the, the um, HIV story is one that has never been fully overcome. It took a very long period of time and uh, it's fascinating to hear that 20 year history, I think, in your slide um of getting antiretrovirals to people sharon earlier um you know that there, there's just there's just so many barriers png at the moment you know has a very low vaccination level for covid and the reason for that is not believing that it's going to do any good that's the primary reason so we're still fighting um that same um uh, problem that's uh, that's preventing uptake 
Oh, I just wanted to tease that one biological feature of COVID and, um, and HIV, which is the ability to transmit when you're asymptomatic. So, you know, that for HIV meant by the time people were presenting with AIDS in 1981, they'd been out there and infected and transmitting for 10 years. And so therefore, you know, the cat was out of the bag well and truly by then. With COVID, it's been truncated, but the ability for, for SARS-CoV-2 to spread from an asymptomatic host was really the secret that allowed it to explode compared to SARS-1. So yeah. that feature is, and it's, it's, it, yeah, that feature is, 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 it was key to HIV being silent for so long. And then of course, affecting people, you know, those groups. Thanks, Francoise. Vaccination was touted many times for HIV in its early days, and we still haven't achieved this. Why do you think that is? Oh, um, I think for, for, for many reasons, but uh, you know, the, the, the context for HIV is totally different to the context of COVID, in my opinion. HIV is much more complex uh, a virus and a vaccine against this HIV is much more difficult to, to, to develop for many reasons. One is, of course, HIV diversity. I mentioned the high uh, level of mutation rates for HIV uh, compared to uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, of course, the, the, the diversity of, of, of HIV is one obstacle uh, for the development of, of, of vaccine. And in addition, we still today do not fully understand which kind of mechanism um, a vaccine should induce in order to get protection against a, a virus like HIV. Uh, maybe we will learn from COVID. I hope we will learn from COVID. Uh, of course, we all, all hope that the uh, mRNA vaccine uh, will help uh, to develop uh, a, a vaccine against uh, HIV. Personally, I'm not convinced at all uh, because uh, I think we are in a much more complex uh, uh, situation for HIV than we are for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, however, we really need to, to try and uh, it, what is going on today. Thank you. Sharon, I'll throw to you for the next one. So by the early 90s, nearly a decade in from discovering HIV, it was widespread globally and we knew that everyone progressed to AIDS and death by then. Can you just elaborate as a young clinician, what were those days like? Yeah, so that, that's, I, I mentioned earlier about the first time I'd heard about HIV really personally was in 1985, but I was an in training in infectious diseases at the Royal Melbourne Hospital in 1992. Um, and so that was my first real exposure to clinical care of people with HIV. Um, and uh, it was miserable, you know, it was just a miserable, awful death. People presented late, there wasn't much you could do everyone was going to die. Everyone that came to see you was going to die. Most of the people I saw, especially at Royal Melbourne actually, where um, at the time Fairfield Hospital was, a, was, a, was there, was a major force in HIV care. Gay men felt very comfortable going to Fairfield. Um, if you went to Fairfield, that sort of said you, had, you were gay and you had HIV. So people that didn't identify with the gay community went to the other hospitals. So at Royal Melbourne, you were really, dealt with, you know, you saw people so alone, so alone at this terrible time of, of their lives. Young men, they, we, we couldn't tell their parents what they were dying of. Um, many of them died with no family or friends around them. I think it was, it was also very tragic at Fairfield too, but I'm sure that the, the gay community was already activated by that stage. And most people presented with complicated com, um, opportunistic infections. From a clinician perspective, the medicine was incredibly fascinating because every single complication was new. So all of these diseases like pneumocystis, carinia, pneumonia, cryptococcus, meningitis, um, um, cryptosporidium, you know, none of us, you hadn't seen any of that in otherwise immunocompetent hosts. And at the time, there wasn't that much organ transplantation or heavy duty chemotherapy or immunotherapy. So a lot of that knowledge that we acquired around opportunistic infections really paid off subsequently in, with other immunosuppressed hosts. Um, and also actually 92 already, AZT was around. I assume 
remdesivir is like the AZT of HIV, you know, a pretty crappy drug, but had some effect. So people were um, desperate to get onto clinical trials. I, I, I think the clinical, the clinicians that, and I was a registrar then, but the clinicians that were active in clinical research were so critical for the community here because they were able to bring these drugs to Australia way before they were licensed. So remember patients on AZT and D4T and these awful nucleosides. It, wasn't, it was an awful time. Thanks for that recollection. Uh, I partly remember the, the time as well. As a scientist at Fairfield, it was grim and always sobering. So the next question I'll throw to Peter, but I'm sure Sharon will want maybe something to say. By the mid-1990s, triple therapy uh, antivirals became available following the, the monotherapy options with AZT and, and the like. These were a game changer, Peter. So why was that and why did it take so long to go down a triple or combination therapy pathway? Honestly, I'm not close enough to it, not Julian, to know, to know so, that. Well, I mean, this is stuff Sharon knows, yep. and uh, um, so I think she should. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, actually, Peter, Peter was you were very active in the vaccine space. At that I was, time, I you? was, because you um, were on the IRV. Well, the I, I, I was working on influenza mainly, and and mainly in mice, basically. But but it, I knew all about influenza and was fascinated by influenza at that stage. I've worked on other viruses before and since, but flu was it. So there were certain parallels. I was working a lot on trying to understand T cell mediated immunity, which of course is much more cross-reactive than the antibodies. You, you get mutation away from the antibodies, which is what we're currently seeing with the, uh, the vaccine and Omicron. But a lot of your T cell response is still intact. Now, so I was on, uh, on the, the uh, scientific advisory board to the American AIDS czar. They had a guy in, in Washington, a friend of mine actually called Neil Nathanson, who is the AIDS czar. And, and they were very, I came onto this committee a bit late and they were very proud of the fact that they were gonna go out with a testing a vaccine, which was against a single HIV variant. And I listened to this in amazement and uh, they were really enthusiastic. I said, this is a complete waste of time. It's not gonna work. And they said, of course it'll work. AIDS is not very infectious. I said, it's not the problem that it's not very infectious. It's the problem is when the bloody thing gets in, it's gone, it's away. I mean, because it integrates back into the genome and then it starts to mutate. So, so that, that immediately made me somewhat unpopular. But they would ask me to AIDS meetings to talk about making a T-cell vaccine. We'll make a T-cell vaccine. So I'd been doing these experiments with mice with flu and I would go to the AIDS meeting and I'd say, a T-cell vaccine won't work because a T-cell vaccine is not there right at the moment the virus gets in. You have to turn the T-cells back on again. It takes a few days and, and it won't work. So I, they stopped asking me to meetings. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, the treatment story. Um, well, so in 1993, repurpose, it's sort of a bit parallel to my talk, repurpose drugs because AZT was developed for malignancy, Francoise, I think you, you, yes. is that right? For um, a murine? Okay. I can't, it was, it was on the show, yeah. it was a repurpose drug. Um, so they weren't yes, custom exactly. made. And what, what really turned around HIV were these rational design of drugs, which were the protease inhibitors. I showed a picture of the protease enzyme and designing the exact fit. And when the first studies of the protease inhibitors done, and the first was ritonavir actually, as a protease inhibitor, the drug that we're co-formulating with Paxlovid, with nematrolvir now to make Paxlovid. When people gave ritonavir, they were, by that stage, they could measure viral load. Again, PCR was quite new at that stage. Even the concept of measuring viral load in blood was all new. The very early days of HIV, you couldn't measure. People were looking for antigen, just like a rat tests. They were looking for an antigen called P24. It's only detectable about 20 to 30% of people. But once they moved to PCR, you could quantify viral RNA. When, they, when people got ritonavir by itself, you suddenly saw a two log drop in viral load. And then um, that's really when the um, um, people stepped in. My, actually, my old boss in New York, David Ho and Alan Perlson started doing modeling around viral load declines. And they realized that HIV has this very, 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 very high turnover rate. And that's when they thought we need to give more than ritonavir by itself. Have I remembered? I think I've remembered that correctly. And then they, they added in the nucleosides. So the first combination that was announced in 1996 at a major international AIDS conference in Vancouver was of this combination treatment, 
rapid decline in viral load, recovery of CD4 count, and people literally turning off their deathbeds. But it was it, it all it all came around that first protease inhibitor, which was ritonavir, which we don't use anymore because it's a very toxic drug. When we've got better protease inhibitors, we do use ritonavir just to boost the drug, exactly like we're using it for nematural beer. Um, but then, then we got better drugs, integrase inhibitors and others, and we rarely use protease inhibitors anymore. Thanks, Sharon. Brendan, over to you. So strong public health campaigns have popped up all around the world for HIV, largely with a message of prevention is better than cure. What were the best campaigns? Oh, I don't even... Uh, there are people in this audience that... Uh, that uh, in fact, and Sharon will be much better at answering that... Uh, than me, but it depends on the context and it depends uh, where you are. Just at tea, I was um, speaking to, to Melanie Eagle about campaigns in Indonesia that were focused on prison systems and they're about harm reduction, you know, and they blew me away. Just the run by the correctional system as well as the government in, in partnership with groups like us. So uh, HIV has been one of those where um, it's got better and better. It's got more nuance depending uh, where it is. Um, you know, so, there, so there were a number of fronts as well. Like there was injecting drug users. There was that, that, that's right. And, and those, you know, broadly speaking, the three groups that were relevant here, um, you know, gay men, sex workers and injecting drug users needed specific campaigns. They actually needed new laws as well as new social norms. So that was a, you know, a big part of the, the HIV response. Um, but, but internationally, once again, it's, it's proved to be an issue of inequity, you know, an issue of um, disempowerment for women and girls. And, and so there's still invisible groups that don't have very strong uh, public health campaigns. There's still big missing links, which is as is, is big a story, a bigger story than the successful public health campaigns. Yeah, thank you. So fast forward to 2019, HIV is still with us, of course. We have excellent and well-tolerated antivirals, no vaccine. And then COVID arrived and smashed its way to the front and centre of the news cycle every day for the last two years. So maybe we'll go with Brendan. In a few words, when did you become aware of COVID and its, and its likely expansion as a, as a real issue or concern? My first conscious memory was down at Lawn, uh, the venue for... We'll have conferences and once every four years we have a malaria conference it was early february and and i'm sure we talked about it before because it was all we were talking about in the sort of gardens of of lawn um but it was then everyone was realizing and they'd come from seattle which is where there was virus at the time they'd come from china they'd come from all over the place we thought there's people here now who will probably have um, have covid uh, but it wasn't until sort of a month or so later that I became really worried. You know, we'd seen, um, Danny, I'll go to talk about all of the, the kind of near misses and, and I worked on horse viruses when Hendra was around and, and, and so on in Australia. I was doing my PhD then. And, I, and probably a bit of me thought that was what was going to happen um, without really consciously thinking that. And then, and then there started to be discussions in the UK and elsewhere of, well, do we go for the herd immunity you know and I remember one day when and this was definitely not Australian government policy but it got talked about at a press conference including by the Prime Minister you know what do we do um, others, are, others are thinking about uh, herd immunity and letting it run through the population um, we're disinclined to do that and that's when uh, I remember the wake-up call we're in a really serious situation and from that moment I remember the press conference well I've really not done much else but COVID. Yeah. So modern science meant we detected SARS-CoV-2 very quickly, ever so much faster than HIV, but it still got away from us. We managed to suppress and eradicate SARS-1. Sharon, why did we fail with SARS-2? Um, first of all, I should just say, Julian never introduced himself. This is Julian Drews, and he did identify... <laughs> I don't know if Francoise knows that. Yeah, Julian and Mike were the, were the couple, the, the B1 and B2, we call them, who isolated, the first who isolated SARS-CoV-2 outside of China on January the 29th. So um, we should uh, recognise that we are with a very eminent virologist, virus detective as well here. Um, 
SARS 1 and SARS 2. Well, the first thing is this issue of incubation period. So with SARS 1, you got very sick, very much higher death rate, about 30% mortality, and you only spread when you were sick. And so therefore you knew exactly who to isolate. And it was predominantly in, well, the main countries affected, of course, were Hong Kong and then Singapore and, and Canada. And SARS-1 was very, quite devastating. Doctors and nurses and healthcare workers died. Um, and um, I remember, I had actually just started my job as head of infectious disease at the Alfred on that on that, that when SARS broke out in late 2003. And I remember the enormous amount of planning and discussion and healthcare workers, you know, that sort of dry run for Australia, I think was very valuable. And I often wonder whether similar sorts of responses were being done in the UK and Europe to SARS-1. But on the front line, which was where I was at the time, at the Alfred, and at every single hospital across Victoria and Australia, we were th we had plans around responding to SARS one. So it, maybe it was the countries it landed in. The fact that it had didn't couldn't wasn't spreading amongst asymptomatic hosts. We just used straightforward non pharmaceutical interventions. What they did in the plague in the fifteen hundreds, isolation and stop transmission. And I do wonder if we could have done that with SARS CoV two. Um, China did it, we did it, and but it got into all these other countries that decided to go down a different um, road. And one really fantastic insight I heard was from Helen Clark, who recently reviewed the world's response to COVID. And she said February 22 was a lost month. February 22 in Australia, I think Francoise knows this, you know, we were already very, very serious about COVID and we had widespread testing. No one was talking about herd immunity and everyone, you know, people, people remember and were, were dusting off their SARS-1s protocols. And in, we had Trump in the US, we had, mm. um, you know, um, Boris Johnson in the UK and it just, the rest of the world went down this other road and it was too late. That, that's how I yeah. interpret those early. How much do you think, low case fatality rate had to do with it yeah maybe you know people were relaxed about it um and uh therefore the that narrow that sort of confused narrative of it's really just the flu we don't need to do anything else crept in the confused narrative of herd immunity crept in um maybe a suspicion of what was happening in china and not believing the data that was coming from there I, you know, I, I I just think we were we were folk as Australia Australia was just focused on the information from China, what Singapore, South Korea, Hong Kong were doing, and we just went down this totally different road that mm. was very different in Europe. And I I can't really I don't know if it's just political. I think it might be related to our experience with SARS one. Yeah, thank you, Francoise. If HIV <laughs> emerged today instead of 40 years ago, what do you think the likely differences would be with, in relation to all of the different changes in molecular ability and all those things, how we've un, seen this virus unfold, COVID unfold in real time? Probably in terms of science, we will go faster uh, because of uh, the development of uh, wonderful technologies, the fantastic technologies that we have today. Uh, of course, the sequencing uh, of the virus uh, will have been done very, very rapidly, like it has been done for SARS-CoV-2. Uh, the development of uh, technology, you know, to uh, uh, diagnose and to uh, measure the viral load uh, for HIV will have been much faster, very rapid. Uh, because, you know, in the 80s, uh, I was telling students yesterday that uh, PCR, did not exist uh, in the 80s. So um, everything will go certainly faster, even the development of uh, uh, drugs, uh, the development of protease inhibitors that Sharon mentioned will have been faster, certainly. So in, in science, it probably will be the similar milestone, but much faster uh, than uh, uh, we have done also at that time, we thought that we, we, we were quite fast, uh, but uh, we realized that uh, uh, technology can help us to go even faster. Um, otherwise, um, I, I guess that uh, probably um, 
we will have the same problem concerning uh, the health uh, system, and the weakness of health system in different countries. Today, uh, we still have this uh, mm -hmm. tremendous problem of uh, uh, weakness of health system, uh, the tremendous problem of uh, lack of uh, human uh, resources uh, in different countries. Uh, for providing uh, doctors, uh, nurses, etc. Um, so um, some of the issues that we had in, in the 80s are, are not been solved yet uh, today and we will have to work on that for the future uh, pandemics for sure. I know Brenda wants to say, but we'll, we'll, you can comment in, comment in a second. I'll just go quickly to Peter. Equally, if COVID emerged 40 years ago, how do you think we would have gone? Oh, pretty terrible, I think. You know, the 1918-19 influenza pandemic killed at least 50 million people, maybe 100 million. I'd always wondered why we didn't know the numbers. But we found it hard enough to work out numbers for COVID. I thought it was due to colonial administrations and not counting people. But basically, uh, you know, the first influenza virus, this is 1918-19, first influenza virus wasn't isolated until 1933 from anything, okay? So the technology's improved tremendously. I mean, I, I come from a world where, the, where there was no, not only no PCR, there were no monoclonal antibodies, and there was no recombinant DNA technology. If you wanted to an analyze a cell surface molecule, you had to grow up gallons and gallons and gallons of cells. I mean, it was really a very different world. So, you know, that's what I said. I'm part of the living fossil record of science. Um, <laughs> just to reminisce a little, I do remember a young Sharon Bullock coming to talk to me and saying, should I take the job at the Alfred? <laughs> and I said, well, do you really want to be an administrator, Sharon? <laughs> she turns out to be rather good at it. <laughs> Brendan, vaccination has been crucial in the reduction of disease severity for SARS-CoV-2. What are the lessons from the emergence of vaccination and the advances that we've encountered in the last two years? So the meeting, and my, my comment just to uh, extend Francois's uh, fantastic answer is just, they're really impossible questions to answer because the pandemics actually changed the world. So the, the science side advanced like, so much through having them. Likewise, HIV revolutionized that's, virology. That's what I mean. Yeah. So HIV revolutionized virology, but it also re revolutionized sort of a social and political world that we live in. So, um, you know, we, we, we're, we're much better for COVID because we had HIV and, 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 and so on. Look, vaccines um, uh, have been both a double-edged sword here. I mean, it's, an, it's another one of those lessons around how well do we do nuance you know they're the best most powerful tool and the mrna technology side to it is the revolution that's the kind of lesson we want to extend to drugs as as sharon uh, said in her talk uh, earlier um, but we have a lot of problem with the idea that they're not perfect you know that they're not the total answer to everything and and so then people say well are they good or are they not good and you say yeah they're fantastic it's the one thing you've got to do and, it, and it's likely to save your life but you just said it wasn't perfect and you need you know masks as well and so on in certain settings so one of the, the big lessons is can we prepare ourselves particularly those see so that's a comfort zone for everyone in here we we know they're not perfect and we know we need better ones that are pan-reactive we know we need transmission blockers but we're still so excited for me the vaccines that we've got have outperformed my expectations and yet they're still not not perfect can we prepare a community and particularly our policymakers for that that iterativeness of them that they're not necessarily going to be the silver bullet um, that we all want them to be and of course occasionally measles style they are but as a general rule uh, then they're, they're not so that's kind of the, the, the lesson. It's the lesson of new, nuance, the brilliance of vaccines, and yet their imperfection. Thank you. So look, in the interest of time, we will we'll draw to a close, but head to head, HIV versus SARS-2 is sobering in its inequity. It's estimated that HIV has infected 80 million people over 40 years, killing 36 million people. SARS-CoV-2 has infected probably billions and killed 6 million in the last two years. How should we judge the severity of a pandemic, Peter? Um, yes, it's a good question. Um, 
I mean, just harking back to that 1918-19 pandemic, it's remarkable how little impact that had in a sense. And the reason for that is because the massive deaths and trauma of the First World War, and it came right on top of it, and actually helped end the First World War. But there was, wasn't even a single, there was one short novella written about it. There were no real non-science, uh, science non-fiction type books written about it at the time. And these things didn't start getting written until the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, the first uh, was, I think, a book in 1975, America's Forgotten Pandemic. Really good book. I mean, Guy Rentbecker researchers. So it had almost no impact. Now, now we live in a world where we're now very, very conscious of these things. But it's, it's exactly the point that Brendan was making. I mean, we, are, we don't talk about certainty. That's not what we do. We don't say, this is the truth. I think I've written hundreds of scientific papers. I've never used the word truth. I've, I've used our best understanding is that. We think that. So politicians, the general public wants to hear certainty. They don't want to hear that we live in a very dangerous world. And we do. They don't want to hear any of these messages. I think maybe COVID has educated us to some extent. But I think what's incredibly important is that those of us who are academics, who go after things in depth, and, and those of us who are commentators, really look at COVID and learn from it. It's not a polarizing epidemic in the sense that HIV was, initially particularly. I mean, you know, the British were locking up gays for a very long time, and the French referred to it as the British disease, homosexuality. <laughs> but so it was, there was a consciousness out there, but you're right, it wasn't pervasive. Across, across society. So I think the important thing about COVID is for us, not just us, for us as academics, everything from the social sciences to economic sciences to, to medical sciences to chemistry, to learn from it and, and put those lessons out there and try to get people to, to continue to engage with the realities of what these things are like. There are no easy solutions, nuance, uncertainty is always part of our world. Thanks. So in one final uh, note, if each of the panelists could reflect over HIV and SARS-CoV-2, very briefly, what were the mistakes that we made? Uh, I think the biggest mistake in both is not recognising that um, an unequal approach to an answer is not just unethical and immoral, it's an own goal. It perpetuates the pandemic for the, the whole world and, uh, and, and of the problems that come from that, which are, which are economic as well. We talked about scale just a moment ago. You know, this is in the tens of trillions of dollars. The GDP of the world is about $100 trillion a year. So to be talking about $20 trillion, which is what the IMF predict, will be the cost of SARS-CoV-2. You know, just phenomenal impacts. And yet it's inequity that's driving that persistence. The head of the IMF says the number one problem is vaccine inequity. If we want to cut the tens of trillions of down uh, that, that it's going to be in 2024, we'll, we'll have vaccine equity. And yet it's an afterthought. A third of the world have not had a single dose of vaccine. Um, that's just an own goal that we can't afford to do next time. Yeah. Um, what could have... Yeah, um, yeah, it's such a hard question to answer. I, I mean, with HIV, we look back over 40 years and talk about the great successes and the partnerships and the science. And But those 40 years were just full of so many mistakes, you know, of marginalising people, of discriminatory laws, which are still happening around the world, um, in how we were, you know, um, how, we, how we even used the drugs. You know, we were treating people at the late stage of disease at the beginning and, um, and then there was a shift to treating early and then we went back late, you know, so there were, there were just, they were, they're not mistakes there. Um, there were, there were, there were mistakes sort of, you know, I think socially and politically, but the scientific, I don't call those scientific mistakes. It was just evolution of our understanding. Um, and, and then understand the deep understanding of the pathogenesis of the virus and how best to treat it, et cetera. So, um, I don't know. I, I think the, the, the biggest mistake was at the beginning was um, the intense stigma, discrimination, marginalisation, which still continues. And, um, and that's really why we can't end HIV because we can't get 
drugs out to everyone. We are doing that in Australia and we may well see the virtual elimination of HIV in Australia, but it will be very difficult elsewhere. Um, with COVID, um, yeah, I think it was, this is, you know, one thing that I think is a real positive about COVID and Peter was talking about this issue of understanding certainty and uncertainty, which I think now the public have lived through, but the scientific literacy is better. You know, the fact that everyone really does know what a PCR test is, what a virus is, what a vaccine is. So I think scientific literacy allows people to understand um, more difficult concepts. So I'm, I'm optimistic about that. Um, I think we did a lot of planning, um, as we heard from Sheena earlier around pandemics, we just didn't really have do enough. And if I could just end with one last mistake, I recently um, had the opportunity of meeting the um, Chief Operating Officer of the Wellcome Trust with Brendan and a few others. And he, the Wellcome Trust is the biggest, most wealthy philanthropic agency in the world. It has 58, a corpus of $58 billion. And he said that at the beginning, the Wellcome Trust were advocating that we should just buy 7 billion vaccines up front and um, have them for the world. And the, it was not an issue for manufacturing. And instead, what we all did was we all sort of quibbled over these tiny numbers of vaccines. Every, every country was fighting for itself. And what we could have, I hadn't really ever thought of that it would be possible to produce 7 billion mRNA vaccines. But he was saying that the logistics are there. It was just that no one thought of it, of that. And actually, maybe that's what we'll do next time. Francoise, any uh, mistakes that you can highlight for us? Um, yeah, in addition, maybe to what I fully agree that the inequities, it's, a, it's really a, a critical issue on which we are, did not work enough. Uh, we are already new from HIV and still today for COVID, uh, we, have, we have seen how much inequity is critical uh, in, in, in the response, Ac access to, uh, to treatment, access to prevention tool, access to diagnosis. I, I mean, we cannot continue like that and, uh, and we have really to work in improving uh, what's going on in terms of inequity in, th in this world. Um, in addition to, to what Sharon and I, I, I have said, in terms of HIV, the one of the, I cannot say a mistake, but certainly what we have not done well is vaccine research, in my opinion. Uh, we have spent, and, and Peter alluded that already, uh, we have spent a lot of money. Uh, for vaccine development, vaccine research, and we knew at the beginning that will not work. So for me, that was a mistake to engage a uh, vaccine research program uh, that we already knew would not work because of HIV diversity, uh, because of uh, uh, our knowledge at that time on B cells the immunity and T cells immunity. So. Uh, I think we, we, we have lost time. Uh, it's not a mistake maybe, but we have lost time. Uh, what, that was not the case at all uh, for COVID, but still today uh, our mistake is also not to um, uh, strengthening enough uh, the health system uh, everywhere in the world and not strengthening, strengthening enough human resources uh, uh, for the health uh, system in the world. It's many of the uh, other things to say, but uh, I will limit to that. Thank you. And finally, Peter. Well, firstly, I'd, I'd point to the fact that the reason Australia reacted so quickly and so well to COVID, apart from Julian and, and Mike isolating Boris, was because a culture had been built through HIV, where uh, Health Minister Neil Blewett, opposition health spokesman uh, Jim Carlton, worked together. They worked together across the parliament to make things happen quickly. There were no judgmental aspects to it. We didn't judge against gays. We had clinics out there in the streets in, in, um, in Sydney uh, and in Kings Cross, uh, helping people, talking to people in not judgmental ways. We had needle exchange. They've never had needle exchange in the United States because of people like Reagan. And, uh, and oh, the best they could provide is a little bottle of Clorox. 
to shake your needle in. So that was it. We built that interaction between the medical community and between the political community. And, and as, it, as has been said, you know, it's not just about medicine, it's about the political realities. And Jody McVernon talked about it, that, that you have to, they have to, it's the job of the politicians to make these decisions. So there's that aspect. And we shut down the planes first. So the, what has to happen and what China got wrong China didn't make the virus, so they didn't distribute it, they didn't cause the pandemic. And the politicians who've called out for inquiries and all the rest of them have politicized this are an absolute disaster. And uh, maybe we can get rid of some of them fairly soon. Mm -hmm. uh, and Daniel is absolutely right. We must have open exchange between scientists. We have to have scientists out there looking uh, particularly in Southeast Asia, where a lot of these things are going to come from, where you've got bat, because a lot of them are going to come from bats. That's the first thing. The first thing, and that has to be open. So if you want to fault the Chinese, it's because of their totalitarian system. They had some local idiots who locked, locked up the doctors who were warning about it. And that's what's wrong with totalitarian systems. That's why they don't work. The second thing is the Chinese should have stopped the planes. And, they, and the rest of the world should have, what we did, what we did, stop the planes coming in. China stopped its internal flights, but it didn't stop its international flights. We've got to have agreement that as soon as something is, comes on the radar and there has to be notification and it has to be the WHO, and I think we have to strengthen WHO, as soon as that happens, the planes stop out of those regions. If it's a respiratory pathogen, I mean, other pathogens, if it's mosquito-borne or something, it's not the same thing. A respiratory pathogen. You have to stop the planes right away. And the third thing is, and this is happening, and Tony Fauci's initiated this, and Sharon talked about part of it, but we have to have antiviral drugs developed against these groups of viruses that are a threat. The flu antivirals will work against, they're not that great, we need better ones. But they'll work against all the flu viruses. The anti-coronaviruses, probably you can make them work against all the coronaviruses, all the phyloviruses, all the hennepin viruses. We need those drugs made, trialed, tested. Some of them you could trial with um, the human coronaviruses, for instance, by, uh, by experimental challenge of humans. We then trialed, tested, approved for use, and stockpiled and ready to go. And we need, a, we need kind of the uh, SAS, US Marines or whatever to be able to go in there and start giving those drugs out. We need an, a, a core of people. If we did that, we might stop these things. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, all the panel. Thank you, Francoise, for getting up so early in the morning. Thank you. Um, that's <laughs> heroic. And uh, I would ask everyone in the audience to please thank our panel. Uh, for this unique discussion and uh, the close of the, uh, the um, symposium. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I think I'll speak from here. Well, thank you so much. Um, no great insights from me in the next 10 minutes, uh, in fact, three minutes, which is all it's going to take. It's been a fantastic day. And, you know, first and foremost, uh, at least for me, just the obvious, it's so wonderful to actually be together um, out of my bunker. I think Sharon's been kind of worried about me for the last few years that I haven't uh, come out of my bunker, um, you know, to actually be together is uh, is something I think as scientists we do actually always value, but boy, it's gone up, it's gone up a notch or two after the last uh, few years. So just just to be at an event together, and for all of you watching online, um, 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 fan it's fantastic that you are uh, watching. We've missed having you, and uh, and the more we can be physically together, uh, the better. I guess the fact that there are six hundred or so online is is a sign of the is the good side of the pandemic i think we wouldn't it wouldn't have happened without it uh, zoom was available before of course and uh, there were all sorts of uh, mechanisms to to beam in the talks but you just didn't tend to do it now we do it at the drop of a hat so let's do the, the best of both worlds which this meeting has been um, it's wonderful to hear from such great and diverse people uh, you, you know, 
we're, we're extremely lucky in this event. You know, people in this country's response, people relevant to the global response of, of COVID, um, of the pandemic scares we've had in the last 40 years, and of course, the big pandemic of the last 40 years of HIV, the, the really cutting edge um, was represented today. Uh, it was quite a treat. And, and especially when you consider that it's one of the two topics that everyone in the world is talking about. You know, we've got uh, Ukraine at the moment and the horrible circumstance that's there as it is and how that might play out. Um, and of course, you've got COVID. The scientific literacy point is a, is a true one, something that really can be built on. Um, I, I, uh, I don't know what the, the sort of recognition of words like um, virus and vaccine and antibody would be, but it has to be, without exaggeration, a thousand times better than it was two years ago. That's got to be something that can be built on. So we had such great people talking about at least the equal of the world's most uh, significant topic. And, and I kept thinking, especially when I was hearing from, from people like Ben Cowie or Deb Williamson, um, those who, who are targi responders and so on, the stakes were high. Stakes still are really high, but at those moments, the stakes were high. You know, the strategies that the Australian government adopted based, for example, on, on Jodie McVernon and her team's models mattered a lot to how many people got COVID or lived or died or how many businesses went um, to the wall or survived. You know, these really did affect every person in Australia and the people in this room have played a, ro a huge role in that and shared and, and had a burden effectively on their shoulders. But it's a great privilege to be in the room and listen to uh, all, all of those people. So we've had an absolute um, treat today. Uh, I hope where we ended in thinking about some of the, the lessons and how those lessons of HIV and, and of course, most, most specifically COVID stick. You know, what's the hierarchy of, of things that come out of it? How can we be more than a hand wavy about um, those things that we think would be paradigm shifting the next time, such as, as right from the start, not thinking the pandemic starts and stops at your borders, as important as border closures are. How do you think non-parochially about, by very definition, a disease that's non-parochial? Um, we're not in that space uh, much at all, and yet we we need to be. There's so many great um, great lessons, and the more we can talk about it in forums like this, uh, the better. Look, it was particularly wonderful to be learning from each other as countries, and uh, and I, I just recognise once again the uh, Australia Fran France Association for Research and Innovation, and 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 thank them so much from both the Australian and French side. Um, for driving us today and for all that we do, that they do outside of, uh, of, of events like this. Countries need to learn from each other and we have a very special relationship with France in science that would be great to, to continue to foster. And, and most particularly, not most particularly, it was particularly great to kick off the AIID in the way that we did today. Um, we talk about it a lot every day, in fact, uh, Sharon and I and Jane and others from Melbourne University and Doherty and Burnett and our wider colleagues at, uh, at WEHI and MCRI and CSL and Monash and throughout the country and throughout the region. Um, we don't want to wait. We're definitely not going to wait for a new purpose-built facility, as anxious as we are to have that, to, to do things together. And today is just our small way of, of demonstrating that. Um, we know that none of us can solve problems of this scale uh, on our own. And, and so that's really the, the, the purpose of the AID. How can we be um, together more than the sum of our parts as our, um, as our duty to the Australian people, to the people of the region uh, and of the world? Scientists do it very well. We are collegiate and collaborate. So how do we take it 
take that spirit a step further. That's the point of the AID. We want to physically be together, just as I spoke about being physically in this room together. Um, but we also want networks and networks that um, uh, really stick, that have ambition, that have funding together, that have goals together and missions together. Not that a uniform, diversity is fantastic, um, but, that, but that are far more capable together with the same resources um, as we would have been when we're separately. So look, thank you everybody. Um, important day for a number of reasons. Uh, I'm so excited to have been here. I can see that on everybody's face and at uh, morning tea and lunch and afternoon tea. Um, for those of you online, thank you. For those of you here, thank you. and look forward very much to the next time. Thank you. Thank you, Brendan. And um, I want to echo those sentiments. It's been an amazing day and, and uh, it takes a village to work on a pandemic, but it also takes a village to put together a one day symposium like this. And so there's a number of people I want to thank. And it's, gee, it's been an amazing day. And Julian, that panel was sensational, mate. So absolutely brilliant. Thank you. I want to thank all of our speakers. I want to thank Professor Francois Barre-Sinazi for <laughs> staying up all night. Peter, for you coming today. Thank you very much, Sharon and Brendan. I need to thank our comms team at the Doherty, Rebecca and Nat and Andrea Fisher and her team and Ella and Andrew um, for, for helping put this together. They've been working tirelessly with us. Um, my little team that helped with registration today, Tanya and Tina and Yanni, the Burnett team that helped organise Brendan and others from the Burnett attending, Samantha and Paul, ASN events for the seamless IT that we had and the IT team up the back here, we, had, we pivoted a lot during the preparation of this meeting. We had shifting from live performances to Zooms even last night, and everything went pretty well, I think, in that regard. So that was fantastic. So thanks to the Sofitel and their IT team as well. I'd like to thank every speaker because every speaker was fantastic. Nobody refused the invitation to speak. Everyone was really enthusiastic. I want to thank uh, Mr. Boris Tukas and Morgan Mallard from the French Embassy for coming down and joining us today as well, as well as Minister Pulford, of course, and Professor Gunn from the University of Melbourne. I want to thank our sponsors, the Doherty Institute, the Burn Institute, AFRAN and the Sofitel. And lastly, uh, folks are thinking I organised this, but I did not do this alone. And Olivia McIntyre, who's sitting right here, uh, really project managed this whole event. And I want to thank Olivia everything that she's done and uh, it's been terrific to work with you so thank you very much everybody we'll close the symposium it's been a terrific day thank you